Severed Souls, The Sword of Truth By Terry Goodkind Read by Alec Voles Chapter 53 By the end of a long day of making their way down dangerously steep slopes, along narrow cuts between rock walls, and through areas of dense woods, they finally reached flatter ground. There, they were able to follow a brook among moss-covered rocks as it meandered through a forest of young, wispy hardwoods. The rocky brook left the forest canopy more open, helping them to see in the fading light. Richard watched for a place where they could set up camp. He had finally managed to put a few people between Colin and him and Irina and Samantha. Colin was happy to be left alone with him as well. He didn't know what it was about Samantha's mother, but Richard found her tiresome. She tried to be perpetually cheerful and friendly. Richard wasn't in the mood for either. He had bigger things on his mind. He supposed that Irina was simply trying to make the best of a bad situation. After all, she had been in charge of Stroizo when the barrier had failed. On the way to warn others of what had happened, her husband had been eaten alive by half-people right before her eyes, and she had been taken captive by the savages who did it. People in her village, surely people she knew well, had been murdered by walking corpses sent to kill her daughter. Now she was on a mission to save Richard's and Colin's lives. He didn't see that she had a lot to be happy about. He supposed that she had to be happy that her daughter was alive and well and so was trying to remain optimistic. He still thought, though, that she should be a bit more worried about the situation they were all in, out in the middle of the trackless forests of the Darklands, making their way through dangerous and mysterious woods. They had all nearly been killed by the attack of the Shuntuck, and there was no telling if legions more of the flesh-eaters would show up at any moment. In Samantha's case, though, he knew her exuberance was the innocence of youth. She was worried about their situation, wanted to be helpful, and she was clearly afraid at times. But she was also excited to be on an adventure. She was rightly proud of herself for being able to help them, when they had been in an impossible spot. Richard was proud of her, too. It was the second time she had done such a thing. Nikki thought Samantha had a dangerous temper. Richard, for one, was happy that she had gotten angry enough to do what she'd done, or they would all be dead. There were times when anger was a useful tool, and he was glad that Samantha had been able to call on it. As Richard carefully picked his way over the spongy ground among the moss-covered rocks, he kept an eye to the woods all around. Colin, following close behind, held his hand to help balance herself as she crossed the brook with him. They used rocks as stepping stones to get over to the other side where the ground was more open, less rocky, and made for easier walking. The light mist made for slick footing, though. Occasionally, Richard checked behind to make sure everyone was keeping up. In the gathering darkness, Zed smiled and leaned close to Samantha from time to time, pointing out different useful plants. She soaked it all up. It reminded Richard of when he had been young, and Zed had taken him on walks in the woods to show him where particular things grew and told him of their use. Richard missed that so much. He missed those times he'd had with his grandfather. He couldn't stop thinking about Zed's advice to quit, to give everything up and take Colin away to some distant place where they could enjoy a life together. He tried to think of other things, but Zed's words kept echoing around in his mind. If there was one person in the world whose advice he took seriously, it was Zed. And yet, this time... Richard stepped on exposed roots to stay out of the marshy spots where there could be hidden holes. He kept a continuous watch on the shadows to see if they moved. He watched spots of light to see if they vanished beneath shadows. Sometimes both things happened. It was usually a bird flitting from branch to branch. Once it had been a squirrel. Both sometimes moved a branch in the still air and made the leaves drop their load of collected mist in a shower of fat drops. Richard had been watching but he hadn't seen Colin's little friend, Hunter. 
Whatever the animal with the big green eyes was, it didn't act aggressive. It seemed interested only in watching Colin. He shared the feeling, but he didn't necessarily appreciate it in a wild animal. Just because it hadn't acted aggressively yet, that didn't mean it wouldn't at some point. Still, something about the creature put him at ease. He just didn't think it was dangerous. Whatever it was, he hadn't seen it all day, so it had probably stayed in its home area once they had moved on. From time to time, ravens let out raucous calls to warn others of approaching people. The harsh, echoing cries were grating in the quiet woods. Richard could see some of the soldiers out ahead look up into the trees when a raven made a racket. The men behind kept a careful watch all around as well. Something about the area they were in made Richard uneasy. The openness by the brook left the forest canopy a little too open for his liking. Through gaps in the leaves, he could see the stepped stone cliffs rising up to the sides. The scouts had said that the pass they were going through was the only practical way to make good progress. There were hundreds of places from up high where anyone could easily mark their progress along the brook. He felt like a mouse being watched by an owl. Making good time was always foremost in Richard's mind, though, and this was the only real choice for a route that would get them to Saavedra and the containment field at the Citadel. Richard noticed all the little birds abruptly take to wing, darting away through the branches. Almost at the same time, three ravens lifted silently into the air and raced off together through the trees. Richard froze an instant before he heard a clipped cry from one of the men behind. He spun around and looked up just in time to see legs pulled upward through the trees. Something big and dark was carrying the man away. Richard saw the man's legs kicking as he fought whatever it was that had him, and then, for just an instant, before it vanished beyond the trees overhead, he saw the body go slack and limp. In the next instant, he had his sword out of its scabbard. The distinctive ring of steel being drawn echoed off the stone walls. In the hush of the silent woods, that sound was terrifyingly angry. All the men swiftly had weapons to hand. Everyone looked up, ducking as they turned, trying to see the threat. Richard instead watched the shadows down in the darkening woods. Something dark swooped in at them, out of that darkness of the trees to the side, and snatched up a man not far ahead, breaking his neck as it yanked him from his feet and up into the air. His sword clattered down on the rocks. The man never even had time to cry out. Whatever it was, it was not half-people or any kind of occult sorcery. Richard recognized the way it had happened. It was some kind of big predator taking prey. Close ranks, Commander Fister shouted back at everyone. Men ran in from both directions, collecting Zed, Niki, Irina, and Samantha as they came forward. Richard pulled Colin close with his left arm, protecting her and himself with his sword. Zed frowned as he looked around for an intruder he could strike down with his gift. Niki turned slowly, searching the canopy. Irina hunched over, sheltering her daughter. Samantha's eyes were wide in terror. They were all vulnerable targets if they stood still. Move! Richard called out to everyone. Keep going! There was no saving the two men who had been taken. All they could do now was keep anyone else from being taken. What do you think that was? Colin whispered from close beside him as they raced ahead. I have no idea, he told her, as he ran along the side of the brook, jumping from rock to root to rock. But we need to get out of the open of this stream bed. Some kind of small woods dragon? She asked as she worked to keep up with him. I didn't get a good enough look. There isn't enough light and they were too dark to tell much. Keep moving! Commander Fister called out to his men as he urged them on, waving his sword. Watch your backs, boys! Commander! Richard called out as they raced down the open area beside the brook. When the man paused to look back, Richard pointed with his sword. Make for that split in the rocks on the side. There are heavy woods beyond. We need to get out of this more open area. Whatever those things are, we're in the middle of their game trail. Commander Fister nodded and turned the rush of men toward the place that Richard had pointed to. As he ran through the opening in the huge boulders, 
Richard could see that the forest beyond was dense and thick. The heavy cover would make it more difficult for any airborne predators. The only problem was that it was getting dark. They needed to set up camp, not run through the woods in the dark. He knew they didn't have any choice. Before they dared stop for the night, they first needed to get out of the area. The woods they entered were populated by spruce and pine crowded in close. Growing that close left the lower trunks free of branches for quite a ways up. That meant that the ground was more open, but in among the maze of trunks was not the kind of place a big winged creature could easily navigate. It also meant the forest floor, shaded by the dense growth overhead, was more barren, making it easier for them to run. And run they did, eager to get out of the area. Chapter 54 It was late in the night and quite dark by the time they found a place lower on the mountain where Richard thought it might be safe to stop for the night. At least, it was about as safe a place as they were going to find in the dark of an endless forest he didn't know. The area was heavily wooded with dense, tightly spaced young hardwoods all around that made it difficult to move through, at least without making a lot of noise. A few large trees left them a bit of a more open spot where they could lay out bedrolls and get some sleep for the remainder of the night. It would be difficult to travel through such woods, but it would also make it virtually impossible for any creature to swoop in and pick them off as had happened back near the brook. The dense growth would make it hard for any predator of any size to rush in at them. Since they needed to stop so they could all get a little sleep, it didn't matter how difficult it would be to travel through such an area, as long as it made for good protection. Of course, an attacker, including half-people, could still make their way in, but they would face a wall of first-file soldiers with weapons. They were all angry that they had not been able to stop the predator, whatever it was, from taking two of their fellow soldiers. What do you think? Commander Fister asked as he peered around in the light of little flames. Niki, Zed, and Irina each held aloft in a hand. Richard carefully scanned the area. This looks about as good a spot as we're going to be able to find, short of finding a stone fortress. We've come quite a distance since we saw those things. The commander said, maybe we left them behind. Maybe they haven't followed us. Or maybe they're full, Irina said. I told you the Dark Lands are dangerous and filled with things no one has ever seen, or at least lived to tell about. Most of us have only heard vague stories and rumors. It looks like some of those rumors are proving to be true, the commander said. Richard didn't see what choice they had in it, but he didn't feel like discussing the matter. After a hard day of traveling through difficult terrain, they all needed to get some sleep, not debate the dangers of the Dark Lands. Richard saw shadows appear as the moon emerged from the broken cloud cover. At least when the clouds began to break up, it had stopped drizzling. It was going to be a damp, chilly night, though. Have the men find places wherever they can to lay out their bedrolls, Richard said. We all need to stay in close together. Jake Fister looked around in the mix of moonlight and conjured flames. At least it's not so open in here. It will be difficult for anything to pick us off. After we get settled, no fires tonight, Richard said. It meant cold, preserved food rather than cooking anything, but it was too late to cook anyway. They needed to have a bite to eat to keep up their strength and then get some sleep so they could be on their way at first light. Commander Fister quietly gave orders as he moved off among his men, seeing to it that some settled in while he pointed out others and quietly called out names for watches. No standing watch for you. Zed told Richard, you need to rest. You're right, Richard told his grandfather. There wasn't much room in among the thick growth, so all of them were packed in close. Zed selected a spot close to Richard and Colin. Niki, Irina, and Samantha started setting up places to sleep nearby. Richard thought that the wizard might have picked his spot deliberately to block Irina and Samantha from being able to get in any closer to him and Colin. Whether done deliberately or not, Richard was thankful. He just wanted to get some sleep. Richard and Colin set out a small bedroll and blanket beside a slope of rock. 
Without building a shelter, there was no real protection from the weather if the rains returned. As Colin was settling in, Richard went to where his grandfather was carefully laying out a blanket. You going to be comfortable there? Richard asked. Zed smiled. Perfectly. I can sleep on the point of a thorn. That made Richard smile because he knew that it was close to the truth. The old wizard always slept with his eyes open, but he usually slept well. Zed, Richard asked in a quiet voice the others couldn't hear. Did you really mean what you said before? Zed puzzled at him. About what? Richard hesitated for a moment, afraid of the answer. About being tired of living. Ah, Zed said with a knowing nod. Well, my boy, at times, yes. At other times, no. Zed smiled, looking a little less serious. I think old age is nature's way of preparing us for death, making us more willing to take our leave of this world. It gets tiring after so many years of seeing people continue to do such cruel and awful things. One just gets tired of the stupidity of it all. After a time, it saps the joy out of life. But on the other hand, being around for you and Colin makes it all worthwhile. Richard felt a little better. That's good to hear. Zed put a hand on Richard's shoulder as he leaned closer in the moonlight. You make life worthwhile for me, Richard. You always have. In a way, I no longer live for myself, but instead for you and Colin. I think that maybe that's a wonderful way to live. To have something meaningful to live for. He cocked his head. Isn't it Colin who makes you fight for life? Think of life without her, and you will see what I mean, and see what you are really living for. Richard nodded. That's certainly true. He looked down at Colin not far away as she pulled the blanket up, ready for him to crawl in beside her and keep her warm. I can't imagine life without her. I wouldn't want to live without her. Zed gave a firm nod. That's what I mean, Richard. That, and I'm perfectly happy to stick around to help you keep from falling on your face. Someone has to. Richard let out a deep breath as he nodded. Good. I love you, you know. I know. I love you too, my boy. He gestured to Colin. Now, go get some sleep. I'll be right here nearby if either of you needs anything. And I'll be with you for a good long time to come. I'm not too old to be of use, you know. Soon we will free you of that sickness, and then you can decide what you want to do. By the way, quit and go off to live your own lives, or continue to fight. I will still love you and support you in whatever you do. I know you will make the right choice, your own choice. As Magda Sirius said, you make your own destiny. Thanks, Zed. I guess we've had quite the adventure since we left Heartland. Quite the adventure indeed. And it hasn't been all bad. There have been a lot of good times along the way. I'm all for the adventure being over, though, Richard told his grandfather. Zed smiled. That's my wish, too. Now get some rest. I don't want to have you going unconscious on me again before I can heal you. The last time was a bother. You can really heal us, though, right? Zed stood up straight and looked Richard in the eye. In a containment field, yes, of course. You have no need to doubt that, Richard. Now let me go so I can get some rest. Sure. Rest well, then. The wizard looked around at the woods. This really is a beautiful place. It's important to take in beauty whenever you can, my boy. This is a good place for a rest. And then tomorrow, we need to be on our way to get to where we can heal you. Richard smiled and gave his grandfather a nod before he went back and crawled into the blanket beside Colin. As he turned on his side, she spooned up against him. Everything all right? she asked. With Zed, I mean? He wants us to get some sleep. Colin squeezed her arm around his middle. I'm all for that. As she snuggled close for warmth, and simply to be close, Richard watched out over the camp. Nikki, Irina, and Samantha were already wrapped in their blankets, breathing evenly and slowly, as were most of the men. 
Richard watched them all, worrying about them all, afraid to go to sleep, lest he never wake. Chapter 55 Richard woke sometime in the night when Zed rose up. He had been sleeping fitfully because he was worried about a whole variety of things. There were a lot of problems, but not very many solutions, other than getting to the Citadel. He'd also been sleeping lightly because he was on alert, so Zed standing up was enough to wake him. In the moonlight, he could see his grandfather take the blanket off from around his shoulders, lay it down, and then stretch to one side. He yawned, and after stretching to the other side, he carefully tiptoed among a sleeping Niki, Irina, Samantha, and some of the soldiers. Richard knew that while Zed usually slept well, he sometimes said that his bones ached, and it was not uncommon for him to get up in the middle of the night for a while to walk the kinks out, as he put it. Something about the night felt strange to Richard. Even the perfectly still woods they were camped in felt somehow peculiar, somehow unnatural. He saw that the moon had moved across the sky, so he knew that it was not long until dawn. As soon as there was enough light, they could all be on their way. Once Zed had disappeared beyond a screen of young spruce and Richard couldn't see him anymore, he rolled over onto his back and gazed down at Colin. In her sleep, she rearranged herself and snuggled up under his arm. It made him smile to watch her sleep. It was a picture of perfect innocence. Richard gently ran a hand down the side of her face, thinking about how much he loved her, how he would do anything for her. It made him angry to think of anyone harming her. Once he started to worry about her safety, he couldn't go back to sleep. Something was wrong and he could not for the life of him put his finger on it. As long as he was awake and couldn't sleep, he pushed himself back to sit up a little so he could scan the woods, looking for anything out of place. Not a leaf stirred in the dead air. He didn't hear any night birds or even any bugs. It was perfectly quiet in the woods all around them. He watched everyone sleeping, his gaze going from one soldier to another, checking. No one stirred as they slept. He was at least glad that the rest of them were able to get some sleep. Zed was the only one out of his bedroll besides men on watch somewhere out among the trees. At one point, as he dozed off into a light sleep, Richard heard an odd, muted thump. But the woods otherwise remained still. Waking instantly, he cocked his head, listening waiting for it to happen again so he could better tell what it was, but the woods remained silent. He thought that it might have been a big pine cone dropping to the soft mat of the forest floor. Those sometimes made a thump that jarred him awake on really quiet nights. Richard slid back down to lie beside Colin for a time. He knew he should get some sleep, but he seemed too on edge to sleep. Every time he closed his eyes, they kept coming open. He took every opportunity, when they did, to watch out over the camp, visually checking on Niki, Irina, Samantha, and the men. None of them had stirred, and no one in camp besides him appeared to have been awakened by the soft thump. In the moonlight, Richard spotted a dark form in the distance moving through the encampment. He soon realized that it was Commander Fister making his way among the sleeping men. By the way the man was walking, Richard recognized that he had an urgent purpose. Richard sat up, frowning, as the commander came close and dropped to a knee beside him. Even in the moonlight, Richard could see the man's face was white. Richard checked and noticed that Zed was not back yet. He looked back at Commander Fister. What is it? Colin woke up and sat up in a rush beside Richard. What's wrong? she asked in a whisper. The commander couldn't seem to find his voice. What's wrong? Richard asked again, more forcefully. It's... it's Zed. Richard frowned as he looked over at his grandfather's empty bedroll. What about Zed? He looked around, checking the camp. Where is he? Commander Fister swallowed. He stood and gestured weakly off in the direction Richard had last seen his grandfather. 
Richard shot to his feet. In a heartbeat, Colin was up beside him. Richard could see that the man still couldn't find words. Show me. Men were already starting to stir, to sit up, as the commander nodded. He turned to the camp and shouted, Everyone up! Weapons! Men rushed to scramble out of bedrolls as they snatched up swords, axes, and bows. Commander Fister stared urgently across the camp as men with their weapons to hand went into defensive positions. The commander, Colin, and Richard stepped between Niki, Irina, and Samantha as they rolled over, rubbing sleep from their eyes while rushing to get to their feet. Samantha looked up at the men all around, standing with weapons drawn. What is it? she asked. No one answered as they all hurried to follow the commander. Pre-dawn mist drifted close to the ground. Richard and Colin followed the hulking form of the commander as he rushed across the small camp, and then through the screen of young spruce. He continued on a short distance through the woods beyond to a small, moonlit spot that was open, with trees standing like sentinels all around. Lit by a small patch of moonlight, under a fine shroud of mist, Zed lay on his back in the bed of moss. Richard blinked. Colin, right beside him, gasped. His grandfather's head rested a half dozen feet away among the ferns. The whole scene looked so peaceful, so restful, so calm. Richard blinked again, at first not really understanding what he was seeing, or not wanting to. The reality of what he was seeing filled his mind in a hot rush. Chapter 56 The next instant, Richard pulled his sword free from its scabbard, its fury already fully alive the instant his hand had reached the hilt. It only took a couple of heartbeats after the sound of steel filled the quiet night before the entire force of the first file had rushed in through the woods around them. Richard stood panting, trying to find a direction for his rage. He scanned the moonlit scene, hunting for a cause, a threat, an explanation. He saw nothing out of the ordinary other than his grandfather lying beheaded in the middle of a soft, moonlit bed of moss surrounded by small, wispy ferns. In the next heartbeat, Samantha cried out in horror. Her mother stared in disbelief, both hands covering her open mouth. Niki, standing beside him, briefly looked at Richard's face before rushing to kneel beside Zed's body. How could this happen? Richard asked no one in particular. Who could have done this? We had watches posted. His own booming voice echoed back to him out of the silent woods. He could see nothing out of the ordinary. The only blood he could see was on Zed. Men were already racing off in every direction, searching for the killer, shamed that someone had gotten through their defenses. The men of the first file did not make these kinds of mistakes. One by one, the men returned, each giving the commander a shake of his head, none of them wanting to look at Richard. Trax, the commander asked his men, looking from one to another. One of them gestured off toward the woods. Some of us came through here earlier to check the area, and we saw those tracks. But no one other than us has been through here. There aren't any tracks out beyond, either. We can't find any evidence of anyone coming into this area from outside. They had to have snuck in through the camp. That's the only way. Unless they were hiding here the whole time we set up camp, Commander Fister said, waiting for someone important to pass by. Maybe they slipped away after they did this. Richard didn't know that such an explanation made any sense, unless they were being followed. Other than the animal Colin had named Hunter, he hadn't seen anyone or anything watching them. He supposed they could have used occult powers to mask themselves as they shadowed the group. Other than that, he was having trouble understanding how it could have happened. With a thousand thoughts tumbling through his mind all at once, he couldn't think clearly. No matter how they did it, there was no doubt that the camp had been penetrated by a killer. 
The way Richard's heart pounded with rage also made it difficult to think. He needed a direction for that bottled fury, but couldn't find one. He watched, tears running down his face as Niki gently lifted Zed's head and brought it back, placing it by his body so that the old wizard almost looked right again. Richard dropped to his knees beside Niki, staring down at his grandfather. Zed's dead, hazel eyes stared up at the dark sky. Colin knelt beside him, one hand on Richard's shoulder as she cried, holding her other trembling hand over her mouth, holding back the scream. Richard, noting men return and whisper reports to Commander Fister, finally looked up at the man. Anything? Did the men find anything at all? His own voice sounded distant and wooden to him, as if it belonged to someone else. I'm sorry, Lord Brawl. Other than this, he said with a nod toward Zed's corpse, nothing looks wrong or out of the ordinary. How could this happen right here? Right under our noses. How could we not know, not see anything, not hear anything? Richard remembered then the soft thump he'd heard. He realized then what he had heard hitting the mossy ground. I wish I had an answer for you, Lord Rawl. Commander Fister said in little more than a sorrowful whisper. I told you. Irina said in a quiet voice, things like this are common in the Darklands. There are dangers here that no one knows about. Richard wasn't in the mood to talk about the dangers of the Darklands. He stood up then, his mind racing, his heart hammering, his fist clenched around the hilt of his sword. He forced himself to cap off his emotion. He couldn't let those emotions free. None of them could afford for him to lose control right then. He could hear his own voice inside his head, telling himself to think. It felt like he was somewhere above, watching himself standing there in the little clearing lit by moonlight, looking down on Zed's body. No one knew what to do, what Richard would do. They were afraid to move, afraid to do anything. They all waited for him to give everyone direction. Richard swallowed and cleared his throat, making sure his voice would not fail him. We can't carry his remains with us to Savedra, he said, his own voice sounding surprisingly calm. There would be no point to it. Zed didn't know the place. It would have meant nothing to him. Colin still knelt, bent over Zed's chest, her face buried in her hands as she wept. Zed had been the wizard she had come through the final boundary to find. He had been the one. Everyone had needed him. She had come to pull him away from his peaceful life in Westland and back into a world ablaze with war. They had all needed the first wizard so he could name a seeker. They needed the first wizard to set things right. Richard knew what else was going through her mind at that moment, the same memory that was going through his thoughts. Zed marrying the two of them. Niki, standing close to his left shoulder, looked up at him. What do you want us to do, Richard? She asked in a broken voice. He knew that hesitation, failure to make a decision, was deadly. They were already in enough trouble, and there was obviously yet more they hadn't been aware of lurking in the night. It was most likely something to do with occult sorcery, otherwise Zed and Niki would have detected it. He needed to make a decision. He needed to make it quickly, and he needed it to be the right decision. He tried to think of what Zed would want him to do, what he would advise. Richard looked around. No one knew Zed's wishes better than Richard. He knew that Zed would tell him that he must push on, that he had to get to the Citadel or everything. All their efforts and hopes would be in vain. His grandfather would tell him that the living couldn't sacrifice their chance at life to mourn the dead. Zed told me that he thought this was a beautiful place. His soul is in the hands of the good spirits now. He is safe there with them and finally at peace. He no longer has need of this vessel in which he has for so long sailed the world of life. 
He would want us to purify his remains in a funeral pyre. We need to build up a platform of wood and place him on it. We need to be quick about it. We don't know what danger is here among us. We can't stay here. We need to take care of Zed, and then we must be gone. I will see to it at once, Lord Rawl, the commander said. Richard turned to Niki. If we get to a containment field, can you cure Colin and me by yourself without Zed? Yes. Are you sure? Niki did not hesitate. Absolutely. Could you tell how he was beheaded? By what method? Niki swallowed. No, it looks like a blade, but it could have been something else. You mean like the gift? Yes. I've seen it done often enough. It looks much the same, but I can detect no gifted people anywhere near, other than myself, Irina, and Samantha right here with us. They could have been lying in wait, and then when they saw an opportunity, killed the first person of rank that they could, and then run off, Commander Fister said. Richard nodded. Possibly. Send your best trackers out and have them search while we take care of Zed. But if they do find any evidence of an intruder, they could be gifted, so I don't want them following or trying to take them on. Just come get me instead. He turned back to Niki. Could it have been someone using occult sorcery? Niki's eyes brimmed with tears. Yes, I suppose, but I have no way of knowing. And if it was, I can't sense such people. They could be standing right next to me and I wouldn't be able to detect such powers. Occult powers are like the dark side of the moon. They remain out of sight and a mystery. Richard turned to a stricken-looking Irina. Can you? She wiped her nose on her sleeve as she shook her head. Richard gritted his teeth for a moment, fighting to keep control of the rage thundering through him. He was on the razor edge of losing control but there was no target for his fury. He told himself yet again to think of what his grandfather would advise him to do. All right, then. We need to see to taking care of Zed's remains as swiftly as possible. He is with the good spirits now. We can weep for his soul, but we have to move while we weep. Though his body is only an empty vessel, now I don't want animals getting at it. With our gifted... We can have a fire hot enough to purify his remains in short order. It's going to be light soon. We can't afford to delay one moment longer than absolutely necessary. We need to see to this and then be on our way to Saavedra. If the trackers haven't found anything by first light, then we must put our efforts toward what matters most right now. Getting to the Citadel. All around the small clearing... Richard saw fists go to hearts. Even Samantha, Irina, and Niki silently bowed their heads as they touched fists to hearts. And then, Richard said, I am going to find out who did this, and I am going to kill them with my bare hands. Chapter 57 By first light, when the sky was just beginning to take on a faint blush, the trackers had not found anything meaningful. There were some suspicious indications that Richard would have investigated himself, but it could easily take most of the day to see if those indications led to anything significant. While it was critically important to know who had killed Zed, after all, that killer could strike again, they couldn't afford the time. Richard and Colin's only chance to live was to get to the Citadel before the poison overwhelmed them. In the back of his mind, as he stood staring at the smoking ashes that were his grandfather's worldly remains, Richard was having trouble putting the pieces together. He couldn't make sense of things or understand how it had happened. He felt numb. He knelt beside the remains of the funeral pyre and pushed his hand into the still warm ashes, wishing he could touch his grandfather one last time. I'm sorry, Zed but I can't quit just yet. What do you mean? Colin asked from above, over his shoulder. Richard stood. He held his hand up before his face and stared at the glove of gray ashes. Nothing. He looked over at Colin. Are you ready? She nodded, 
her chin trembling as she fought back the tears. She fell into his arms then as she started crying all over again. I'm usually stronger than this, she said between sobs. Richard held her tightly for a moment, burying his face in her hair at the side of her neck. I know, he whispered. I love you. After a moment, he straightened and held her by her shoulders as he looked into her green eyes. I can't lose you too, Colin. We need to get going. Zed would want us to hurry. He would understand the need. He would not want us standing around staring at his ashes. Colin nodded as she sniffled back her tears. I know. I understand. He may be gone, but he will live in our hearts as long as they beat. Richard nodded, unable to smile. He saw Niki and the others waiting quietly in the background, back among the trees at the edge of the little clearing. He looked around one last time. It's a beautiful spot. He told me to take the time to appreciate the beauty of things. The shadowy shapes of pine and spruce stood around the edge of the clearing like mourners in black silently watching. Richard took Colin's hand then and walked quickly to where the others stood waiting. There is enough light. We need to get moving. Heads all around nodded. There are those dark flying predators that took two men yesterday, and someone obviously murdered Zed. The ones yesterday were flying beasts. This here was a two-legged beast. I don't think I need to tell any of you to stay alert. When they all shook their heads, he said, Let's get moving, then. The scouts are back, Lord Rawl, the resolute Commander Fister said. They have a route for us, but they've only had time to pick a route for the first hour or so. That will get us started. Let's go. Without further word and with Colin at his side, Richard marched away from the ashes. He didn't look back. Nikki fell in close behind him. Behind her, Irina and Samantha rushed to stay close on her heels as they all wove their way through the thick growth of young hardwoods. As Richard and the women moved through the waiting men, some went on out ahead while others fell in behind. With sunrise still a ways off, the forest was not only dark and foreboding, it was hiding a killer. In the dim, early blush of light before the approaching dawn, it was hard to make out much of anything in detail other than those in close enough. As they went over the edge of the rise, Richard could see the black shapes of men out ahead along with the soaring trunks of pines silhouetted against the sky. He took the opportunity of a bit of open sky to check for anything flying that could snatch them up. He didn't see anything close other than a flock of small birds. Higher up in the sky, he saw ravens circling, looking for a meal, looking for anything to scavenge. He turned his eyes back to the ground to watch his footing, glad that he had made the decision to dispose of Zed's remains in the way he had. He was still having trouble believing it was real. He had been with Zed his entire life. He couldn't imagine his grandfather being gone. He didn't want to leave even his ashes. He felt like he was abandoning Zed. Despite all the people around him, he felt lonely and lost. It felt like he was watching himself walk along through the thick forest. After having gone through the motions of saying words over his grandfather, before Niki had ignited it all. The flames had been hot, burning with a kind of rage at the terrible task they had been called upon to perform. Niki had seen to it that those flames made quick work of it. He kept thinking of things he wanted to ask Zed, things he wanted to say, things he wanted to remember to talk to him about. None of it seemed real. He wanted to recall it all, to pull the river of time back and somehow change its course. He knew how Zed thought and what he believed. He knew Zed's reasoning on just about every subject. He thought about the advice Zed would give him at that moment. When he realized what Zed would say, he turned and took Niki's arm. With Colin on his right, he pulled Niki close on his left as they walked among the forest monarchs. The ground was flat enough that the three of them could walk side by side. Only you and Zed could heal us. As long as you had the containment field, 
he said. Right? And possibly Irina, Niki said. I don't know her ability. It's an incredibly complex task, but it's possible she may be able to do it. I don't think it's wise to count on her, Colin said, glancing back to make sure the woman was out of earshot before looking past him to Niki. We don't know enough about her ability. She could make a mistake at a critical juncture in The Conjuring. I wouldn't want to put Richard's life in the hands of someone untested in such things. Nor would I, Niki said. At least, not as long as we don't have to. Still holding her by her upper arm, Richard helped Niki step over a split in the rock, and then checked the woods around them before he went on. Then, for the sake of argument, let's say that you and Zed are the only two that we were positive could heal us. Let's say we assume that Irina wouldn't know enough, or wouldn't have the experience or ability that would be necessary. Let's just say we have to count her out. While Samantha is obviously quite gifted, I'm sure she doesn't have the knowledge or training to do such a thing. So we have to count her out as well. That leaves me, Niki said. I told you I could do it. Right. The three of us, you, Colin, and me, have to get there, though, in order to do it. There were two of you, and now Zed is dead. I find that more than suspicious. But in any event, that means that we now have only you to count on. I'm not letting you out of my sight, if that's what you're worried about. It is. But it also means that we have to assume that, because you are one of the two who can heal us, you are a target in much the way Zed was. I want you in our shadow every step the rest of the way there. Not just so that you can watch over us, but so that I can watch over you. Richard, I can take pretty good care of myself. So could Zed. She met his gaze, and then conceded with a nod. You've got it. You and Colin are going to get very tired of turning around, though, and bumping into me. Richard couldn't make himself smile. Thanks, Nikki. Colin and I are counting on you. I wish that my power worked, Colin said. Then I'd be able to protect her as well. But you can believe I know how to use my knife, and I intend to have it at the ready every moment. I hope you don't get tired of turning around and bumping into me. Never, Nikki said, with a smile meant to reassure them. Chapter 58 By mid-morning they reached the edge of a prominence where Richard was able to get a partial view out over the landscape of smaller mountains ahead and the lower reaches of the forest spread out far below. Saavedra was nowhere in sight yet, but he only had a partial view and there were a lot of rugged walls of rock he couldn't see beyond. So it was possible that when they were able to get farther down and beyond some of the difficult terrain, they might be able to spot it. From where they stood, they could easily see that there was higher ground ahead in places. Once they got down into the lower forest, though, they would be blind to what lay ahead. They needed to be aware of the nuances of the lay of the land in order to know how to avoid going off in certain directions, or they would end up having to backtrack. They couldn't afford that. He could see that they were still going to have a lot of ground to cover before they had any hope of reaching Saavedra. He could also see that they had some tricky country to get through as they made their way lower down through the mountains. It all looked pretty easy when viewed from up high, but experience had taught him what to look for when picking a route. Since they were moving so swiftly, the scouts hadn't been able to push beyond this point, but Richard had grown up in the woods, scouting trackless woods and picking passages through rugged country. He studied the lay of the land ahead, looking for possible routes and making mental notes of what to avoid. What do you think? Colin asked. It doesn't look promising to me. Do you see a way? It may not look promising, but we have to go in this direction. We don't have a choice. Richard pointed to where two mountains met, creating folds and rugged canyons. We need to get down there. I can't see what's down in between all those twisting chasms, but that's the way we need to go. What about that way? Niki asked as she pointed a little more to the left. It looks easier without all those bends and turns in the chasms. It looks sketchy down in there. Going more to the left avoids that. It only looks easy from this distance. Richard leaned close to her and pointed, letting her sight down his arm. 
See that there? If we go that way, the ground drops away in sheer cliffs. They don't look that bad from here, but I can tell you they are impassable. Trying to climb down is harder than climbing up, and that's a nasty descent. I wouldn't try it, and I know what I'm doing. Nikki let out a frustrated sigh. Looks like the chasms, then. What about that spot? Colin asked, pointing. The land is gentler off that way. It is, Richard said, gesturing. Until you get to that scree slide. We'd never be able to climb that. It's so eroded that it wouldn't take much for it all to come down on us. Or take us down with it. Follow the skirt of it with your eye and see what happens when you try to go around. Oh, Colin said as she squinted into the distance. That's nasty. It is. Worse, if we got down that far, we'd find ourselves in a dead end. And then we would have to backtrack and go around on a different route. We would lose half a day at least, maybe more. We can't afford to make mistakes. We have to get it right the first time. Colin sighed. So, do you see a way? Richard nodded. There is a way, but it isn't going to be easy. It's easier than wasting extra days going around, though. Our best route is to push on and get through the area down in those chasms. He was worried about making it to the Citadel in time. He couldn't afford to make a mistake in finding a way through the wilderness ahead. In a way, he didn't care. The world seemed empty. He was in the mood to give up and wait for the blackness to take him. But that same blackness would come for Colin. In his numb pain at the loss of his grandfather, the one thing that really mattered to him was Colin. He wanted more than anything for her to be safe. He couldn't stand the thought of losing her, too. He would do whatever it took to keep her safe and make sure she was healed. Zed had told him that living for those you love was the best part of living. Richard clung to that idea. He cared that Colin lived, and he would do whatever it took to protect her. Richard's gaze followed a few streams down lower, mentally testing the lay of the land, looking at where they led. I can't believe it's this hard to get to the place, Commander Fister said. Nothing is ever easy, Richard said, Zed's frequent words coming to mind. We're coming in from the wrong direction, one of the men said. This is the back door, you might say. Richard nodded his agreement. From what Irina knows and what Ned was able to tell us before he left for the palace, there are roads and trails that are well used by traders and merchants coming and going between other cities and towns in Fajin province and then beyond to the rest of Dahara. The problem is none of those roads and trails head off in this direction because there is no real civilization back where we came from. That's why the barrier was placed there in ancient times. The people back in the Great War wanted to put evil in the most remote, deserted place they could find. Saavedra was located in a hook of a river, and Richard knew that they were headed in the right direction. So he knew that the easiest way to get to the city would be to get through the wilderness to the streams and then follow those tributaries downstream to the river. When they got close enough, they would finally encounter roads and trails. Either the river or a road would lead them to Saavedra and the citadel. He knew where to go. It was getting there that was going to be the problem. So, do you see the way we need to go? The commander asked. I do, Richard said. As Commander Fister and a number of the men leaned close, Richard pointed out the route, explaining the crossovers, the walls of rock they needed to follow, and the impractical, dangerous climbs and descents they needed to avoid. The scouts all nodded their agreement as Richard explained the plan. There are some things down there we still can't see, one of the men said. We might get down there and find out we can't make it through. Richard heaved a sigh. I know, but I don't see any other way. Sometimes there is only one pass through mountains without going long distance to find another. As far as I can see, that area down there is the best chance to make it through. Even so, the difficulty is likely the reason there are no trails. He looked back at all the men studying the lay of the land. If anyone has a better suggestion, speak up. All the men, eyes scanning the land below, shook their heads. They all saw the same problems he did with going any other way. Far as I can see, 
one of the scouts said, frowning as he studied the chasms. You're right that this is the only pass. We either get through this way, or we have to spend extra days getting around those peaks over there. I've scouted that direction, another man said. You hit the skirt of those mountains and have to keep pushing in the wrong direction, hoping to finally be able to make the turn. It would likely take an extra half a dozen days. We don't have any extra days, Nikki told the men, wanting to bring a halt to them even considering it. We don't have any extra hours. Her words were sobering to everyone. The men all knew the consequences of not making it to the Citadel in time. Commander Fister had given all the men a talk, explaining exactly what was at stake. These men were devoted to protecting the Lord Rawl. They had competed all their lives to be members of the First File. They were not about to entertain the possibility of failure. Richard was even more committed, though, because it meant Colin's life, and nothing meant more to him than that. But they needed to get through a lot of rugged territory first. They weren't going to make it that day, but Richard thought it might be possible, if they were able to cover enough ground, that they would reach Saavedra the next day. Having the cure that close, yet so far, was tormenting. Richard checked the sky for any sign of a threat. He saw birds, but none of them looked panicked. He didn't see anything more threatening than a red-tailed hawk. That's it, then, one of the scouts said. We will have to come in through the back door to Saavedra. Have you heard the old adage advising to always grow oleanders at your back door? Niki asked. The man frowned. No. Why would you want oleanders at your back door? For protection, she said. Oleanders are poisonous. Saavedra was probably in part established where it was for a very good reason. Because this place guards its back. The men all shared looks. Let's get moving, Richard told everyone. Some of the scouts who had discussed the best route took the lead. Richard, Colin, Niki, Irina, and Samantha, along with the rest of the men, followed behind as they plunged back into the woods. Chapter 59 By late in the afternoon, as they worked their way ever downward through the dense, forested landscape, the ground became more rugged as fractures and rifts widened and deepened into wooded chasms. It wasn't long before they found themselves descending between soaring walls of gray granite. Low, heavy, wet clouds scudded by between the mountains soaring up overhead, conspiring with the close walls to make for a confining, gloomy journey. Drizzle dampened the walls and their faces. Some of the horizontal sections of slick stone in the walls to the sides overhung the stacked slabs of rock below so there was no hope of climbing out. They were going to have to follow the twisting course of the chasms if they were going to find a pass through the mountains. Richard knew from having seen the crooked canyons from above that it was going to be a confusing, difficult maze to traverse. If there was ever a natural barrier guarding the back door of a city, this was it. He just hoped it wasn't also poisonous. As they descended deeper into the main chasm, leading them into the only possibility of passage through the mountains, they found it to be surprisingly broad. From up high on the distant prominence behind them, it had been hard to tell precisely how big it really was down in the canyons. Now, Richard could see that in places the walls were hundreds, and in places thousands of feet high. In some spots, the floor of the twisting gorges broadened out, with the walls closed in closer overhead, almost touching, to create a murky, sometimes subterranean landscape of thick growth down below. In spots, the rock bridged the walls high overhead. Richard spotted flocks of small birds darting under the stone bridges. The walls probably provided relatively safe nesting spots for a variety of birds. The canyons were alive with small wildlife, everything from gnats and birds in the air to centipedes and voles on the ground. He knew that where there was such wildlife, there would be predators. The growth at the bottom of the chasms, while similar to the forests above, was denser. 
The daylight down in the bottom was limited by the towering walls, so the trees grew more slowly. Ancient monarch spruce created brief areas where the forest floor at the bottom of the chasm was open among the massive trunks, so that they could see the walls off to either side. The thick beds of brown needles made for a spongy mat to walk on. In other places, the space between the walls narrowed, and smaller hardwoods and brush held sway. The maples made for a denser forest, with tangles of young saplings crowding the ground where older trees had fallen, providing some precious light. Soldiers pushed small, slender trunks over with their boots to make it easier for those following behind. The ground was deep in places with drifted leaves and debris that had accumulated between boulders and rocks, and because of how wet it was, it smelled of rot. In a few flat areas, the water standing in long, stagnant stretches was alive with bugs at top and under the water, and snails around the edges. The walls above them seemed to continually weep water. Long, green streaks of slime grew down the walls where it looked like water almost continually seeped down the rock face, staining it black. In other spots, where the rock walls higher up tilted inward, water dripped in thin rivulets from hundreds of feet overhead, splashing on the ground, creating either bare spots on the rock floor, or in other places, thick wonderlands of mosses growing in shapes like fuzzy miniature cities. In a few spots, the water fell from such towering height that it mostly turned to mist before reaching the bottom. All of that water running and falling down the walls meant that travel along the bottom of the chasms was a wet, miserable trek, either through a jungle of wet undergrowth or over stretches of sloping granite ledge with sheets of water running over a surface of slime that made it extremely slippery. At times, the fall of water echoed, and at other times, it roared. Richard didn't like having to travel through the chasms. He knew that it was dangerous to be in such a confined space. They could usually deviate a little if need be, but in this case, down in the canyons, they had no choice but to get through or turn back and spend days going around. Richard knew that he and Colin would not live long enough to go the long way around. He knew they were running out of time. The thing he didn't like about having to go through such a place, though, was that if they needed to escape any kind of predator that hunted the canyons, they had nowhere to run, and rarely anywhere to hide or seek cover. If they were killed by a predator, they would be just as dead as dying from the poison. At least the thick growth in most places would prevent the flying predators they had encountered before from easily getting in at them. Richard shielded his eyes from the falling drizzle of water to look ahead into the various fractured slivers of passageways, divided by thin walls of rock. Some of those slim walls had collapsed, leaving jumbles of boulders and debris filling the narrow canyons. As they made their way farther in, they saw that in places the thin rock walls had disintegrated, leaving holes going back and forth between adjoining canyons. The farther in they went, the more immense those holes became. In some areas, they formed shallow caves. In other places, they led a short distance through darkness to mossy rocks at the bottoms of towering cliffs in adjacent chasms on the other side. To be able to continue on, they had to make their way up and over stacks of granite slabs littering some of the canyon floors. Some of the huge pieces of stone had been worn down and rounded over by the continual fall of water. As the granite eroded over time, it crumbled away to create gravel beds. Mosses, ferns, and small shrubs grew thick and green in the maze of passageways and tunnels. Vines clung to rocks and climbed the walls, making some look more leaf than rock. Richard snatched Colin's arm just before she stepped on a green snake stretched out along folds in the moss. She let out a sigh of relief as she went around the snake. The men passed word back to be careful of it. Richard didn't know if it was poisonous or not, but he and Colin already had enough poison in them, and Richard wasn't about to test his luck. 
The way ahead offered a choice of winding, forested chasms and enormous caverns. Many of those caverns were passageways interconnecting the chasms. Looking through as they passed, they were offered views through the short stretch of darkness at light and lush growth at the other side. As they climbed the stacked slabs to enter a cavern leading to a chasm on the other side going in the direction they needed to go, he saw something swoop low in the darkness. It wasn't a bat. It was far too big. But the way it flew reminded him of a bat. Richard's blood ran cold when he peered farther into the dark passageway over the heads of the men and saw something dark moving on the surface of the rock above their heads. The whole ceiling of the cavern seemed to come alive, the way a cave full of bats was alive. As the things moved, it stirred the air just enough that the gagging stench of guano wafted out of the cavern. Richard crossed a finger over his lips, signaling the men behind to be as quiet as possible, then urgently gestured for them to go back the way they had come. The men out front, though, turned back and started running out of the cavern, suddenly yelling for everyone to run. Richard didn't know what they had seen, but by the way these fearless soldiers were running, he was not about to stop them to ask questions. He turned Colin around and started back with her. Chapter 60 As the men ran back out of the huge, dark maw of the cavern, something with wings but at least twice the size of a man, dropped from a high ledge up inside the shadows and swooped down toward a running soldier. The man saw it coming and was able to dive to the ground in time to keep from being ripped open by talons. Richard didn't know what the thing was, but even in the gloom he was able to see the size of the claws and knew they didn't want to tangle with it. As they all ran for a different opening, hoping to find protection and cover, masses of the dark creatures came screaming out of the cavern Richard and the others had only just started to enter. The men all had swords or axes out and took a swing to try to ward the things off whenever they came close enough. A few of the men fired arrows into the billowing dark cloud of creatures streaming out of the cavern. The arrows all found their marks but it didn't stop any of the animals. As dark as it was in the confusing maze of chasms with the walls overhead almost closing all the way together, it was difficult to see individual creatures as they raced by overhead or tell what they were other than that they were big and aggressive. As fast as they were moving, they mostly melted together into a long black blur of flapping wings. Richard was sure, though, that once the wary creatures got over their initial caution, they would go into a feeding frenzy. Yet more of them suddenly appeared, pouring out of dark cracks and openings in the walls the way big black bugs emerged from under rocks and logs. Richard saw one of the winged creatures over his shoulder drop out of the flowing black cloud to swoop down toward him and Colin. He spun at the last moment as it plunged in, aiming for Colin with its talons extended, streaking right over the top of Richard's head. Richard made contact with a powerful swing of his sword as it swept past. The blade slit the length of its belly open so that it left a trail of guts and blood on the way down. The matte black creature crashed to the ground just beyond Colin. Teeth snapping, legs flailing, its long neck twisting, it writhed in the throes of death. Yet more of the winged creatures continued to pour out of the cave like bats appearing at dusk. As the dark, undulating ribbon of flying beasts curved downward, Niki, between Richard and Colin, lifted her hands as if pushing back at the creatures. Eight or ten of them folded in midair and plummeted, hitting with ground-shaking thuds. Richard could see dark flesh between the bones of the wings, much like the skin that formed the wings of bats. But the bodies were covered in sooty black scales rather than fur. Although they shared characteristics with other creatures, they were unlike any animal he had seen before. What did you do? Richard asked as he urged Niki and Colin back, trying to keep them under cover of trees and out of the way. I stopped their hearts, Niki said, but I can only do it to a few. There are too many for me to handle. I'm hoping that it will keep the rest of them afraid to come any closer. 
As they ran between the trunks of ash and birch trees toward the safety of another opening in the wall, some kind of creature yowled. It reminded Richard of the sound made by a big cat, like a mountain lion or cougar. The animals screamed again as they continued to run toward the cover of a cavern. Colin snatched Richard's sleeve. Look, she said, as she pointed into another chasm splitting off to their right. Whatever it was, it was back in a narrow canyon with sections of bridging stone closing it off overhead. Vines and exposed roots hung down the walls. Green bands of small plants and shrubs had taken root in the horizontal joints of layered stone. What is it? Richard asked, turning as he ran, focused on watching for any of the creatures that might break from the flock and come at them out of the sky and down through the forest canopy. He was not eager to be exposed out in the open just to have a look. It's Hunter, Colin pointed urgently. Look, it's Hunter up there. Richard wasn't all that surprised. He had seen the animal shadowing them from time to time. He wondered if it had been hoping Colin would give it another snack. He was more concerned about their safety than the green-eyed animal, though. Come on, we need to get in shelter before these things snatch us up out here in the open. When they turned and started out of the trees and up into the mouth of the cavern, Hunter cried out again, louder, this time adding an angry snarl that echoed up and down the narrow canyon. It was a menacing sound that got their attention. This time, nearly everyone turned to look. Once the creature saw that it had their attention, he turned and ran off. A moment later, Hunter was back at the edge of a high rock, watching them. It did the same thing again, running off. Then it came back to sit on its haunches. Hunter doesn't want us to go this way. He wants us to follow him instead, Colin said in astonishment. Richard hesitated, wondering why. He peered off into the cavern they were about to enter, searching for any threat. Deep inside, he saw them then. It was like a thousand bats taking to wing all at once, headed their way. Except these things were twice the size of a man. The air erupted with the roar of all their wings. Hunter yelled again, more urgently this time. Come on, Richard yelled at everyone. Follow it! They all abandoned the cavern entrance and instead ran for the canyon opening where they had seen Hunter vanish. Behind them, Richard could hear the drone of thousands of wings beating. Looking over his shoulder, it looked like a sinister, churning cloud coming for them. One of the men vanished as the black mass swarmed down on him. Even as he saw it about to happen, Richard knew that it was already too late to do anything to save the man. A mist of blood rained down as he was torn apart high up in the air. As the twisting black ribbon of creatures came lower over their heads, Richard saw Irina and Samantha hunching over as they ran. Irina had an arm over Samantha's head to protect her. From what Richard had seen, these beasts would only too eagerly rip off any arm they got hold of. Richard, with his sword out, pushed the two women past him, urging them on faster. I've heard rumors of these things, Irina said as she paused, to cast a spell of her own. Then another, then another, each time causing a few of the beasts to lose their way and slam headlong into the stone walls. Rumors of places in the dark lands infested with what people think might be cave dragons. Whatever they are, there are too many to stop, Richard told her. If you stand here doing that, you'll die. We have to get to safety. Come on, hurry. As Irina and Samantha took off running for their lives, Niki kept a hand on Richard's back, pushing him along, making sure he didn't stop. She turned and, as she ran, cast out a boiling cloud of turbulent flame that caught up and incinerated dozens of the black forms, diverting the course of the main mass for a moment. Wings aflame, trailing oily smoke, some of them bellowed in anger and pain as they spiraled out of the air, hitting the ground with bone-breaking violence. Flaming scales tumbled across the ground. One of them, engulfed in a hot, roaring fire that swiftly consumed the flesh between the bones of its wings, crashed into a pine tree, bending it part way over. The needles went up in a whoosh of flame. Fortunately, the forest was wet enough that the fire didn't spread to other trees. Niki turned to push her hands out again, this time stopping the hearts of a dozen in the lead as they headed in toward them. With their hearts stopped, they folded in midair. 
Others behind, still flying at full speed, crashed into them, tangling their wings together, snapping bones and ripping the membranes of flesh between them. The mid-air collision caused the rest of them to divert their course, giving the people on the ground precious seconds to make their escape. As Richard pushed the last man past him and toward the narrow canyon, he grabbed Nikki's arm and pulled her along with him. Colin, standing close by, urgently snatched up Nikki's other hand. The three of them raced after the rest of the men, all chasing after the small spotted animal as he bounded off over rocks into the distance ahead. Richard hoped that following a hunter was a good idea. As he looked over his shoulder, he knew that the animal had called out just in time before they had gotten too far into that cavern full of the cave dragons. It had probably saved their lives. Following Hunter, wherever he was leading them, made the most sense. Chapter 61 The rock roof of the cavern into which they ran formed a peak along the top. Mosses and plants hung from the stone roof, giving it a lush, living green softness. Pools of perfectly still water suddenly frothed as all the men ran right through them. The sound of all their boots and the splashing water echoed around the chamber in a deafening clamor. While some of the soldiers took the lead to make sure that the way ahead was clear, most of the men slowed and fell in behind to protect Richard and Colin from what was chasing them. Nikki, too, stayed close behind to protect them. Irina and Samantha ran close to him on the opposite side of Colin. Richard looked back over his shoulder and saw in the dim light out through the opening behind them that the winged predators turned aside, rather than enter the cavern opening with them. For some reason, they circled just outside like a dark tornado. They roared in anger, none of them daring to enter the cavern. Most rotated in the massive vortex of creatures, while some flapped their enormous wings to hold themselves in place in midair, just outside the opening to the cavern. They lowered their long heads, peering in at where their prey had gone. As eager as they had been before, Richard couldn't imagine why they wouldn't come in after all of them, but he was more than glad not to have to try to fight them off. At the same time, he worried about why they wouldn't enter. They had to be afraid of something. The cavern they were racing into was certainly large enough. It was larger, in fact, than the caves and cracks the creatures had been nesting in. Up ahead, the short, peaked cavern opened out into a brighter area at the bottom of dark, sheer stone walls. Rock piled in the bottom of the chasm over the millennia had eroded away until it had become rounded. Now it was all covered under thick layers of vibrant green mosses. Vines climbed the walls to the sides. Trees had taken root in the mosses on the mounds of decaying rock, engulfing them in tangled masses of roots. Water, lit from above, wafted down in streamers and mist. Ahead, thin shoots of waterfalls cascaded down to pools, creating clouds of mist. From there, the water looked like it drained into narrow cracks that carried it underground. Do you see where that little furry friend of yours went? Richard asked Colin. She pointed. I saw him run up ahead, that way. I saw him stop up higher on the rocks up there, making sure we followed him. I wish I knew why he wanted us to follow him, Richard said. Maybe he wants to help, Colin said. Maybe he knows this place, and he wants to get us to safety. Richard didn't think it could be that simple, but he didn't say so. There was more to it. What more there could be, he didn't know. But for the time being... The small cat had gotten most of them away from what would surely have been a gruesome death. The rocky ground ascended on stepped layers of fallen slabs and boulders, a tangled growth of shrubs with large leaves, and small lacy trees had taken root over and among the rock. The ascending floor of the chasm took them up ever higher over the stepped ledges. Ahead, Richard could see that the walls closed off overhead again with showers of water falling on the far side like a wet curtain. The whole place looked like a passageway to the good spirits. Richard recalled what Zed had told him about always appreciating the beauty of things. It was certainly beautiful down at the bottom of the chasm. 
The temperatures down deep in the gorges were likely moderated to an extent from the heat and cold up above. Protected as the place was from harsh elements, it allowed everything to grow green and lush in the temperate, wet climate. The rock at the bottom continued its ascent up the floor of the chasm, making the canyon ever more shallow the farther they went. The more he was able to see of the landmarks off to the sides above them, the more he recognized where they were. Richard realized that they were finally coming out the far end of the maze. An hour more of hard climbing at last brought them out of the deep canyons to the forest above. All around, mountains ascended into low, dark, ragged clouds. The woods, though, were anything but a normal forest. As the ground flattened out, they found themselves entering a woodland of the trees that were all some kind of gnarled hardwood. They looked something like oaks, but were not oak. Richard had never seen the trees before. The canopy of leaves created a kind of ceiling overhead, leaving it dark and somber at ground level. The craggy, bare trunks all looked black in the dim light. Higher up on the trunks, the wood became increasingly knobby and knotted. Twisted, misshapen branches rose from there up into the thick canopy of blackish-green leaves. It almost appeared that they were entering a vast chamber with black pillars holding up the dark green roof. The only light that made it down to the mostly barren forest floor was a hazy gray-green color. As far as Richard could see off into the murky distance, there were hundreds of the black trunks supporting the ceiling of leaves. Ravens somewhere up in the limbs let out calls that echoed through the crooked wood. He could see some of the big birds in the distance to the sides drop down out of the leaves to fly off among the trunks, cawing as they departed. Colin pointed, Look, there's Hunter. He saw the animal off in the distance, sitting on its haunches, waiting for them. Richard rested the palm of his left hand on the hilt of his sword as he kept watch on everything else around them. The place was creepy. That was the only way to describe it. He saw that the men of the first file, spread out through the strange woods, ever on guard for any threat, were also looking warily around. Nikki looked as grim as the men. Irina and Samantha were clearly afraid of the place. As they cautiously made their way ahead through the endless expanse of the half-dead-looking woods, Richard spotted something dark off in the hazy distance that was not trees. He realized that it looked like people standing still and silent, except that it looked like they had horns. He saw then more of them emerge from behind trees to the sides. All of the figures carried long, straight staffs that were a little taller than they were. It wasn't long before they were surrounded by the silhouettes of what looked like nothing so much as horned people. Irina slowly dry-washed her hands as she peered suspiciously from one of the still silent figures to another. Richard could see the shadowed form of Hunter off in the distance, watching them from far beyond the figures that had loosely closed in around them. What are they? Samantha whispered to her mother. Irina's gaze darted among the silent, dark, horned figures. Cunning folk. Richard didn't have to ask if she thought they were dangerous. By how pale Irina's face had gotten, it was clear she thought they were. Chapter 62 Cunning Folk Commander Fister asked in a quiet voice when he overheard what Irina had said. She nodded to the commander as he leaned down close to her. I think so. I've never met any of them myself. From things I'd always heard, I never wanted to. The commander appraised the situation and how many of the strange figures stood scattered throughout the dark wood. There were not enough for the men of the first file to be concerned, if it was only a matter of numbers. No one, though, thought that numbers were the problem. Tell the men to stand down, Richard told the commander. We don't know that they mean us any harm, and we don't want to give them cause. This is still part of the Daharan Empire. We are not invaders, but we are still coming into their home, so we owe them respect. 
I don't want them to see us as a threat. Got it, Commander Fister said as he hiked up his trousers. Be polite to the nice people with horns. He moved off, casually passing the word among the waiting men. Richard saw one of the closer figures thump his staff on the ground three times. Small, arcing sparks crackled at the top end of the staff. Richard looked over at Niki out of the corner of his eye. Gifted magic? No, she said. Some other kind of power. Most likely occult abilities. All the more reason to be cautious and show them a calm face. Colin said. Richard nodded his agreement. Wait here. Niki immediately seized his shirt at his shoulder. No, you don't. You stay right where you are, protected by all of us. Let him come to us. Richard let out a deep sigh. All right. He lifted an arm, waving, so that the man who had thumped the staff would see him. The dark figure watched Richard for a time, waiting to see what the soldiers off to the sides would do, before finally coming forward to meet them. As the figure who had thumped his staff approached, he was joined by half a dozen other figures. They followed close behind him, off to the sides a little. All of them looked the same. All had staffs. All were coal black, much like the tree trunks all around them. All of them had long horns. Once they were close enough, Richard was surprised to see that they were all covered head to toe in what appeared to be thick black mud, heavily loaded with straw. They all had steer skulls over their heads. The steer skulls were covered in the same black, muddy straw. The idea of people wearing steer skulls over their heads struck him as rather silly. But standing there covered in the thick layer of black straw, eyes staring out from inside those skulls, they didn't look at all silly. They looked intimidating. He knew, though, that intimidation was obviously the purpose. Intimidation often provided safety. Richard could see nothing of them other than the thick layer of muddy straw and the skulls covering their heads. It was not even possible to tell if they were men or women. My name is Richard, he said, when the one who had thumped his staff came to a halt. The man waited without saying anything. It is urgent that we get to Saavedra, Richard told them. Not to us. The man said in a voice muffled by the skull he was wearing over his head. Richard noticed that more figures covered in the same pitch black straw and wearing the same kind of steer skulls had emerged from behind trees. They gathered, closing in around the interlopers. He knew that the soldiers could easily handle the numbers, but he didn't think they could handle the occult powers that he feared these people could wield. We mean you and your people no harm. Richard said, we only wish to pass through here and we will be on our way. The straw man looking among several of those beside Richard. There is evil among you. Richard wasn't sure what he meant. Evil? You, the man said, tipping his staff toward Richard. You have it in you. He tipped his staff toward Colin. She does as well. Richard nodded. We're sick. That is why we need to get to Saavedra. We need to get there so we can be cured of this sickness. But you needn't worry. You cannot catch it from us. We know that. Richard wondered if that was true, and if so, how the man could know. Of course, he was able to recognize the poison in him and Colin, and it certainly was evil. Richard suspected it was an indication of the abilities of their occult powers. Jit had occult abilities, and this poison had come from her, so, in a way, it made sense that they would recognize it. We mean you no harm, Richard said. We only wish to pass peacefully through your land. We will hurry and pass through quickly and be swiftly on our way. You may only pass if the oracle says that you may pass. Richard shrugged. That sounds fair. I would be happy to speak with your oracle. The head with horns swiveled as the man apparently looked through the eye holes in the skull at the people to each side of Richard. You do not choose who will speak to the oracle, he said. The oracle chooses who will speak to her. Richard deliberately didn't react to the man's hostile tone, but instead tried to appear calm and agreeable. 
Even so, he was only a twitch away from drawing his sword if matters took a turn for the worse. All right. Will you take us to your oracle, then? The man appraised them for a moment longer. He thumped his staff, causing the top end to flicker with little flashes. We are the people of the straw. Come with us. He and the other straw figures turned and started weaving their way among the dark trunks of trees, through the eerie, misty haze, toward where Richard had last seen Hunter. Richard glanced over at Nikki before taking up Colin's hand and starting out after the people of the straw. Chapter 63 The walk through the strange forest of gnarled trees was longer than Richard had thought it might be. The ground, never getting much light below the thick canopy, was dead-looking, with very little growing in the crusty black ground. There was a bit of weedy growth that spider-webbed across the ground, but what wasn't dead was brown and sickly-looking. Richard knew of trees with roots that were poisonous to other plants. It kept other things from growing up and crowding out the trees. Richard wished that Zed were with them. Richard's grandfather would surely have something to say about this place and the people of the straw. Richard wished that he had his grandfather's advice and his company. Even though he was gone, Zed was always in Richard's thoughts. Even those times when they had been far apart, Richard had always been comforted by the knowledge that he was somewhere. Now he was gone. The world felt like a dead and lonely place without the old wizard, his grandfather, his friend, his most trusted advisor. It seemed impossible that Zed wasn't alive and well somewhere. For Richard's entire life, Zed had always been alive, always been there for him. Richard wanted his grandfather back. He knew that would never happen, but he would one day have his hands around the throat of the person responsible for Zed's murder. After a time, they arrived at a more open area with a tight cluster of buildings set in the expanse in the dark forest. All the buildings were square, all of them one story. They appeared to be made of the same muddy straw as that covering the people. Even though the forest had opened up to the sky, the sky was so dark with threatening, leaden clouds that it didn't do much to brighten the scene. Everything from the trees to the straw men to the black straw buildings was dark and dead and dismal looking. Richard realized that the muddy straw covering the men and the buildings had to be something more stable than mud or the frequent rains of the Darklands would dissolve their straw garb as well as their homes. It also had to be something more flexible than mud, or it would dry, crack, and crumble off when the men walked. From what he saw, none of the thick, muddy straw looked anything but entirely intact. Richard saw faces and windows that were nothing more than square openings in the plastered straw walls. The faces were not wearing skulls, but looked like normal people. Back behind some of the buildings, he saw frames drying skins of what looked like deer. He also saw smoke houses. There were wooden tubs and other community property for the small village. When people began emerging from buildings, he was surprised to see that they were all dressed more or less normally. Their clothes were rather drab, but none would have looked out of place just about anywhere. He saw men and women of every age, as well as a few children. The children stayed inside or behind the buildings, too shy to come out, but too curious about the strangers to stay hidden. The people all looked cautious but inquisitive. They didn't show any indications of being hostile. From what Richard had seen of the Dark Lands, caution was more than warranted. There were fewer than maybe a hundred people in the small village. By the number of buildings, he doubted that there were more than he wasn't seeing. They all hung back as the straw man who had spoken to Richard went to speak with them. The people had what looked like a heated discussion, arms waving as they talked to the straw man. It went on for a time before the straw man finally thumped his staff. When he did, the conversation ended. Everyone fell silent. The people all vanished back into the simple buildings. Richard and all those with him had no idea what was going on and could only wait until the man returned. 
Come with me, the straw man wearing a steer's skull told them. They all followed him into the tiny village, trying to look non-threatening as they walked among the buildings to an open square in the center. The straw men they had seen at first surrounded the square after Richard, Colin, Niki, Irina, Samantha, and the soldiers were all packed together. As they waited for what would happen next, Richard looked over at Samantha. She had told him before how she longed to travel to different places and see new things. She had said that Stroiza was boring, and she hoped to one day leave her little village and go on adventures. Enough adventure for you yet? he asked her with a smile. She looked up at him with big, dark eyes and nodded, finally returning his smile. It looked a little forced. Do you think they will let us pass? she asked. They will, Nikki said in Richard's place while she kept her gaze fixed on the straw men, or they will meet death's mistress. Samantha eased back in the shadow of her mother. Richard didn't feel the need to warn Nikki to take it easy and not do anything rash. She was experienced, and he knew that she wouldn't be the one to start something. But if trouble started, she might be the one to swiftly end it. He could hear some kind of commotion in one of the more distant buildings. Muffled voices were having a spirited conversation. At last, the voices fell silent. In short order, a crowd emerged. They all walked close together, pushing and pulling one another along. They seemed gripped by a sense of occasion and by fear. In their midst was a woman, looking like any of the other villagers. She was dressed the same as the rest of them, except that in her case, her blouse was dyed a dark henna. Her straight, dark hair was pulled back into a loose ponytail tied with a strip of leather. She had been blindfolded with a piece of cloth dyed with henna, like her blouse, but much brighter. It was not hard to tell by the way she walked with her hands held out, feeling blindly for anything in her way, that she was clearly uncomfortable being blindfolded. Richard wondered if she had come willingly. He supposed that as long as she was only blinded with a piece of cloth over her eyes, he wasn't going to make an issue of it. Many of the people in the crowd around her pressed hands to her, helping guide her, reassuring her, encouraging her. One of the younger men took one of her hands and put it on his shoulder to help show her the way. She looked bewildered, confused, and at the same time, the way she held her chin up, maybe a bit honored to be the one blindfolded. She had certainly become an instant luminary among the people of Straw. She also looked like she didn't know for sure what to expect. The crowd around her shuffled to a stop before Richard and those standing close to either side beside him. Whatever the ceremony was they were involved in appeared to be a rare event. Richard imagined that they didn't often receive strangers out in the wilderness where they lived. At the same time, if they had an oracle, he was sure that there would occasionally be people come from great distances to see her. The straw man turned to Richard. Through this blind woman, the oracle will pick the one who will be allowed to speak to her. As the woman groped blindly with a hand, the straw man reached out, took hold of her hand, and placed it on his staff. He molded her fingers around the shaft. When she nodded that she was ready, he stepped aside. The blindfolded woman shuffled forward, using the staff to help her feel her way. When she got close to the line of strangers, she stopped. Her chin held up, trying to sense who stood before her, but she couldn't. She began shuffling ahead again, this time walking down the line of strangers. She kept going until she reached the last soldier. And then she returned, holding her chin up as she blindly made progress back, trying to sense something of each one of those waiting before her. Finally, she returned to a stop not far away. She turned toward them as she placed her second hand on the staff. Richard knew that they didn't have time to waste. If this ceremony didn't end pretty soon, he was going to have to put an end to it himself. The palm of his left hand rested on the hilt of his sword. They needed to get to the containment field in Savedra. These people were either going to help, or he would have to sweep them aside and get through the pass. Finally, 
The blindfolded woman tipped the staff forward to tap Colin once on each shoulder. You, she said. The oracle will see you and no one else. Richard was about to say he wouldn't allow it when Colin stepped forward and spoke before he had a chance. Thank you. Please take me to the oracle at once. We have no time to spare. Two of the straw men crossed their staffs before Richard when he started to take a step forward. You will wait until the oracle speaks with her, the straw man said. Colin held a hand back toward Richard, urging him to stay put. It's all right, Richard. Just wait here. I don't like. I am the mother confessor. I have been doing this sort of thing my whole life. We don't have any time to waste. Let me get this over with so we can be on our way. That's what matters. He wanted to say that when she had done this sort of thing in the past, she had always had access to her power. Now she didn't. But she was right that this would be the fastest way to get past and less risky than a fight. As long as it went well. Richard heaved a sigh. You're right. We will wait here. Call out if you need help, Nikki said. I will hear you. Colin nodded and then followed after the blindfolded woman with the staff. Richard didn't know exactly what was going on, but he did know that he didn't like it one bit. Chapter 64 Colin followed the blindfolded woman as she walked through the center of their village. The woman in the henna-colored blouse seemed to be better able to navigate now that she was holding the staff one of the straw men had given her, almost as if it were showing her the way as she walked down the center of the opening between buildings. The people of the village stood to the sides, silently watching her pass. Children, holding the frames of window openings, rested their chins on their hands. None of them spoke. Colin didn't like how somber they appeared to be over what they were witnessing. It reminded her of people watching a funeral procession. What is your name? Colin asked the woman she was following. The woman, walking with her chin lifted, turned an ear back toward Colin. I am the one the oracle has chosen to use. I am the one who is in service to her this day. I see, Colin said half to herself. At the far end of the village, they plunged back into the somber woods made up entirely of the strange trees. The ground, still barren, dead and dark, started to incline under the obscuring canopy of leaves. After a time, until Colin noticed rock bluffs to the sides funneling them ahead. When they came to a place where the passage narrowed somewhat, more normal-looking trees began to take over from the strange forest. Shrubs and plants dotted the ground among white birch and linden, thick with fragrant, fluffy, yellowish blossoms. The blindfolded woman stopped at the fringes of where the dark trees grew. This is as far as I'm allowed to go, she said. And what am I to do? Colin asked. The woman tilted the staff ahead. You are to go on alone. I cannot go beyond here. You must go the rest of the way alone. How will I know the way? The woman tilted the staff again. The oracle is that way. You will find her if you go that way. When she sensed Colin hesitating, she tilted her head in gesture back toward the village. This is your last chance to turn back. Think carefully on what you are about to do. Not many are pleased to hear what the oracle would tell them. People are rarely satisfied by hearing such things, Colin said, but I don't have a choice. The woman nodded. I can feel the sickness in you. Colin took a deep breath as she looked off into the woods ahead. Thank you for bringing me. Do not thank me before you see the oracle. Afterwards, for bringing you here, you may yet curse the day I was born. I choose to thank you. Neither of us has a choice in what we do today. The woman smiled. In that, you are right. While you speak with the oracle, I will wait back in our village with those you travel with. If the oracle decides that you may pass, I will know and I will bring them. Once the blindfolded woman turned back toward the way they had come, Colin started off in the other direction. She was glad, at least, to once again be in a more normal-looking forest rather than the spooky black wood. She found a small brook where gloomy light filtered down to the lacy leaves of some of the young trees growing along the mossy rocks along the bank. 
Colin fanned her head in front of her face as she passed through little clouds of gnats hovering above the brook. Up on the banks to the sides grew thickets of brush and larger trees. Even with the gnats and other buzzing bugs, it was easier to walk along the brook than to make her way through the congested forest to the sides. She could occasionally see through gaps in the trees that the rock walls that had narrowed the passage had receded back to become the lower reaches of forested mountains rising up to either side. The brook eventually led her through a stand of birches. The dark spots on the white bark looked like a thousand eyes watching her. The birches eventually thinned out as she moved along the brook into a more open grassland. The dark wall of forest receded into the distance to the sides, leaving a flat, grassy plain. The brook broadened out in a series of shallow pools as crystal clear water moved quietly over gravel beds. Out in the open at last, Colin was finally able to better see the true enormity of the mountains. They stood like hazy, pale, gray-blue walls rising up to either side. She couldn't see any other way through the towering, snow-covered peaks. As far as she could tell, they had indeed found the pass through the mountains that would lead them to Saavedra. Now, all she had to do was get the oracle to give her blessing for them to travel through the pass. In among small, grassy, rolling rises, she found the source of the brook. The water, looking to be fed from a spring below, flowed up through a split in a knee-high boulder and down the sides. Through the clear water in the pool around the boulder, she spotted minnows above the gravelly bottom swimming into the gentle current. The place vaguely reminded Colin of something she had seen before, but she couldn't bring it to mind. Beyond the spring, over a grassy rise, she saw a broad valley forested with huge oaks and maples. The massive trunks of the spreading oaks created a beautiful, natural cathedral below the crowns. Had her mission not been so vital, and her worry for Richard so great, Colin would have marveled at the size and beauty of the trees set among the lush expanse of grass. As she walked through the waist-high grass, something began crunching under her feet. Sometimes the grasses collapsed inward when her foot broke through. She paused and looked down. Among the tussocks, she saw something slightly round just under the brown thatch of dead grass. She noticed that the ground all around looked lumpy. With the side of her boot, she scraped at the thick layer of dead grass down at the base of the new green shoots. Her foot exposed something that looked like bone. Colin scanned the entire area all around her and saw that all of it was cluttered with the smallish round humps. Those round bulges were what had been crunching and collapsing inward as she had stepped on them. With the side of her boot, she worked to expose more of the round mound. It was a skull. She squatted and pulled it out so she could turn it over. Empty eye sockets stared blindly up at her. The skull was human. Colin stood in a rush. She peered out over the grassy area and saw that there were small round mounds everywhere, as far as she could see. Even in the distance, she could detect the telltale rounded spots down beneath the grass. They were all so close together that it would be impossible not to tread on a skull with every step. There had to be hundreds of human skulls littering just the area close in around her. By the way the ground in all directions was mounted, Colin suspected that the skulls were not merely lying on the surface of the ground, but heaped up in deep piles. She had no idea how many human skulls she was standing on, but she quickly changed her estimate from hundreds to thousands. She had no idea what had happened in this place, but she told herself that if she didn't get permission for her and everyone with her to pass, and they tried to pass without that permission, they very well might end up here, with grass growing up out of their bones. But if she didn't get permission to pass, she and Richard would be dead within days. Niki had told her how short their remaining lives would be if the poison was not removed. With no time to waste, she couldn't worry about the dead she was walking over. Her only concern now had to be for the living, not only her and Richard, but everyone else who depended on them. 
making her way through the monarch oaks. Eyeing songbirds flitting about up in the branches, she saw that the trees gave way to a central area that looked like it should have been sunlit. But the murky day would not cooperate. She could see someone, no doubt the oracle, sitting on a stone bench near the center of that open area. Colin wasted no time contemplating what she had to do or what she might say. She marched straight toward the woman. When she finally reached her, Colin came to a stop, waiting behind the woman sitting sideways on the gray granite bench, facing away. Her hair was a thick mass of dozens and dozens of matted, ropey locks of hair hanging loosely down on all sides. Her hair was bright red. Good afternoon, Mother Confessor. The woman said in a silken voice without turning, Thank you for coming. It was then that Colin noticed Hunter sitting quietly off to the side, watching with big green eyes. Colin knew in that instant that there was a lot more going on than she had at first realized. Chapter 65 The woman on the bench finally turned, gazing up at Colin for a moment before standing. Her gray dress looked far too elegant for the woods. Colin saw no home or building of any sort. The woman's piercing sky-blue eyes made her tight thatch of ropey red locks, by contrast, look all the more red. They were the sort of eyes that could easily be cruel. They were the kind of eyes that had witnessed many terrible things. Colin thought that the oracle might have been rather attractive, had she not painted her lips black. Thank you for seeing me, Colin said. The woman gracefully bowed her head. Of course. I am honored to have the mother confessor herself come to see me. My name is Red. Red, Colin repeated, glancing to the woman's strange hair, thinking that the name was pretty obvious. The woman's black lips widened in a slightly amused smile. You think I am called Red because of my hair. It had crossed my mind, Colin said. Of course it did. But you would be wrong. The tolerant smile stayed on her face, not touching any other of her smooth features. I am called Red because there have been times when this pass through the mountains. She swept an arm out first in the direction Colin needed to go, and then in the direction from which they had come, has run red with blood. There have been times when I have turned this pass to a river of blood. She shrugged. So, that was how I came to be called Red. The hair came after. The smile widened. Because I like the name. I see, Colin said. You needn't sound so reproachful, Mother Confessor. After all, there have been times when you, too, have turned the countryside red with blood. That's true, Colin admitted. She sought to clarify the idea with a bit of context. Sometimes people need killing. Red laughed. Yes, indeed they do. The laughter died out as she leaned a bit closer, looking hard into Colin's eyes. I'm glad that you feel that way. Colin glanced over at Hunter, sitting quietly watching. She gestured at him. Do you know that small creature? Red didn't bother looking. So cute, isn't he? His mother is... A protector of mine. I would not describe her as cute, though. You would never guess from looking at the little fellow just how big she is or how ferocious. He is quite the good little boy. I sent him to you. Colin frowned. Why? To make sure that you made it here. I put the thorn in his paw so that you two would become friends. Though he is still small, like his mother, he is quite the fierce protector. Colin was still frowning. How did you know that he would find me, or that I would find the thorn and take it out? For that matter, how did you know that we would come this way? Oh, come now, Mother Confessor. What kind of oracle would I be if I did not see such important events in the flow of time? The flow of time. It suddenly came to Colin why the clear spring coming up from the boulder and the cathedral of trees looked familiar. You're a witch woman. Red smiled indulgently. Yes. The simple people here have never imagined such a thing. I don't think they would understand. 
I give them little bits from the flow of time, such as I did when I told them that all of you would come through their home place. So, they think I am an oracle. Colin cocked her head. I've had dealings with the witch woman in the past. Do you know Shoda? Red flicked her hand dismissively. Never heard of the witch. Colin glanced around. So, where are all your snakes? Red made a show of visibly shuddering. Snakes. Horrid creatures. I hate them. Me too, Colin said, feeling just the slightest bit better. Maybe Red was not the trouble Shota had proved herself to be. Shota is rather fond of snakes. Disgusting, Red said, shuddering again. I much prefer worms. Colin blinked. Worms? Red nodded earnestly. Much more agreeable creatures than snakes. More obedient and much more useful as well. What good are worms? Amused, Red leaned closer. You're joking. No, really. Red gestured vaguely behind Colin, back toward the mounds of skulls. Well, for one thing, the little ones are good at cleaning up messes. Colin cocked her head. The little ones? Red straightened. She looked back over her shoulder. Worm, come to me. Colin had never heard of worms that would come when called. She wondered briefly if Red had all her senses. In a moment, though, she began to feel the ground beneath her feet trembling, and then it shook as if from an earthquake. Abruptly, not far behind Red, the ground broke open. Dirt flew up and away as something big erupted from under the sod. Colin stared in disbelief. A worm as big around as the trunk of a mid-sized oak lifted part of itself up and out of the dirt. It stretched its wet head up over Red's shoulder. There was no face, no eyes, only an enormous round mouth ringed with teeth. The opening of the mouth undulated along with the rest of the distended, banded sections of the never-still rippling body. The teeth clacked together when the mouth snapped closed and open again. Worm eats snakes for the fun of it, Red said, amused by the startled look on Colin's face. With that, she bent and snatched a snake up from under the bench. Smiling at Colin, she flipped the writhing snake back over her shoulder. The enormous worm snapped it out of midair like a dog snapping up a table scrap tossed its way. Red waved a hand without looking back, dismissing the thing. The worm's massive body ripped in muscular waves as it pulled itself back down into the ground. The dirt and sod collapsed in around the hole as it vanished beneath the ground. Your little furry friend's mother is even more formidable, the witch woman said. I can only imagine, Colin said as she glanced over at Hunter. Red, you obviously went to a lot of trouble getting me to come here. Not a lot of trouble, Red said with a shrug. I saw in the flow of time that you would come this way. I didn't want you to be ripped apart and eaten back there in the chasms, so I sent your little friend to show you the way and keep you alive. Thank you, was all Colin could think to say. But what am I doing here? We need permission to go through here. We need to be on our way. What is it you want from me? Ah, Red said, direct and to the point. Well, with the condition you and Lord Rawl are in, I suppose that you have no time to waste, so we had best get right to our business. My business is getting to Saavedra, Colin told the woman. We're in a hurry. We don't want any trouble. We simply need you to give us your permission to go through this pass. Yes, Red drawled. But first, we have important business. Colin frowned again. What business? Red's piercing blue eyes fixed on her. I need you to kill someone for me. Chapter 66 You need me to kill someone? Colin asked. She didn't see why a witch woman with this much ability and reach couldn't do her own killing if it was so important. I'm not an assassin. Not for anyone, including you. Yes, that's all well and good, but you need to do this killing. So I need to make you understand how important it is so that you will not fail. Colin took a deep breath. She knew the woman wasn't going to let them pass until Colin at least heard her out. Fine, let's hear it then, but be quick about it. I don't have long to live unless I get this sickness out of me. Yes, Red drawled again. The call of death from that vile creature, Jit. Colin cast a suspicious look at the woman. You know of Jit and the poison in us? 
Red rolled her eyes. I am a witch woman. Of course I know of important matters that involve central figures such as you and Lord Rawl. It is all part of the larger issue. It's part of why you must perform the task I have for you. You mean killing someone for you? That's right. She took a deep breath of her own as she considered how to begin. Well, since you are rapidly running out of time, I will try to make this as short as I can. I would appreciate that, Collins said, not really wanting to hear it. She thought about the field of skulls and realized that at least listening to what Red had to say was probably wise. They needed to be on their way. Fighting their way through was not a risk they needed. Listening would take less time. You see, Mother Confessor, I have seen the demon. He is here in the world of life. The demon? The one called Sulachan? He has long been dead. He belongs in the world of the dead, and you expect me to kill Sulachan? Colin was incredulous. No, not exactly. Not directly, anyway. What I expect is for you to make it possible for him to be sent back to the underworld, where he belongs. Colin certainly wanted Sulachan and his scheme stopped. Since Red seemed to have the same objective, Colin suddenly became more interested. Make it possible? How am I supposed to do that? I am trying to explain the larger picture, if you would allow me. You said you were in a hurry. Colin nodded. Sorry. Go on. Sulachan is an ancient evil that blighted the world. He died long ago and belongs in the world of the dead. By all that is right, he should not be a problem for us today, but he is. In life, he was a sickly man. He was also a man of vision. Evil vision. Deranged vision, but vision nonetheless. Knowing he was slowly dying, he began making preparations long before he ever passed over into the world of the dead. Despite being sickly, he was a powerful wizard, possessing both the gift and occult powers. I don't understand this business with occult powers, Colin said. I've never encountered them before. Why do they suddenly seem to be springing up all over? Red swept an arm around. Everything requires balance. That balance runs the gamut from the minuscule to the most central elements. Conflict seeks balance. Balance is often achieved by conflict. Heat and cold, darkness and light. Bad balanced by good, hate by love, that sort of thing. Smaller parts, such as the good spirits versus demons, are part of a larger balance of life versus death. All elements are built from smaller, balanced elements. The gift itself is balanced between additive magic and subtractive magic. Yet on a larger scale, the totality of that internal balance within the gift, the gift itself, is balanced by occult powers. Back in the Great War, those like Sulachan were defeating the gifted. That threatened to throw the worlds of life and death out of balance. The gifted prevailed, though, sealing those with occult powers behind the barrier. The gift thus gained dominance. But because everything always seeks balance, they knew the seals on the barrier could not last forever. And indeed, they haven't. Occult powers have been leaking out for some time, and now they are once again fully free and among us. I see, Colin said, considering the repercussions. So you were saying about Sulachan dying? With his own abilities and the help of many others whom he commanded, he manipulated powers in the underworld before he died, occult powers, to prepare his place there. His spirit has been working for the 3,000 years since his death to reconnect with the forces he had put into place here in this world when he had been alive. Forces. You mean like the half-people? Yes. He knew that they could not be contained forever. He knew that one day they would be freed from their exile and then be able to work to call his spirit back from the world of the dead into his body in the world of life. He also used the spirits of the dead he reanimated, drawing their spirits out of their eternal rest in the underworld to do his bidding. Once he pulled them away from their link to the gift that had taken them beyond the veil, they lost that connection 
and no longer knew where they belonged. He used them as his ethereal messengers between worlds. Lastly, Sulichon managed to enlist the essential help of the man who used to live a couple of days in that direction, she said, flicking a hand in the direction of Savedra off through the pass. Hannes Ark, Colin said. He ruled Fajin province from the citadel in Savedra. He ruled much of Fajin province, but not all, she said, looking abruptly venomous. I hold sway here. But that is the man, she said, retracting her fangs a bit. Hannes Ark benefited profoundly from the occult powers leaking out from behind the barrier. As a result, he has been able to tamper with the very nature of the grace, the very way the world of life exists, bending those laws in order to bring Sulichan's spirit back into this world. And your abilities are powered by what the grace represents, Colin said, so your very existence is at stake. That's right. As are your abilities and Lord Rawls. Were you not sick with Jit's touch? Sulajan wants to bend those forces until they break. Hannes Ark wants to rule the world of life. He helped Sulajan fulfill his ambitions in return for Sulajan's help. Both men also know that there are always those who are all too eager to help them. Those minions serve to provide an audience of sycophants for evil, such as Sulachan and Hannes Ark bring into the world. In return, they earn the table scraps of praise from the depraved. While powerfully gifted and possessing occult powers, able to mine prophecy and bring Sulachan's spirit back through the veil, Hannes Ark didn't have the army necessary to accomplish his more ambitious goals of rule. For that, he needed help. So he brought Sulichan back to provide that help. One hand washes the other. Colin said, yes. They formed an alliance. Hannes Ark would do what was needed in this world to bring Sulichan back from the dead. Among other things, that meant using the invaluable blood of the bringer of death, your husband, to call Sulichan back from the dead. One of those matters of balance I spoke of. In return, Sulichan provided the army of half-people and all the revived corpses Hannes Ark could ever need for conquest. Hannes Ark, in turn, continues to provide the worldly occult powers necessary to sustain Sulichan here in this world. And so on, round and round it goes, both locked together, helping each other, but each with motives of his own, each using the other because he has to. Each man also thinks he controls the other. For now, they both work together toward the same ends. For now, they share the same goals and need each other. But they are like two vipers, each with the tail of the other in his mouth. Unfortunately, we will all be long dead and in the merciless hands of the Keeper before that alliance ever comes to be inconvenient for either. By then, if they are not stopped first, it will be too late for this world because Sulichan ultimately wishes to destroy the boundary between the world of life and the world of the dead. The balance of creation itself would be broken. That would be a bad thing. A very bad thing. Thus, we must act or we all die. Chapter 67 Look, Red, Colin said. You don't need to explain the consequences to me. I am quite aware of what it would mean. Are you really? Red asked. It would mean not only the end of the natural order of life as we know it, but the Keeper would have me. Do you have any idea of how much the Keeper of the Underworld lusts to get witch women into his clutches? Outside the natural order of the grace? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Shoda told me all about it. But you are hardly the only one. All of us would be in an eternity of agony should Sulachan and Hannes Ark succeed. It's not only about you, Red. It's about everyone. Colin leaned closer. Everyone. Red showed a cunning smile. As if that had been her point all along. And don't you ever forget it, Mother Confessor. I may have my own self-interest, but that self-interest just happens to be the same as everyone else's. My fate would be everyone's fate. The Keeper would be loosed on the world, on all of us. 
the dead would feed on the living. Red straightened a bit and smoothed her gray dress at her hips. I'm not sure that you truly comprehend the horror of what that would mean, or that you actually grasp the true enormity of it. Once Sulachan and Hannes Ark destroy the boundary between life and death, there is no putting it back together. All of creation would be forever out of balance. In such a chaotic, unbalanced state, it would mean the end of all of existence. Creation itself would eventually wink out of existence, like an ember dying. But in the grand scale of time, that could still mean a thousand years, or ten thousand years, of ceaseless agony for all of us on the wrong side of that doomed struggle. Sulachan, in his arrogant delusions, believes he can control such forces and bend them to his will. Hanat's Ark, in his lust for power, sees a thousand years of reign as an eternity. They make the perfect lethal pair, delusion and lust, both possessing great power individually, multiplied by their alliance and driven by their objectives, both cheered on by those who hate, gleeful at the obscenity of lost hope. Once such forces of chaos are loosed, there would be no one capable of putting them back. Once everything has spun out of control, it is only a matter of time before it is all over. Life, existence, would be extinguished. Therefore, Sulachan and Hanisark must be stopped before they can ever bring such insanity to pass. Colin let out an impatient sigh. Red, I know all of this. You aren't really telling me anything new. I already know how vital it is that they are stopped. That is precisely what we are trying to do, and you are wasting my time in that effort. We need to get through the pass, and after we are healed, we are going to try to stop the threat. Get to the point or send us on our way. Red folded her arms and leaned one shoulder in toward Colin. I am trying to put the nature of what you must do into context so that you will understand how vital it is. Colin pressed a hand to her forehead. She could feel the evil inside her clawing to be freed. It was going to be that way for everyone. She took a breath, trying to be patient. Red, I'm dying. Believe me, I get the context. I don't have a lot of time left to do anything to help you. We need to be on our way. I get it that they must be stopped or they will do something irreversible. Would you please just tell me what it is that you think you need me to do? Red leveled a sharp look at her. It is not what I think. It is what I know. I see events in the flow of time. And what I see is that there is only one person who has the potential to stop all of these horrors I have described from coming to pass. And who would that be? Colin asked as patiently as possible. You know very well, Mother Confessor, who that would be. Red said with a scowl, It is the pebble in the pond, the bringer of death, the Lord Rawl, the one, your husband. Colin let out a deep sigh. Again, we know that. Does the flow of time you witch women like to swim around in tell you if he will succeed? It doesn't work that way. I do not choose what I wish to see in the flow of time. Great. So all you can do is tell me what I already know and that you don't know if we will succeed. That's great. Thank you. Now, may we pass? Red's scowl was back. I don't get to pick out the answers I need or would like. I don't get to ask questions and have them answered. The flow of time reveals to me what it will reveal. Nothing more, nothing less. I have no say in it. I am but a messenger. That's because it's prophecy, Colin said. In a way, in this case, it reveals to me only that your husband has the potential to succeed. It does not reveal if he will. Colin threw her arms up. What good, then, is all this flow of time prophecy business if it only tells you potential? I could easily have told you that Richard has the potential to stop all this from happening without you needing to bother to peer into the flow of time. Rather than getting angry at Colin's tone, Red became more calm, even sorrowful. That much of it is muddy, but many other events in the flow of time are crystal clear. I can see those things with absolute certainty. But not in this case, Colin said, contemplating leaving the witch woman and going back to get Richard and the rest of them. 
Since Red knew that Richard was important, Colin figured that she wasn't likely to put up a fight if they simply barged right through the middle of her little lair. No, not in this case. It was Red this time who let out a patient sigh. You see, Mother Confessor, in the unique case of that husband of yours, his free will mucks up events in the flow of time. Colin frowned. Why is that? Because he is a pebble in the pond. He causes ripples in events. Because he acts on free will and he is gifted, it can't be foreseen how those ripples will interact with other people and other events. Prophecy does not work so well with that man of yours. If it's any consolation, we've always had that problem with prophecy, Colin said. That's why we don't pay it much heed. Red leaned closer. Well, in this case, you had better. Why? Because while I may not know if he will succeed, I know that if he is dead, he will not have a chance to try. If he dies, our fate is sealed, and we all die. I'm trying to help you keep him alive so that you can do what he needs to do in order to give us a chance. If you don't listen to me, he is going to die. That is not a potential, but a hard, cold certainty. I know how to read events in the flow of time. I know those things that are only a potential, and I know those that will happen with an absolute certainty. In this particular case, it is not a maybe or a potential. It is a dead certain event. He is going to die before he has a chance to fulfill his potential unless you do what you need to do to prevent it. Only you can prevent his death. Only you can stop it. Now, do you want him to live or not? It's all up to you, Mother Confessor. Chapter 68 Colin stared back into Red's fierce blue eyes. All right, I'm listening. What is it you see in the flow of time that is so certain? Nikki is going to kill Richard. Kill him? Colin blinked in disbelief. Why would she kill Richard? Dear spirits, the woman loves him. That is why she will kill him. Because she loves him. Colin shook her head, as if trying to shake it clear of lunacy. You really ought to meet Shoda, Colin said. You'd like her. You both see events in the flow of time and think you understand their true meaning when you don't. You're both crazy. I'm not crazy. I would wager that this Shoda has given you information that has been vital, as this is. I'm telling you what will happen in the flow of time if that flow is allowed to run its course. I'm trying to make you see what is at stake. I haven't got time for this nonsense. As Colin started to leave, Red grabbed her arm and turned her back. Nikki knows that Richard's heart belongs to you. She loves him, but she cannot have him. The flow of time says that because of that she will kill him. Colin pressed her hands to the sides of her head, exasperated with the pointless, circular conversation, wishing she could shut it out. You said yourself that this flow of time you look into only holds potential, not certainty. Red shook her head emphatically. No, that is not what I said. I said that because he is the pebble in the pond, Richard's free will muddies my ability to see how the events he is central to will unfold. It is only undefined potential in his case. But I see other things with absolute clarity. Colin glared, no longer even able to remain polite. So you say. Red gestured angrily toward Hunter. I sent him because I saw that you would all come this way and would have been killed back there in the chasms had I not acted. It was important that none of you die back there. I could see in that same flow that you would befriend Hunter, as you call him, and follow him when you most needed his help, but only if I sent him to save you. It wasn't potential. It was a certainty. I saw the different tributaries, branches, and backwaters in the flow of time, and I worked to keep you on the course that would save your lives. Here you stand as a result. I would say that shows I understand the meaning of what I see in the flow of time quite well, wouldn't you? Well, it doesn't work that way with Richard. It does with the people around him. It worked that way with you. It wasn't chance or potential. It was only the deliberate choices I made to affect the outcome that kept you all alive. 
Perhaps, as you say, this witch woman, Shoda, only thinks she understands the true meaning of the things she sees in the flow of time. But don't judge me by her inadequacies. I know what I'm talking about, and I know what I'm doing. Red leaned closer and pointed a finger at Colin's face. I'm telling you, Mother Confessor, and you had better listen to me. Nikki is going to kill Richard unless you kill her first. Richard is the only chance we all have. He is the only one with the potential to save the world of life. Even the first confessor, Magda Cirrus, saw that 3,000 years ago and did what she could to help him. Now you are the last confessor. It has come full circle. It is up to you to make sure he has that chance to fulfill his potential. You must kill Niki before she can kill Richard. Colin folded her arms and stared back at the witch woman's piercing blue eyes with a look of her own. If you think she needs killing, then why don't you just kill her yourself? Red straightened. Wise is the witch woman who knows when not to interfere with events in the flow of time. That's an easy excuse. You are already interfering with events in the flow of time. You brought me here, and now you are asking me to do your killing for you. It's the same thing. No, it's not. This is different. This is a matter between you and Richard and Nikki, between the three of you and fate. You three are caught up in that tangled flow of time. I can't interfere. That fate is yours and in your hands alone. The hard reality is that I know for certain that if she is still alive when the time comes, Nikki is going to kill Richard Rawl. I also know for certain that she will do so because she loves him. That is why you must kill her first. In frustration, Colin ran her fingers back through her hair, gripping it in her fists. Red, I'm telling you, I know the woman. I know that she is in love with Richard, but I also know that Nikki wouldn't do that to him. She wouldn't do that to me. To you? The witch woman gave Colin a somber look as she slowly shook her head. I am sorry, Mother Confessor, but I can see in the flow of time that she will. If she is not killed first, she will kill him. Colin couldn't make any sense of it. She could tell that Red was absolutely convinced of it, but Colin couldn't make it make any sense in her own mind. She got the feeling that there was something the witch woman was holding back. When? She finally asked, when do you see Nikki doing such a thing? For a long moment, the woman regarded Colin with a kind of chilling look that could only be summoned by a witch woman. That is a question you really should not ask, Mother Confessor. Please, take my word for it, and do not ask that question. You will not like the answer. Colin's blood ran cold at the look in Red's eyes. I'm in the middle of this. I don't like any of this, but you told me that the context is vital. I need the complete context. So I'm asking, when will Nikki kill Richard? Red was silent for a long time as she stared into Colin's eyes. She finally spoke in a soft but unwavering voice. I can't say when for certain. I can only tell you that it will be after you have already been murdered. Colin blinked, then frowned, not certain that she had heard correctly. What? When Nikki kills Richard, it will be sometime after you have been murdered. After I've been murdered? As in dead? Yes. You have very little time left before that happens. That is why you must kill the sorceress as soon as possible. You cannot afford to delay. It must be done today or tomorrow when you arrive at the Citadel or the following day at the very latest. I don't see you having any more time than that before you are murdered. And who is it that is going to murder me? Please, believe me, if I knew, I would tell you. I have sought that answer, but the flow of time hides it from me. There must be some reason. It is the same with the old wizard. I tried to find out who murdered him so that I could tell you, because his murder and yours are connected, but I wasn't able to pull an answer from that river of time. His murder is connected to... to what will happen to me? How? How are the two connected? Red folded her arms in frustration as she looked away. 
I wish I knew, but I don't. I can only see that there is a connection of some kind. It could be that the same person who murdered Zed will murder you, or it could be some form of interconnected cause and effect. I only know that the two are connected. Red's gaze returned to meet Collins. What I do know is that you must kill Niki now, before you are murdered, or it will be too late and the rest will come to pass. Niki will kill Richard Wall, and with him, the only hope for the world of life. Colin could feel a tear running down her cheek as she stared at the witch woman. The thought of Richard being killed was too much for her. The thought of her being murdered was crushing, terrifying. It was all too overwhelming to take in. There must be a chance that you could be wrong. I am sorry, Mother Confessor, she said softly as she reached up, gently cupped her hand under Colin's chin, and brushed the tear away with a thumb. The truth is... Either way, whether you kill Niki or not, every possible branch in the flow of time shows that you are soon going to be murdered. I have seen you pass through on occasion as I have looked into the river of time. I saw your integrity, your virtue, your commitment to truth. I saw in the choices you made that you were brave, courageous, compassionate, and cared about others. I have admired you. It is a tradition of my kind to paint our lips black in mourning when we see the death of someone we care about. My lips are painted black today for you, Mother Confessor. I understand what this means for you, but you need to put your precious life into the context of what is going to happen to everyone else. This is bigger than you alone. You will never have another life but neither will any of the other innocent people everywhere whose lives will be snuffed out. You need to put all that into perspective. Without Richard, they all die. Without you saving his life by killing Niki, they all die. You have killed before to save the lives of those you care about. This is one of those times. The fate of everyone is in your hands, Mother Confessor. There is still a chance for Richard to live, but there is no chance to change what is going to happen to you. Only you can save the life of the man you love. If you care about him, about how precious his life is to you, if you care about the lives of everyone else, then you must kill Niki. Colin felt as if the world was collapsing in on her. All her hopes and dreams were ashes. All she had wanted was to ask if they could go on through the mountain pass. She remembered what Zed had told her once, that a witch woman never told you what you wanted to know without also telling you something that you did not want to know. Chapter 69 Richard was at a loss. He had been following a good dozen paces behind Colin for over an hour after they had cleared the pass, and there was no improvement in her mood. After they had been summoned by the blindfolded woman who said that the oracle had granted them safe passage, she led them through the pass without ever seeing the oracle. Richard had stopped the blindfolded woman back in the pass and asked to see the oracle. The oracle, the blindfolded woman had told them, had seen one of their party and she would see no more. She also said that the oracle had warned that if they wished to pass, they had to go right then or not at all. Colin had not said a word the entire time about her meeting with the Oracle. In fact, she hadn't spoken to Richard about anything, not one word, since meeting up with them as they came through the pass. She had, however, taken up a lead position ahead of Richard, Niki, Irina, and Samantha in their march, and it was clear that she wished to be alone. Richard wasn't used to that attitude from her, and it alarmed him in the extreme, but it seemed clear enough so he hadn't violated that wish. What made it worse, though, was that she wouldn't even look at him. The entire time, tears had slowly run down her face, despite how deeply her brow furrowed as she tried not to let them escape. Richard didn't know if he had done something wrong, although he couldn't imagine what, but even if he had, he would never have thought that Cullen would not want to speak to him. Even on those occasions when he had done something to upset her, 
She had at least been willing to talk to him about it, to tell him what was upsetting her. Whatever was troubling her this time, he would have thought that she would want to talk to him about it. He was beside himself with worry for her. Although he couldn't entirely shake the worry that he had done something wrong, he assumed that it had to be that the oracle had given Colin a prophecy that upset her. For some reason, that prophecy had gotten to her. Colin knew better than to believe prophecy. But that didn't mean that this oracle couldn't have said something that had been a dagger through her heart, and for some reason Colin was taking it seriously. What do you think? he whispered to Nikki. Should we try to talk to her? Nikki glanced over at him. I think I know enough not to poke a hornet's nest. My advice is to leave her be for now. Whatever it is, she will get over it or tell you when she is good and ready to tell you. Until then, leave her be. Samantha stuck her head between Richard and Nikki. What do you think could be wrong? She whispered. We don't know, Nikki told the young woman. But a wise sorceress, or wizard, knows when to stay away from a person who wants room to think things through. Nikki glanced down at Samantha. It's a lesson you need to learn. Sorry, Samantha whispered as she pulled her head back. She probably just doesn't feel well, Richard told Samantha, wanting to soften the sting of Nikki's words. The poison we both carry in us is as exhausting as it is frightening. It gets me down at times, too. Samantha nodded. I know, Lord Rawl. I've felt it in you both. I know how frightening it is. He remembered how terrified Samantha had been when she had first encountered that touch of death in them. I guess you do. She thought a moment. If there is anything my mother or I can do to help, just ask, all right? Richard smiled briefly over his shoulder. Thanks, Samantha. She nodded as she dropped back to walk with her mother. You're too nice to her, Nikki whispered. Nasty habit of mine, he said, trying to be nice to nice people. I'll have to try to be more like you and hurt their feelings instead. That always seems to work. Nikki smiled a little. Point taken. Maybe you should talk to her he said. Who? Colin. I told you, I know better than to poke at a hornet's nest. Nikki shook her head. You didn't see the look she gave me. What kind of look? Well, if looks could kill. What did you do to her to make her give you a look like that? I didn't do anything, Nikki said, opening her hands in a gesture of bewildered innocence. What did you do? She isn't talking to you either. Richard sighed. I wish I knew. Nikki rested a hand on his shoulder briefly as they walked close together. She'll be all right, Richard. I'm sure she just needs to work out some things the Oracle told her, and she doesn't want us bothering her while she thinks it all through. That makes sense, Richard said. I only wished I believed it. Nikki sighed then. Me too. Richard glanced off through gaps in the trees toward the mountains in the distance. They were growing a deeper shade of steel blue. After the sun dropped behind the towering mountains to the west, darkness descended quickly. The thick clouds would only hasten the approaching darkness. Richard dropped back, waiting for Commander Fister to pick up his pace and catch up with him. Is the Mother Confessor all right? The commander asked. The commander, like all of the men, could tell that something was wrong and was concerned about what it could be. Colin was, in many ways, their strength. Her spirit always seemed to buoy their spirits. Now, all of them wore somber expressions. Richard forced a smile for the man. Colin? Oh, she's fine. It's just that this sickness is really exhausting, both physically and mentally. Oh, he said, brightened by the solution to the puzzle. The sickness was bad enough, but the worry of something more being the issue after speaking with the Oracle had the commander concerned. It had Richard even more concerned. Richard gestured to the silhouette of the mountains to the west. With the sun behind the mountains, it's going to be dark soon. We're going to need to set up camp. Commander Fister nodded. Like the scouts told us, up ahead we'll run into a road leading to Subedra. But that won't be until sometime tomorrow morning. We can't make it that far tonight. The good news, though, Richard said, is that the road will make for easier traveling, and we should be able to reach Savedra tomorrow. 
But for today, we're going to need a place to set up camp before we get caught trying to do it in darkness. Already ahead of you, Lord Brawl. I've had a report of a suitable spot not far up ahead. Good, Richard said. Give the word for some men to go on then, and clear the area. The commander clapped a fist to his heart and trotted off to see to it. As he watched Colin's familiar, beautiful shape and fall of long hair as she walked all alone, Richard's heart ached for her. He wished he knew what was wrong. He wanted more than anything to set it right for her and see her special smile, the one she gave only to him. He hated to see her cry more than just about anything in the world. After Zed's murder, Richard had seen her cry enough to last him a lifetime. The thought of what had happened to Zed again brought a fresh flash of anger mixed with the ache of grief. Richard forced the anger aside. At the moment, it was more important for him to be there for Colin. Chapter 70 Commander Fister spotted Richard and hurried over to speak with him. All clear, Lord Brawl. The men who scouted the area report that there isn't anyone anywhere, not even any evidence of anyone having been in the area. Likely because this place comes directly down from the pass. Nikki said, and you know what kind of trouble the chasms were, to say nothing of getting permission from the Oracle. Not really any reason for anyone to want to head up in that direction either. That makes sense. Richard said, this is a pretty deserted back door into Sabedra. If it wasn't, the people of Straw would be used to seeing travelers, and they aren't. The commander nodded his agreement, and I don't see any half-people being able to follow us the way we came. Richard watched men spread out on the leafy forest floor among the thin growth of young hardwoods, laying out bedrolls and gear, collecting firewood for the dozen small fires. The wood smoke, drifting slowly through the camp, offered a comfortingly familiar aroma to the quiet woods. They could all see everyone in the light of those low campfires and they could see a goodly distance off through the lightly wooded area. The ground wasn't entirely level, with slight rises here and there, but it made for a good campsite. Most of the ground to the right began to rise as it went off to meet hills and mountains in the distance. The men would be able to get a good rest this night for a change. Richard had no idea what kind of defenses or orders Hannes Ark might have given at the Citadel before he left, but they needed to be ready for anything. He didn't think, though, that the home guard at the Citadel would present a credible threat to these battle-hardened men of the first file. They needed to get into the containment field, and none of them were in the mood to put up with any foolishness. Anyone who had any notion of resistance would be wise to change their minds before they lost their heads. Richard wondered why he was feeling so edgy. The Citadel was part of Fajin Province, and Fajin Province was part of the Daharan Empire. Everyone at the Citadel was under his command. Some of the men were already roasting rabbit, deer meat, and fish trapped in a nearby brook. They were all hungry and needed a good meal to keep up their strength. The next day was going to be critically important. He supposed that the same went for him, but he wasn't hungry. The roasting meats all smelled delicious, but Richard was too concerned about Colin to have much of an appetite. Besides that, the poison inside him was making his head pound, which made his stomach queasy. He had to struggle simply to remain conscious. Eating wasn't high on his priorities. Unexpectedly, Colin walked up on them. She pointed to an outcropping of rocks Richard could just see in the distance. Some of the men found a secure private place where you and I can sleep. I laid out our bedrolls. Sounds good to me, Richard said, trying not to act surprised that this was the first time she had spoken to him since going off to see the Oracle. Would you like something to eat first? No, she said, before turning and making her way toward the spot she had pointed out. Richard and Nikki shared a look. I think you had best go keep her warm and make sure she is comfortable, Nikki said. Just be nice and don't try to be like me and hurt her feelings. I hear that doesn't seem to work. Richard smiled at the sorceress. You aren't going to let me forget that, are you? No, she said, returning the smile. Go tell her you love her, Richard. Richard nodded. Thanks, Nikki. I will. He drew a deep breath, both eager to be with Colin and reluctant to find out what was troubling her. Mostly he wanted her to be back to being herself. He supposed that until they were healed, neither of them was going to be back to themselves. Have a good rest, Richard said to the commander and Niki, 
And, Commander, keep the men away from us. I think Colin needs some privacy tonight. The big Daharan officer tapped a fist to his heart. No problem, Lord Rawl. I will see to it. As he turned to go, he saw Irina and Samantha sitting side by side on a blanket eating some sausage. Irina waved. Please tell her that I hope she feels better soon. If she needs any gifted help, I would be only too glad to offer my services. Richard nodded his thanks before starting out across the camp. He walked a crooked course in order to pass by a number of the campfires on his way to check on the men, offer smiles, and wish them a good sleep. Many offered food. Richard thanked them, but declined. When he reached the spot Colin had pointed out, he saw that it was indeed some distance away from the rest of the camp, screened by part of the rock outcropping. Larger sections of granite ledge rose up from the forest floor behind, with trees on the far side. It was a cozy private sanctuary. Colin flipped the blanket back and looked up at him. Her eyes were wet. Richard got the message and lay down on his back beside her, sitting up just a little with his head propped against the rock so that he could look down at Colin. Colin, please tell me what's wrong. That made the tears flow. She fell on him, putting one shoulder under his and her other arm over his chest. She rested her head on his shoulder. Please, Richard, just hold me. He pulled the blanket up over her partway and closed his arms around her, holding her without a word. He listened to a mockingbird in the distance repeating a monotonous call, the buzz and chirping of bugs, and the soft, distant murmur of the men. He also listened to her cry quietly for a while, until he could stand it no more. Cullen, you are going to be the death of me if you don't tell me what's wrong. She didn't answer. She sniffled for a time, trying to get herself under control. I don't know what's wrong with me, she said. My whole life, I've been taught to be strong. I've been taught to wear a confessor face to hide how I feel, but I can't right now. Why? She shrugged against him as she wiped her nose on a handkerchief. What did the oracle say that got you so upset? he asked. She shrugged again. She just made me think about my life. Your life. Our lives together. Well, that's a pleasant enough thing to think about. She didn't answer, so he asked. Isn't it? Richard, after Nikki heals us tomorrow of this hard call of death, if we are healed, can we, I don't know, go away? He frowned in the near darkness as he watched the small campfires in the distance flickering and popping sparks. What do you mean? I mean, ever since I first met you, what have we done? Done? I don't know. We've done a lot of things. For others, we are always fighting to give everyone else a life. When do we get to have our life? I know what you mean. I really do, but it isn't exactly like we had a lot of choice. There have been people trying to cause great harm to the people we care about, and to us. There is always a choice. What do you mean? I mean, there will always be someone trying to cause harm. There will always be those who hate those who prevent them from stealing, rule, treasure, and lives. There will always be a threat. There will always be something. The world has never been without threats from those kind of savages. This time the threat is bigger than us. This is bigger than everything. This is beyond our reach or control. This reaches beyond the world of life and into the underworld. We can't fight that. We can't fight this anymore. And why should we have to? When is it our time? When do we get to live our lives together? Our time will come, Colin, he said softly. She shook her head against his shoulder. No, it won't. Unless we make it our time. Richard, it's time to let go and live what we can of what's left for us, of what's left for everyone. Someday, Richard said. But I can't now. I can't live with myself, live for you, if I don't do this. I understand how you feel, and I know what's in your heart. I feel no different. But this time it's too much. You can't stop this, Richard. True wisdom is accepting your limits, accepting that it's time to admit those limits and let go of what you can't change. It's time for you to quit that fight and live. Live your life with me. Live for me. Richard swallowed at the lump in his throat. Zed had told him the same thing. It hurt his heart to hear Colin pleading for him to give them a life of their own. Zed was right that Richard was not just committing himself to the struggle, he was committing Colin to it as well. He couldn't think of anything to say that didn't sound cruel. 
It's time for us to spend what time we have, while we can, being together. Please, Richard, don't deny me what there is to what life I have left. Don't abandon me to a mission. Our entire time together has been devoted to serving the cause we have never had the chance to enjoy. We have served the cause of life and haven't had any time for us to live it. Let us live it while we can. Please, Richard, it's the only thing I want, the only thing I'm asking of you. Although he didn't know what the oracle had said that had started it, Richard was beginning to comprehend what she was so upset about. As he felt a tear run down his cheek, he thought that maybe he felt the same way. A very wise woman I know, who I happen to love, he said in a broken voice, once told me that we all can only be who we are, no more and no less. Colin reached up and wiped the tear from his jaw. I'm sorry, Richard. I'm sorry to show such weakness. I'm sure I'll feel better tomorrow. You're not weak, he whispered. You are the one I love. And you are anything but weak. You are the strongest person I know. You think too much of me, Richard. I'm weaker than you think. He had to ask. What did the oracle say to you? Colin laid a finger across his lips. Hush. We need to get some rest. The poison is giving me a terrible headache. My head is killing me, too, he admitted. Tomorrow we will get that fixed. Rest now. Tomorrow Nikki will heal us. Tonight I am weak, so please, my love, just hold me and let me be weak for tonight. But tomorrow, after I am healed, I need to be strong. Chapter 71 As Richard and the main force made their way through the gloomy city of Saavedra, a contingent of soldiers fanned out through the streets and alleyways to make sure that there were no threats lurking around a corner somewhere. Richard didn't really think that Hanisar cared about the small, remote city of Saavedra any longer and couldn't see him bothering to have the place locked down. What would be the point? The man had bigger ambitions. He wanted to rule the world, not for Jin province. Jake Fister, in the lead, looked grim and formidable as he strode up the main cobblestone road, presenting the strong, intimidating face of the first file. He understood that strength did not invite trouble, but rather was a deterrent. The chain mail that some of the men wore sparkled in the drizzle. Soldiers flanked Richard and the women, ready to protect them if need be. Although the soldiers kept their weapons sheathed, Richard knew just how fast they could have them out if needed. Those weapons were not meant for show. They were serious tools of their profession, and the men were experts with each of them. Some people stood to the sides and stared, while many others seemed to be rushing everywhere, both along the main cobblestone road through the city and splashing through the mud of the streets and lanes to the sides. The tightly spaced buildings created a warren of passageways, alleys, lanes, and narrow streets. The closeness of everything and everyone made Richard uneasy after being out in the sprawl of the endless, trackless, dark lands. It felt like the whole city was pulled inward, hiding from that wilderness out beyond. Richard and those with him slowed from time to time to let frightened women in drab dresses get out of the way. The people off to the sides tried not to be obvious as they watched the strangers in their midst, but everyone, from Richard to the soldiers, all noticed every eye following them as they moved up the street. Vendors lined up along the sides of the street had laid tarps over their wares, trying to protect them from the weather. Shoppers lifted the tarps, selecting vegetables or meat, trying to look like they didn't notice the troops passing by. People back in shadows watched the passing visitors from doorways and windows of the dingy, tightly packed small buildings. Colin walked at Richard's left, looking like herself again. She had been so exhausted the night before that she had fallen asleep in his arms. Richard had lain awake half the night, unable to close his eyes. She had never before voiced such a wish for him to quit the struggle and leave it to others. In the past, if anything, she had argued against such a notion. Now she wanted him to quit it all. It had been the same thing Zed had advised. He hadn't known how much her heart ached to go off somewhere and live their own lives. 
He remembered feeling much the same after she had lost their unborn child when she had been so seriously hurt. He had quit everything and taken Colin far back in the uncharted wilderness to the west of Heartland. After she recovered, it came to be one of the happiest times of his life, being away from everyone and everything. He wondered if he was crazy for not jumping at Zed's advice and Colin's longings for sanctuary. He wondered if they weren't right, if he shouldn't let the world fend for itself. Maybe if Kara and her husband had cared more for themselves and done that, Ben would be alive, and they would be living happily somewhere. Instead, Kara had lost her chance at such happiness. Richard missed her, and his heart ached for her and for all she had lost. He grieved for Zed as well. Who did he think he was, anyway? Where did he ever get the idea that the world couldn't get along without him? He was a woods guide who had taken up the challenge to stop a tyrant, and because of that, everyone thought he was their savior. He never wanted to be the leader. He had only been doing what was right in protecting himself and people he cared about. In the end, he thought that was the central issue. He didn't want to be a leader. But there were others driven by a desire to dominate and dictate. They lusted to tell everyone else how they must live and what they must think. They were willing to torture and slaughter untold numbers to enforce their arrogant visions. He understood Zed's advice and Colin's feelings. He just didn't see how he could do anything but what he was doing. If he didn't act, he would end up being slaughtered as well. While he hadn't sought leadership, leadership had fallen to him. Up ahead, between the dingy two-storied buildings crowded in close at the street, he got his first glimpse of the stone citadel high up above the city. Samantha, walking not far behind him with her mother, leaned closer. Lord Rawl, I'm so excited that you and the Mother Confessor are finally going to be well, and I can't wait to see the containment chamber and how such a thing is done. Richard looked back and showed her a smile. She had done a lot to get them this far. Without her help, they could have lost their lives any number of times. Besides the people who watched from a corner of their eye, Richard saw others along the roads staring with vacant expressions. None of them looked happy or expectant or excited or even curious about the people accompanied by so many soldiers. Richard leaned toward Niki. What does this place remind you of? Niki glanced over. The cities of the old world. Cities without hope. Where people lived their whole lives under the thumb of the imperial order. Exactly, he said. I had no idea that this part of Dahara was like this. I had no idea that we had a petty tyrant right under our noses all this time. Makes me wonder what other parts of Dahara are like. Parts I've never even heard of. Hannes Ark is no longer so petty, Colin said without looking over. He wants to kill everything good, and he has a good chance to accomplish it. Even here, in the wilds of the Darklands, a nest of evil had taken root until eventually it had begun to spread. Richard was tempted to ask her how. While such a threat existed, he could quit. But he thought better of it. Colin, as the Mother Confessor, had originally come to his home in Heartland, in Westland, to find the old wizard so that he could name a seeker. Unbeknownst to Richard, the old wizard had turned out to be Zed. It didn't matter, though. Richard knew who Zed really was. He was his grandfather, his teacher, his friend. He was also the one who had named Richard the Seeker of Truth and given him the long, hidden sword that went with that duty. Zed had told them that it was his responsibility as first wizard to pick the right person, and Richard was the right person to carry that sword. While at first it hadn't seemed so, Richard now understood that Zed had picked the right man. As he looked into the eyes of the frightened people silently watching, he wondered how he could now turn his back on the responsibility with which Zed had entrusted him. How could he turn his back on those who had made this sword? Or any of those who had left him clues to help him along the way in his struggle to see justice prevail? How could he fool himself into thinking that he could go off somewhere safe and be left alone to live his life while turning his back on a firestorm and pretend it didn't exist? How could he live a lie? The happiest time of his life had been living with Colin back in the wilderness. He had tried turning his back on the world. He had tried to give it up to live his life with Colin. When she had recovered, Colin had become ever more restless and uneasy. 
continually trying to convince him that they needed to return to the world and their place in it. Niki had shown up and captured him. She had taken him away to a long ordeal of captivity. Richard knew that he had only been fooling himself to think that they could quit the world and find a place to hide. To think they could live in peace without someone coming for him. Someone would always come. Whether or not he wanted to admit it, the reality was that too many things were connected to him. His only chance at life was to face reality, not hide from it. You either had to fight evil as you encountered it, or evil would come to control your life. Even these people here, way out in the wilds of the dark lands, could not escape it. Nests of depravity always grew stronger and spread, if not fought. What really bothered him, though, was that Colin was his rock. He was stronger physically than she was, but she was his emotional stability, always steadfast in what was right. There had been times when he had felt too weak to go on. In those times, Colin had always been his strength. He had always gotten to his feet for her. It rattled him to see her strength falter. He knew, though, that she was too strong, too committed to feel this way for long. He supposed it was unreasonable to expect her to be strong every moment. She was only human. As much as he wished he could do what Zed had advised, what she had begged him to do in a moment of human weakness, he knew that in the end she couldn't really live that way. Sooner or later, and likely sooner, she would start to get uneasy and need to return to life's struggle. He was the seeker, but she was the mother confessor. She was born to it, and for better or worse, she couldn't escape it any more than he could escape who he was. In the end, she wore the white dress of office because it belonged on her the same way the sword of truth belonged on his hip. Neither was ceremonial. Both were made for battle. Both were weapons meant to be used to fight for truth. He told himself not to be too discouraged by her weakness the night before. There were times when he had been weak, too. He always picked himself up, and so would Colin. In fact, when they had started out that morning, he had already begun to see her strength coming back. She had looked determined once again. He still wished he knew what the oracle had told her. Look sharp, boys, Commander Fister said in a low voice as they passed some of the Citadel Guard in brown tunics standing to either side of the cobblestone road leading up the hill. The dozen men on each side of the road stood at attention, chins up, fists to hearts. They certainly didn't look like they entertained any thoughts of a fight. But that had been by design. The commander had sent men ahead to announce the arrival of the Lord Rawl and tell the guards to prepare to receive him and his escort. The scouts reported that the men defending the citadel had been surprised, but friendly and eager to welcome the Lord Rawl and his party. Even though he was from far away, Richard wouldn't be entirely a mystery to the people here. There had been a number of men from distant parts of Dahara who had fought in the Long War and they would have returned with stories about the Lord Rawl and the Mother Confessor leading them to victory. Richard tried not to see these men, these people of Saavedra, as a threat, but as people much like any others with the same hopes and dreams. Maybe now that he had come to their part of the world and Hannah's Ark was gone, they would feel more a part of a free Dahara. At the top of the road, up the hill beyond the city proper, they finally reached massive iron gates in a high stone wall, in another good sign, the gates stood open. More men lined the road at the top, standing in neat ranks to either side. Despite every indication, he couldn't help feeling like a bug approaching a spider web. Richard leaned closer to Commander Fister. Don't forget what I told you. Every man's life before any threat gets to Niki. He cast Richard a look. And, of course, you and the Mother Confessor. It would do them no good to get the containment field at the Citadel if a foolish, jumpy soldier put an arrow through Niki's heart. Even the most gifted could be felled with a simple blade or arrow. Without Niki, the containment field wouldn't do them any good. From what he had learned, to stop the threat Emperor Sulichan and Hannes Ark had unleashed on the world, Richard had to end prophecy. He wished he could have ended prophecy before Colin had spoken with the Oracle. Looks peaceful. 
Commander Fister said as he scanned the Citadel Guard. But every man is ready if that changes. The men all knew the importance of being the steel against steel so that Richard could be the magic against magic. Richard just wished that he had some clue as to how he was supposed to end prophecy. Chapter 72 The main force of the Fajin garrison stood at attention in a cobblestone square beyond the main gates. Beyond rows of soldiers in chainmail, their swords sheathed, stood a row of archers in brown tunics, all their bows shouldered beside their quivers. Lancers stood in a neat line to the other side of the square, their lances pointing straight up toward the leaden sky, with the butts resting on the cobbles left wet and slick by the steady, light drizzle. All of the men were arranged in such a way as to funnel Richard and those with him down to a man waiting in the center of the road that led up to the citadel. Richard didn't like being funneled. By his scowl, neither did Commander Fister. Beyond all the guards, terraces with shaggy olive trees lined the road the rest of the way up to the stone citadel at the top of the hill. Although it would be nothing too special in most cities of any size, in a place like Saavedra, the citadel was a magnificent structure that sat like a jewel overlooking the dingy city below. Richard imagined that with Hannes Ark living there, it stood as a symbol of repression, much the way the People's Palace had when Dark and Rawl had ruled. To Richard, a building was just a building, and didn't carry the passions and personality of its occupants. All he cared about with this particular building was the containment field it held down underground. That was Colin's salvation. He could see in her green eyes the weight of the poison within, he felt the same dead weight dragging him down. When Richard flanked by a number of heavily armed men carrying battle axes in addition to knives and swords, some wearing dark, molded leather chest plates and some wearing chain mail over leather tunics, all came to a halt. The man at the center of the square, fist to his heart, bent deeply from his waist. I'm General Wolsey, he said when he straightened. Welcome to the Citadel. Lord Rawl, I presume? That's right, Richard said with a nod. The advance party of your men informed us of your arrival. I can't tell you how honored we are to have you come to our humble city. We are at your disposal. Anything you want, anything at all, you have but to ask. And if it is within our power to provide it, we will. Thank you, General. I will keep that in mind, Richard said. The man glanced around. You all look, well, like you could use a bit of rest. There are rooms, if you would like, and thank you. Richard said, cutting the man off before he was finished trying to ingratiate himself. As you noted, we have been traveling hard, coming over the pass from up north. The pass? The general blinked. No one comes over the pass. It's not... safe. The people there are part of Dahara, as are you. They were polite and gracious and showed us the way through. His mouth opened a little as he stared. That's... remarkable. Richard thought the man seemed a little too tense to be a general, but then again, this was a pretty small place. So a general here wasn't necessarily what Richard would expect elsewhere. This man was probably adequate for the responsibility in the remote city of Saavedra. Besides, people were sometimes more than they appeared to be. Before General Woolsey could begin talking again, Richard started giving instructions. While we are sure that you are prepared to protect the Citadel, there are threats that I'm afraid none of you here are prepared to deal with. He held his hand out to the side. Therefore, Commander Fister here will be in charge. You will be taking orders from him. The man frowned. But I'm a general. He is just a commander. No, Richard said. You are the general of the Citadel Guard in Saavedra. He is a commander of the first file from the People's Palace. The first file? The man quickly looked around again at the men with Richard, all dressed in dark armor. I had no idea, Lord Roll. I've never met any of the first file before. Of course, we will cooperate in every way. Good. That means that any of these men who are my personal guards, in order to do what they must to protect me, have authority over everyone here should it be necessary. You will all follow their instructions. We have no intention on usurping your authority and your protecting the Citadel or the city, and will return command to you once we are rested and can be on our way. It shouldn't be more than a day or two. Of course, Lord Roll. Richard deliberately looked over at the knot of officers standing to the side. 
They got the message and clapped fists to hearts. He then looked at the soldiers standing in ranks, watching, and they did the same. There didn't appear to be any dissent or grumbling. Thank you all for understanding the importance of our safety, Richard said. There are threats about that we need to be ready for. The general lifted a hand. What sort of threats? He cleared his throat. I mean, if I may be so bold as to ask. Richard met the man's gaze. Have you ever seen the dead rise up out of graves and attack the living, ripping them limb from limb? The man's eyes widened. The dead? That's right. Being already dead, they can't be killed in the ordinary sense. My men know how to deal with the threat, so I suggest that you stay out of their way and let them handle any trouble. The man nodded furiously. Of course, Lord Wall. Now, we've been traveling for a long time through some very hostile land. We need to get in out of this wet weather for a bit and get some needed rest. The young General Woolsey held an arm out in invitation. Then please, Lord Rawl, allow me to show you the way. Without further word, Richard and all those with him followed the man up the curving cobblestone road toward the citadel at the top. He looked back over his shoulder from time to time to make sure they weren't getting lost along the way. Richard deliberately hadn't introduced Colin or anyone else. He didn't want them to know exactly who they were. He supposed it was possible he was being overly cautious, but if an assassin had been told to hide and then put an arrow in the Mother Confessor, or Niki, or Irina, Richard didn't want them identified as targets. Since they all knew his reasoning, they stayed quiet and let him do the talking. The general opened one of the big double doors and stood to the side to let Richard and everyone with him pass into the grand greeting hall. Once inside, he gestured to some of the women in uniforms to the side and more across the room. The staff can show you all to your rooms and get you anything you might need. With the bishop gone for an extended time, we have plenty of room for you and you can have free use of the citadel. We have some lovely guest rooms where I'm sure you will be comfortable. Perhaps not as comfortable as you are used to, Lord Rawl, but I trust you will find the accommodations adequate. The more the general talked, the more nervous he was making Richard. He supposed that in this outpost of civilization, the general simply didn't get the chance to meet many important people. Richard saw men and women of the staff lined up at the far end of the room, looking equally nervous, awaiting orders. Thank you, Richard said to the general. We can take care of it from here. Please go back down with your men. Close the gates and see to it that no one comes to visit while we are here. The general glanced around at the towering, dirty, grimy, armored, battle-hardened Daharan soldiers of the first file all bristling with weapons and smelling of sweat, standing in the pristine grand greeting room. Before the general could object, Commander Fister gave the man the kind of look that tended to render most people speechless. The implication was clear. The general clapped his fist to his heart. Of course, Lord Rawl. The general, reluctantly, but with increasing speed, made his way back out the door. One of the men closed it behind him. None of the men of the first file were anything less than intimidating-looking, and the commander more so. Of course, Richard knew many of them on a more personal level, and some of them were actually quite shy, except when they were in a fight. Thank you all, Richard called out to the staff, waiting across the room by the grand stairway, but we have some matters to see to, so you aren't needed just yet. Please go about your duties, and one of my men will summon you when we're ready. The staff a little confused not to be called upon and given orders, made their way through the hallways to the sides. After they had gone, there was one bent, older man who purposefully remained behind. May I help you? Richard asked the man. The man bowed a little. The way his back was hunched, he didn't have far to go to complete a bow. When he straightened up as best he could, Richard thought that he detected a ghost of hostility in the man's drooping eyes. I am Mahler, Lord Rawl. I am the scribe here at the Citadel. I have worked here my whole life. The challenge seeped back into the steady look in his eyes. I knew your father. Richard focused his attention more intently on the man. He now understood the shadow of hostility in the old man's eyes. I'm sorry to hear that. Richard's words had not been what the man had expected to hear, and it confused him. The creases in his forehead deepened as he frowned. Excuse me, Lord Rawl? Richard needed to get to their business and wasn't in the mood to soften it for him. Dark and Rawl, like his father before him, was a tyrant who tortured and murdered people in order to maintain his grasp on power. He was an evil man. Everyone suffered under his rule. He hurt people I cared about. 
The hunched scribe still looked suspicious. So you knew the man then? I'm the one who killed him. For the first time, Mahler's eyes seemed to brighten, and he showed the hint of a smile. I had heard the rumor, Lord Rawl. I did not know if it was true. It seems I may have heard wrong. It was Richard's turn to be confused. What did you hear? That you killed him in order to seize rule for yourself. I was a woods guide and would be happy to be one today. I only fill the role of Lord Rawl to give people the chance to live their own life as they choose. Nothing would make me happier than to be able to go back to my life and do the same. But sometimes, when the choice presents itself, we all have to decide if we will stand up for what's right. If not, evil people will be the ones to dictate how we live our lives. The old scribe tipped his head in a nod of appreciation. Thank you for setting the record straight. What does a scribe at the Citadel do, exactly? Richard asked. I have worked here my whole life, recording prophecy brought in to Bishop Ark. He has an extensive collection. Richard couldn't help himself. Another evil man with the same hate in his heart that Dark and Rawl harbored. The man bowed his nearly bald head covered over with wisps of gray hair. If you say so, Lord Rawl, I am but a humble scribe and such things are above my station in life. No, they aren't. Richard said, holding up an admonishing finger. You are entitled to live your life for your own ends, just as everyone else is. Your former master, Hannes Ark, will likely not be coming back here. He has gone off to bring misery and suffering, like he has inflicted here, to the rest of the world, unless I can stop him. The prophecy you have recorded here might be of help to me in finding a way to stop Hannes Ark from hurting a great many people, the way Dark and Rawl did. Mahler smiled the slightest bit. Richard thought it looked genuine, like a small ray of sunlight coming from within. His voice lowered, I will be here to assist you, Lord Rawl, should you wish my help. Richard nodded. Thank you, Mahler. I would like it very much if you would show me the prophecy you are in charge of maintaining, but maybe later, after we've rested. Of course, Lord Rawl. I will leave you then, until I am needed. Richard watched the old scribe shuffle off toward the grand stairs at the far end of the room, wondering if the prophecy Hannes Ark had used might be of help in finding out exactly what he planned, or even a way to stop him and the dead spirit king. Chapter 73 Once the scribe had disappeared up the stairs, Richard turned back to those waiting with him. We're in luck. They have horses here. Once we're healed and I take a quick look at the prophecies that Hannes Ark used, and if we hurry, we might still be able to beat him and Sulachan back to the Palace of the Prophets. First, though, it's time we finally got rid of Jit's poison. He pulled Irina forward by her arm. Where is the containment field? Show us the way. Irina nodded. Gladly, Richard. At last. This way, she said, pointing to the right, off between columns, holding up a balcony above a dark gallery below it. She looked thrilled to finally be the center of importance, to finally be able to fulfill her role. She hurried on ahead of them, leading the way with a gleeful Samantha right on her heels. Samantha, proud of her mother's part in saving their lives, flashed a wide grin back over her shoulder. Richard couldn't help feeling cheered himself. He acknowledged the smile with a brief one of his own. He couldn't wait for Colin to be healed. He could tell by the dull look in her green eyes that the darkness within was growing ever stronger. He wanted her healed first. He was also pretty sure that after the poison was out of her, Colin would be herself again and realize the need to stop the threat from Hannes Ark and Emperor Sulachan. It aggravated him every time he thought about it, how his blood had been used to bring the spirit of Sulachan back from the dead. Richard needed to set that right. Once well again, Colin would feel the same. In the corridor beyond the gallery, when Irina headed down the first set of stairs she came to, Richard signaled to the men. Several of them took up stations, guarding the stairwell at the top. He didn't know what was below, but while they went to find out, he wanted men watching their backs. The rest of the group, Richard, Colin, Niki, Commander Fister, and all the men with them, funneled down a wide stairwell after Irina and Samantha. Colin's hand found his. She gave it a silent squeeze that he returned. 
At the bottom of the stairs, Niki used her gift to send sparks of flame into lamps hung at intervals along the wall so they could see as they followed a series of utilitarian passageways toward a door at the end. It was a simple oak door but looked heavily built. With a silent signal from Commander Fister, one of the men drew his axe and rushed out in front of everyone else to get to the door first. Is that really necessary? Irina asked, puzzling back at the commander, as they all hurried down the hall toward the door. It is, he said without apology or bothering to tell her why. To the commander, the need seemed not only obvious, but routine and hardly worthy of explanation. Irina shrugged. I guess it can't hurt to be on the safe side. They all slowed and waited as the man with the axe took a lamp from the wall and then slipped behind the door to check the hall beyond. When he returned and gave them the all clear, everyone swiftly followed Irina into the darkness beyond. She stopped not far ahead, where light spheres brightened in her presence. She lifted one of the glass spheres, resting in a row of iron brackets, and handed it to Niki, then gave one to Samantha, and finally she took one for herself. The light spheres were powered by the gift and started glowing brighter with greenish light as each woman took one. Since Richard was cut off from his gift, it wouldn't do him any good to take one. So, like some of the men, he took a cold torch from the assortment standing on end in a woven wicker basket to the side. He held the torch out and let Samantha light it for him. She ignited a flame over her palm and sent fire into the torches of several men, who hurried off down the hall, in turn lighting torches for others. The flames sent yellow-orange light flickering ahead into the darkness. Acrid smoke from the hissing, popping torches rolled along the sooty ceiling. Irina's face looked greenish in the strange light of the sphere she was holding. Down this way, she said before turning and heading for another, smaller stairway. The stairs were roughly cut stone, as were the walls, and not as wide as the previous steps. In pairs, they all followed the stairs down around several landings as they descended to the foundation level of the building. Richard supposed that it made sense for the containment field to be in as secluded and secure a place as possible. At the bottom of the stairs, they held out the light spheres and the torches Richard and several other men carried to peer off into the darkness of the stone corridor. The air was musty and damp, but at least there was no standing water. Down there, Irina said, near the end. I believe it is rarely used anymore, so the place is in a mostly forgotten corner. Leading them onward, she hurried off down the hall, the crunch and pop of crumbled granite littering the floor under their boots, echoing back from the distance as they passed rooms off to the sides. Some of the rooms had no doors, but most did. From what Richard could see when he thrust his hissing torch through a few open doorways, the pitch-black rooms beyond looked to be storage rooms for rarely needed supplies and building materials for making repairs. Roof slates, beams, and planks in a variety of sizes. Everything was covered in a thick layer of dust. The commander used hand signals to send men off in various directions to check the rooms and branching passageways. Richard knew that it would take time to conduct a thorough search of what was turning out to be an extensive maze under the citadel. But at least they could clear the immediate area. The stone hallway, built of granite blocks, looked eerie in the greenish luminescence of the light spheres. It reminded him, in a way, of the veil to the underworld that had infected them. He was relieved that the open passageway to the underworld infecting them would soon be withdrawn and kept by the containment field from escaping out into the world of life. Here, Irina said, gesturing to an iron door to the right side of the hallway. It's through here. She tugged on the door. Through this place in here. One of the soldiers stepped up and pulled the heavy iron door open for her. Irina, not waiting for a soldier to check what was beyond, rushed inside with her light sphere. This is an entryway of some kind leading to the containment field, she said, her voice echoing in the darkness. Her sphere dimmed considerably once inside. Their torches gave off somewhat better light, but even they dimmed. In weak glimmers of light, Richard saw that it was a dusty, dirty room. It was a lot longer than it was wide. The faint rays of light cut through the pitch blackness to reveal abandoned items, a broken loom, some scaffolding, and other worn-out implements, stacked in a careless jumble in one of the far corners. Planks and old tools in the other corner 
were blanketed with old sheets in an effort to keep the dirt off them. A thick layer of brownish-gray dust covered everything in the room, including the sheets. Holding out his torch as he passed through the doorway into the dark room, Richard could feel the power of a shield tingle across his flesh. He held Colin's hand as she followed him in. Commander Fister and the men took up positions outside in the hall, guarding the doorway. Irina's light sphere had dimmed to nearly being dark. Oh, I forgot, Irina said, sounding disgusted with herself. We have to go in through here, and these light spheres don't work at all as we get closer to the containment field itself. They have special light spheres made for this area that they keep in a nearby room. I'll run and get them. I'll only be a minute. She rushed back out the doorway before Nikki had a chance to enter. Samantha, come help me carry them. Samantha instead ducked under her mother's arm and into the room ahead of Nikki, eager to see the place. I want to stay with Lord Rawl, she said, her voice echoing as she peered around in the dim light. She held her light sphere up, trying to see, but it was fading fast. Oh, all right, Irina said. I'll do it myself. I can get some of the men to help me carry them. I'll just be a minute. I know right where they are. I'll help you, one of the men offered, following after her as she rushed back down the hall. Richard noticed that for some reason there were sheets hung on the opposite long wall covering something. This feels too easy, Colin said as she peered around in the dim, flickering light of the torches. Zed's frequent admonishment came to mind. Nothing is ever easy, Richard said. He lifted his sword a few inches to check that it was clear before letting it drop back into its scabbard. Where's the entrance to the containment field? Samantha asked as she looked around. I don't see it. When Nikki stepped into the room, her light sphere went nearly dark. Richard saw a trace of a frown just beginning to grow on the sorceress's face. As soon as she was inside, her frown became more troubled. This isn't a containment field, she said, sounding now more than a little suspicious. This wouldn't be it. Samantha told her, my mother said that it was through this room. I felt the shields, Colin said. Me too, Samantha added. So it has to be through here. There must be a doorway, but it's so dark in here with just one torch, I can't see much. They were shields, Nikki agreed, but I don't recognize them. Being close to the barrier to the Third Kingdom, maybe they used occult powers in building this place, Richard suggested. Nikki shook her head as she looked around. There is something about this room... Maybe the opening into the containment field is behind one of these sheets, Samantha said. Too eager to wait for her mother to bring more light and dying of curiosity, she yanked down on one of the filthy, dusty sheets hanging along the far wall. As the sheet fell away in a choking cloud of dust, Richard saw that the sheets had been hung over four sets of shackles spaced evenly along the wall. Each of the four sets of three metal bands on short chains were pinned into the stone wall. This isn't a containment field, Nikki said in sudden alarm. This is a dungeon. Those are shields to keep the gifted from using their ability. That's why the light spheres don't work in here. She spun Colin and shoved her toward the door. Get out! Everyone out! That was the last thing Richard heard. His whole body went numb. He didn't feel pain, but rather a heavy, thick, tingling sensation spreading through his body to the tips of his fingers and toes. He realized that he was on his knees, but didn't remember falling. He couldn't hear anything. His vision dimmed as he felt intense pressure, as if thumbs were being pressed against his eyeballs. It was the only pain he felt. Everything else was numb. In his fading vision, Richard thought that the room had tilted sideways. He realized then that he was lying on his side, curled up in a ball. Colin, Nikki, and Samantha were all on the ground curled into fetal positions, shaking violently from head to toe. Richard was barely able to discern through shadowy, blurred vision that the dust on the sheet at the end of the room billowed up as it was thrown back. He tried to pull a sword, but he couldn't feel his fingers. Worse, his arms didn't work. Despite his best effort, he couldn't move them. His whole body was going completely numb and unresponsive. He couldn't even tell if he still had a body, or if he was being pulled into the world of the dead. He heard the faintest sound and realized that he was hearing himself screaming. He thought he could just see someone at the end of the room. Then, even the screaming sound ceased to exist as a heavy blackness settled through him. All awareness went dark as he lost consciousness. Chapter 74 When Richard opened his eyes, he couldn't see anything. 
He was in total blackness. His eyes hurt from what felt like intense pressure that had been pushing against them. He felt a rising sense of panic, fearing that he had been blinded. He tried to move, but found that he could only move a little. He was restrained. He looked to his right, but what seemed to be a tall, rough iron collar cut into his flesh under his jaw if he turned his head too far. His vision gradually began to return. Looking to the side as best he could, he was just able to see Colin out of the corner of his eye. Like Richard, she too hung by an iron band around her neck and manacles on her wrists. She appeared unconscious. The chains attached to the collars and the manacles were pinned into the stone wall and so short that they only allowed the captive to slump a little, but not sit. Richard was beside himself with worry at the way Colin hung by the collar and manacles. She looked lifeless. He turned his head the other way, to the left, blinking, trying to clear his vision, and saw that Niki was similarly restrained. Beyond her, Richard could just make out some black hair and knew that Samantha also hung in the iron restraints. Nikki's wrists were bleeding. Despite her powers, she looked entirely helpless. She started to stir then. As she groaned, she put some weight on her legs to take the pressure off the collar and manacles. She coughed and blinked, trying to clear her vision. Richard scanned the room as best he could in the restrictive iron collar. Two torches in brackets on the opposite side of the room hissed as they burned. He didn't see anyone other than the four of them chained to the wall. He checked Colin again and saw that she was still hanging, lifeless. He turned back to Niki. Niki, he called out. His voice sounded gravelly and his throat felt raw. Niki, can you hear me? She nodded, swallowing against the pain in her throat. She blinked and squinted as she turned her head as far as the collar would allow. Richard, are you all right? A flip answer popped to mind, but he was too worried to be flip. I think so. I ache all over. Me too, she said. She looked the other way toward Samantha, then turned back to him. Where is Colin? On the other side of me. She isn't awake yet. Do you have any idea how long we've been out? She asked. Richard shook his head just a little. No, but it would have to be at least a while for someone to get us all chained up in these things. They must have the men, and Irina too, or we wouldn't be stuck here like this. He had a sudden flash of worry that the others had been killed because they weren't as valuable. Another part of him wished that he had been killed as well. He didn't want to have to face whatever was in store for them. He remembered Zed saying that he was tired of living. At that moment, with the enormity of everything weighing down on him, Richard felt the same way. It was only Colin that kept him from giving in to the tempting call of death inside him. It would be so easy to give in and slip into that dark forever. Except that Colin needed him. He tested his wrists, cuffed with iron manacles and connected to a heavy chain, and saw that they hardly had any slack. As he tried to move forward, he was only able to move inches before the iron collar around his neck brought him up short. He could barely move away from the damp stone wall. He could stand, but had no chance to sit or lie down. He recognized the method of restraining prisoners. It was a simple but very effective form of torture. Once the prisoners could no longer stay awake and fell asleep or lapsed into unconsciousness, they slumped, basically hanging in the collar and manacles. The pain of the rough iron bands cutting in flesh kept a person awake but they couldn't remain awake forever, so there were brief periods of sleep or blacking out when they would hang in the iron. The longer it went on, the worse the wounds would get, eventually festering and becoming infected. Gangrene would set in and turn arms black. As the flesh decomposed, it would begin sloughing off and falling away. Death would inevitably follow, but it was a very long and agonizing way to die, all alone and helpless. We need to get out of here, Niki said in an angry voice. I'm with you. How do you suggest we go about it? Niki was silent a moment before she spoke. My gift doesn't work in this room. It's shielded to keep gifted prisoners from using their ability to escape. What about subtractive magic? Cut the iron with subtractive magic. 
Don't you think I tried that? She asked in frustration. Subtractive is still part of the gift. It was probably a lot more common when this dungeon was built. The shields are equally as effective against both sides. Richard sighed in disappointment. I guess that makes sense. He glanced down. I still have my sword, but I can't reach it. Irina is an idiot, Niki growled. She is an inexperienced idiot from an isolated little village in the middle of nowhere, and she mistook a containment cell for a containment field. Are they similar? Richard asked. In some ways, she admitted. They both are designed to contain power. What's going on? It was Samantha's groggy voice as she was beginning to wake up. Where are we? What's going on? We're having an adventure, Richard said. I don't think I like it, she said. I've never been very fond of adventure myself, Richard said. Is my mother all right? Where is she? We don't know about any of the others, Nikki told her. All we know is that the four of us are chained up in here. They must be holding everyone else in other cells. What about the mother confessor? Samantha asked. I can't see her. On the other side of me, Richard told her. He bent his knees, sagging a little, but that was the limit of how much he could move. He was exhausted. He felt like he had been beaten with a club. He hurt everywhere. Lord Rawl, what are we going to do? The young woman sounded desperate and on the verge of panic. I don't know yet, Samantha. Well, who did this to us? Everyone seemed like they were cooperating. I don't know, Samantha. Try to save your strength. He looked over at Colin again. She was still hanging unconscious by the iron bands at the ends of taut chains. Her head hung forward. Her arms spread wide and stretched back a little toward the wall. Blood from where the iron collar cut her neck dripped off her chin. The sight ignited Richard's anger. He tried to talk his anger back down. It could do him no good at the moment, and only wasted what little strength he had left. He needed to save that strength in case he had a chance to use it. He heard Samantha crying softly over on the other side of Niki. He couldn't think of anything to say to comfort her. At that moment, his only hope was that they would be killed quickly, rather than endure a long, agonizing path toward the inevitable end. Chapter 75 Richard's head jerked up. He realized that he must have nodded off briefly. Blood had puddled on the floor in front of him from the iron collar cutting into his neck. The way the rough iron ring dug into the fresh wound stung. He was exhausted from the grueling effort of trekking through trackless wilderness to reach the citadel, from whatever sort of power had been used to render them unconscious, and also from the relentless weight of darkness within trying to pull him into the forever of death. Trying to think clearly, trying to come up with some solution, was also sapping his strength. He could barely form a thought, and what thoughts he could form weren't helping. He looked over and saw that Colin hadn't moved. She still hung unconscious. He remembered Niki telling him that if either of them lost consciousness again from the poison inside them, it would be the last time, and they wouldn't wake again. He didn't know why she was unconscious, but if it was from the sickness she carried, then it was possible she had already slipped away and would never wake again. He couldn't bear the thought of losing her, but he would rather she died that way than from a long ordeal of torture. The thought of her dying made him want to scream. He couldn't endure to contemplate Colin being dead. He couldn't stand the thought of life without her. He would do anything to save her life. Anything. But it didn't seem likely that either of them had any life to look forward to. He had been so confident that they had been close to the resolution to their sickness, that Niki would be able to heal them, and that they would then be able to collect the horses they needed to make it back to the palace in time. Not only that, but he had been positive that once Colin was herself again, she would also recover her strength of spirit and the commitment to what they were fighting for. That dedication to truth and the well-being of good people was so much a part of her, a part of her that he loved. It was her. Now, those hopes had been crushed. It had seemed within their grasp. They had worked so hard to get there, only to discover that there was no containment field. He felt cheated. It seemed so unfair. Richard's head came up when he heard something out beyond the door. Nikki's head rose as well. They shared a look. 
Be strong, Richard. Be strong. You too, he told her. Always. We've both faced worse than this and survived. She actually gave him a smile then. He actually found himself returning it. She was a rare woman. He felt a great sadness then at the thought of Niki dying in this miserable dungeon out in the middle of the Darklands. Samantha, too, was going to have her life snuffed out before she could live it. It didn't seem fair. He knew, though, that there was no such thing as fair in life. Existence had no agenda. Life simply existed. It was up to them to fight for life to be worthwhile and good, if that was what they wanted. If they didn't, evil would flourish unopposed and have its way. And now, that evil was going to win. The door squeaked in protest when it was pulled open. Richard stared in disbelief when Ludwig Dreyer strolled in. The man wore a smirk that widened as his gaze met Richard's. Rather than the black clothes Richard was used to seeing the man wear, he now had on rather royal-looking purple and gold robes that swished around his legs as he walked. Behind him was a moored Sith wearing black leather. Even through his pain, Richard found himself astonished to see the woman. Colin had told him about her, but it was puzzling as to why there were moored Sith other than the ones he knew at the People's Palace. The Mord Sith, after all, were a creation of Richard's more ruthless ancestors. Well, well, Lord Rawl, how nice to see you again. Again, a flip answer sprang to mind, but instead of giving voice to it, Richard didn't say anything. This was all part of Ludwig Dreyer's elaborate scheme, and nothing Richard could do or say was going to change the man's plans. The abbot walked to Samantha first, leaning down a little in order to look up into her face. A sorceress, I see. How lovely. In the past, I have been able to get useful prophecy from the gifted. He tweaked her nose. I believe you might come in handy, little one. Let us go, Samantha said, nearly in tears. We've done nothing to you. That's a matter open to debate. But perhaps another time. It's the middle of the night, and I'm not in the mood for it. The Mord Sith gave Samantha a cold, meaningful look as Ludwig Dreyer moved on to Niki. Another sorceress, I see, he said, but not merely a sorceress, a woman with skills and talents beyond those she was born with. Niki glared at the man, and, like Richard, didn't waste any effort in answering him. Niki had grown up and spent most of her life in the clutches of sadistic men. She knew not to waste her time trying to talk reason to madness. Again, a gifted woman who I believe will be able to provide remarkable prophecy once properly prepared. I am sure her living entrails will reveal great secrets. He looked back over his shoulder. Don't you think? The Mord Sith showed him a cunning smile. I believe you may be correct, Lord Dreyer. Lord Dreyer? Richard said. You have got to be kidding me. Why don't you just skip right to Emperor Dreyer? The man's intense focus turned to Richard. He moved closer. An excellent suggestion, now that you mention it. I like the sound of that. Ah, but first I have work to do before that day comes. What kind of work? Richard asked, before he remembered that he had planned on remaining silent. Well, you see, Hannes Ark has awakened the Spirit King, with the aid of your gifted blood, no less, and that has made things more chaotic, more complicated. I am going to need to use prophecy to help me overcome the obstacle of that remarkable event and such powerful men. He held up a finger as he leaned closer. But, I assure you, I will. You don't have a clue as to what you're up against, Richard said as he glared. Ludwig Dreyer smiled as if it were a joke only he understood. Actually, I do. And what is it you want from us? Richard asked. The man flicked a hand as he walked on to Colin. Many things, all in due time. We will start on that tomorrow. Tonight you can stand there as you wait until after I've had a good night's sleep. I want to be well rested so that I can fully enjoy overseeing what is to come. He lifted Colin's chin. When he withdrew his hand, Colin's head flopped back down. Richard could see it reopen the wound across the front of her throat where the iron collar was cutting into her flesh from the weight of her head. Erica, be a dear and wake her for me, would you please? For the first time, the Mord Sith standing in front of Richard, staring at him the way Mord Sith liked to do to intimidate a helpless victim, 
smiled. He understood all too well the meaning in that smile. She was telling him that she knew that she was really hurting him more than she could ever hurt Colin. Chapter 76 Erica finally looked away from Richard as she turned. With pleasure, Lord Dreyer. The sound of the woman's boots striking the stone floor as she strode over to Colin echoed around the dusty dungeon. Richard remembered that steady, deliberate sound all too well. Mord Sith didn't like to hurry in their work. Without ceremony, Erica gritted her teeth and with a grunt of effort rammed her ajeel into Colin's midsection. Colin's eyes and mouth opened wide as she woke with a shocked gasp of agony. She screamed then, trying to back away, but she was already against the wall. She could do nothing as she hung defenseless. Richard could see not only the pain, but the bewildered shock of it on the face of the woman he loved more than his own life. His growl of effort echoed around the room as he tried with all his might to rip the chains from the wall. The iron cut into his flesh, but the restraints did not budge. The Mord Sith finally withdrew her ajeel. Colin dropped, knees bent, as she hung in the collar and manacles. She gasped, trying to draw in a breath, unable to put weight on her legs. Her desperate, choking gasps were horrifying to hear. Blood mixed with saliva dripped in long strings from her chin. The fact that she wasn't unconscious from the poison inside, but rather from whatever occult powers Ludwig Dreyer had used, was in a small way reassuring. But on the other hand, the poison had apparently weakened Colin more than him. When she finally regained control, caught her breath, and managed to put some weight on her feet to take the pressure off the collar and manacles, Colin lifted her head to glare at the Mord Sith. Erica. Mistress Erica, the Mord Sith said with a smile. You need to learn to address me properly. When Colin didn't answer, Erica again rammed her ajeel into Colin's midsection. Colin shook as she cried out in agony. She slumped when Erica withdrew the weapon and hung for a time, gasping for air, her whole body trembling. It was longer the second time before she began to recover from the pain enough to draw breath. Richard would have traded his life at that moment to be able to kill the Mord Sith. Ludwig Dreyer lifted a hand to stay Erica from using her ajeel a third time. Well, Mother Confessor, he said, stepping closer, it looks like we have you back with us again. Colin spit out blood to the side and then glared at the man. You do know, don't you, Abbot, that I'm going to kill you? Well, I do know that wizards keep their promises, but I don't believe that the same certitude applies to the promises of confessors. In this case, it does. Colin said with venom, you are already dead. You just don't know it yet. Yes, yes, threat given, fine. Consider me suitably terrified if it makes you happy, but it's late, and as enjoyable as this is, I don't feel like any more chit-chat tonight. Ludwig lifted her chin to make her look into his eyes. Richard hoped that Colin had enough sense not to spit in his face. He knew that when she was angry, she would do just about anything, and she was angry. Thankfully, she only glared. You and I have unfinished business, he told her, as he smiled in a way that sent a chill through Richard. You see, I firmly believe that a confessor will be able to bring forth remarkable prophecy. Prophecy more important than even sorceresses. Prophecy unlike any other living person would be able to give. I have never before had such an opportunity, but at last I do. And I intend to exploit it to the fullest possible extent. I have practiced my special craft for many years for just such an occasion as you will provide. Special craft? That's a pathetic excuse for torture. The simple truth is you get sick pleasure out of crippling and maiming people. Deep down inside, you know that everyone thinks of you as nothing more than a sadistic pervert. So you try to justify it, give it a cause that you pretend is noble. But you are fooling no one. Everyone knows the truth. He lifted a hand, gesturing dismissively. I admit it's true that I do find a unique satisfaction in taking people to that place where the pain is so intense that they can actually look over to the other side as they beg for release. It is then, through my special ability, that they are able to pull prophecy from the eternity of the underworld. Yes, I enjoy my calling, 
But who doesn't enjoy being able to do well what they were born to do? Don't you enjoy using your power as it was intended, Mother Confessor? Of course you do. I can see in your eyes how much you long to use it right now. How sad for you that you can't call upon it any longer. So yes, I enjoy using my special abilities. I do love to watch less important people as they are on the cusp, quivering and trembling as the tears flow. You see, pain opens recognition, and agony begets redemption through prophecy. Over the years, I have learned that gifted people give the most noteworthy prophecy. I believe, however, that a confessor may very well give the most remarkable prophecy yet, truly unique and useful prophecy. After I've finished with the sorceresses, of course, I want you to marinate in terror for a while first. He patted the side of her face, the way a doting master might pat the head of a dog. I do admit, I am going to enjoy immensely seeing the look on your husband's face as I pull your intestines out and wind them on a stick while you scream and cry and shudder and shake. So you see, no excuse is needed. I simply do so much enjoy my work. Maybe your disagreeable attitude will improve then, when only I can help you. Maybe then, when only I can offer you your final release, you will be more respectful of those who are smarter and better than you. Colin glared openly. You are a pathetic freak of nature. Richard knew by the look in her eyes that if she had suffered a moment of weakness and wanted to leave the world to fend for itself, that moment was past. In that moment, he saw that there was no way she was going to quit. She wanted nothing more than to fight. Richard saw a look of raw hatred in Dreyer's eyes, a hatred fueled by rage at anything good and wholesome, a hatred that wanted only to destroy for the sake of destroying. If you only knew what I have in store for you. Enjoy the deluded dream, Colin said with calm authority only the mother confessor could invoke, because I am going to kill you. Ludwig Dreyer straightened with an angry glare. Would you like me to begin on her now? Erica asked. He considered, but finally waved a hand. No, it's been a long day, making plans and standing behind that sheet while we waited for them to arrive. He turned to smile on Richard. You see, Lord Rawl, the value of prophecy? I value and respect prophecy. Knowing prophecy... Understanding it, knowing how to use it, put you there, in chains, and me about to retire to a nice, comfortable bed with agreeable company to bring me pleasures and delights. He turned back from the doorway. Enjoy your night, all. Tomorrow we begin. Come along, Erica. Oh, and take the torches. They have no need of light. Let them be in the dark. After all, they have been the whole time up until now. The moored Sith pulled both torches out of the brackets and took them, giving Richard and Colin one last icy look. The door slammed shut, leaving the four of them suddenly alone in the pitch-black cell. He heard the key turn in the rusty lock. The bolt finally clanged into place. Colin, he whispered, no matter what is to come, just remember that I love you. He can't ever take that away. That, Richard thought, was why the man hated them so passionately. People like him hated that others could value such simple happiness in life. That was what they wanted most to destroy. I know, Richard. I love you, too. Don't worry, Nikki said. We're going to get out of here. What makes you think so? Richard asked. We have to, she said with simple conviction. The mother confessor has vowed to kill him, and I believe her. That's the toasted toad's truth, Colin said in the darkness. Despite everything, Richard smiled. Chapter 77 Several hours after Ludwig Dreyer and Erica had left, Richard heard people out in the hall talking in low, muffled voices. He lifted his head and looked off across the room, even though in the pitch black he couldn't see anything at all. The blackness was oppressive, making him feel blind, making him feel that he was sinking into the darkness within him. Do you hear that? Colin whispered. I hear it, 
Samantha whispered back. It's someone talking. It sounds like a woman's voice, Richard said, as he tried to make out the words but couldn't. Probably that Mord Sith, Erica, Nikki said, come to give us a goodnight kiss with her, a Jeel. Richard didn't know how long they had been unconscious while being hung up in the chains pinned to the stone wall, but he was pretty sure it was still a long way from morning, so he didn't think that it was Ludwig Dreyer returning this soon. But knowing Mord Sith the way he did, it wouldn't surprise Richard one bit if Nikki was right. He heard a key turning the rusty lock until the bolt clanged back. The sound echoed around in the darkness, dying out after a long moment. The iron door squealed in protest as it was finally pulled open, the sound echoing in the stone dungeon. Richard squinted in the bright shafts of flickering torchlight suddenly thrown into the room through the open door. After being in total darkness for so long, the light seemed impossibly bright. After a moment, his eyes began to adjust. Still squinting, he saw three figures enter. They brought two torches. He was surprised to see that it was three moored Sith, all in black leather. A fourth person remained back in the darkness of the stone corridor just outside the doorway. The moored Sith placed the pair of torches in the iron wall brackets. Three moored Sith were more than enough to handle four helpless prisoners. Richard couldn't stand the thought of Samantha or Nikki being hurt by those women, but the thought of Colin being hurt by them caused his anger to ignite yet again. Being in the shackles, he couldn't reach his sword, but it was still on his hip. They had probably left it there because it helped remind him of how helpless he was. People like Dreyer liked to make people feel helpless. If ever there was an argument as to why he couldn't quit the struggle, this was it. Innocent people helpless against brutality. The sword was a reminder that while others were often helpless, he had the ability to act on their behalf. Except right at that moment he couldn't reach his sword to help himself, much less anyone else. But having the sword on his hip did keep the anger close. Every time his anger flared, the sword's anger rose expectantly. He could feel it seething to be let loose. The tallest of the three women stepped confidently to him. Like the others, she was blonde, muscular, and wore the traditional long, single braid that all moored Sith wore. He found the black leather, though, to be less impressive than the red. The red had a purpose that, because of its practical aspect actually made Mord Sith look all the more intimidating. It was meant to mask the presence of large quantities of blood, so the red leather thereby emphasized the unsettling purpose of Mord Sith. The black was a crude and graceless attempt by the man who made them wear it to create something more menacing. Richard suspected that Ludwig Dreyer thought he could make death more frightening than the Keeper himself. Rather than the other two going to the women chained to the wall, they stayed close behind the one looking into Richard's eyes. I am Cassia, she finally said. She briefly lifted a hand back to the other two. This is Lauren and Vale. Richard thought that maybe he could focus their cruel attention on him and make them forget the others. Out for an evening stroll, are we? he asked. Cassia smiled crookedly with one side of her mouth. I had heard that you had a sense of humor. Strange quality for a man in your position. Richard braced himself for her agile, but it didn't come. She shook her head instead. No, we have come to ask you some questions. Although Richard heard no hostility in her voice, he groaned inwardly. He knew all too well what it meant for a moored Sith to ask questions. What he found a bit odd was her informal tone. It wasn't the icy voice moored Sith typically used when they meant to torture answers out of a person. What is it you want to know? We have heard rumors about you. We want to know if they are true. If you lie to us, well, I think you know what will happen if you lie to us. Yes, Denna taught me. That gave all three pause. The two behind Cassia shared a look. Richard wondered how they knew Denna yet came to be here. You knew Denna? Cassia asked. Is that the truth? Yes. Dark and Rawl had her capture me. She had me for a long time, and in that time, she taught me a lot of things. Cassia nodded with an intent expression. I knew Denna. I knew her well at one time. Her brow twitched with a puzzled look. If Denna had you, and was training you, then how is it that you got away from her? Dark and Rawl would have sent Denna for only one reason. People did not get away from Denna. 
Richard didn't shy away from Cassia's steady, blue-eyed gaze. I did. Now, what is it you want to know? Answer the question I asked first, and this will be a lot easier for all of us. Richard's whole body ached from being restrained and unable to sit or lie down. His legs hurt, his back hurt, and his head pounded. He didn't know what kind of occult powers Ludwig Dreyer had used to subdue them, but the aftermath was painful. I killed her, Richard said as he looked Cassie in the eye. That's how I got away. I killed her. I don't wish to talk about it. Despite what she did to me, she was only doing what she did because she had been broken. Cassia nodded, seeming to understand. Richard didn't quite know what to think of that. This woman was not reacting the way a Mord Sith typically acted when she was intent on getting answers, or when she had been sent to torture a victim. He decided to be a little less hostile in his answers. What is it you came to ask, Cassia? He deliberately did not address her as mistress. Cassia, looking down in thought, finally lifted her head. I have heard a rumor that you presided over the marriage of a moored Sith. Out of the corner of his eye, Richard shared a look with Colin. The two behind Cassia were intently focused on him. Yes, that's right. Kara. Kara? Kara married? Cassia looked astonished and incredulous all at once. Kara is as resolute and formidable as they come. Kara was our protector, but she came to be more than simply a protector to the Lord Rawl. She had become a close friend to the Mother Confessor and me. Cassia looked over at Colin. Is that true? Yes, Colin said without hesitation. Kara was as hard as nails, but she also had a good heart. We loved her. The three seemed mystified by that, as if they didn't know what to think. Then where is she now? The one named Vale asked from behind. If she is your protector and your friend, then why isn't she here protecting you? Did she die in her service to you? No, Richard said with a deep sigh. It's a long story. Make it short, Cassia said. We don't have a lot of time. Richard looked at the intent expressions of the two behind before looking back at Cassia. He wondered what she meant about not having a lot of time, but went ahead and answered anyway. Colin and I were captured by Jit, a hedge maid. Jit infected us with a kind of deadly poison. Kara and others came to help us. In the meantime, the barrier to the Third Kingdom failed. Anasar called the long-dead Emperor Sulachan back from the world of the dead, in part by using my blood. The half-people, people without souls, captured Kara, her husband, and all of our other friends. Khan and I were unconscious, so Kara hid us before the attack. Because of that, the half-people didn't take us with the others. We later went in there and got them out. As we were escaping, Kara's husband was killed. I see, Cassia said. So what happened to Kara? Why isn't she still with you? As the painful memory came flooding back, Richard had to pause. It was a long moment before he answered. Kara asked to be released from her service to me. The room was silent, but for the hissing torches, as the moored Sith tried to take in an act that he knew must be incomprehensible to them. What is it you really want to know? Richard finally asked. You are called Lord Rawl. Dark and Rawl was the Lord Rawl. Dark and Rawl was our master. Cassia lifted her chin while looking him in the eye. Did you kill him? That was the question he had been afraid they were going to ask. Nonetheless, he answered it with straightforward, plain honesty. Yes. Chapter 78 Cassia, Lauren, and Vale stared at him for a long, silent, uncomfortable moment. Richard decided that maybe he should elaborate on his reasons so that they would not mistakenly think it was by chance or accident. He wanted them to know the truth. Darkin Raw was an evil man who caused untold suffering and death. I sent him to the underworld so that he couldn't harm anyone else, and I would do it all over again. So then, how is it that you became the Lord Rawl? He raped my mother. That makes me his offspring. I inherited the gift from him. At the time, I wasn't interested in being the Lord Rawl or even willing to accept the fact that I had the gift. But I came to see that I could use my ability and the bond between the Lord Rawl and the people of Dahara to fight for something worthwhile. Freedom. 
freedom to live our lives without the boot of tyranny on all of our necks. Freedom to live in a just world. Many wanted a chance for that and helped in the struggle. Kara was but one of them. She and the other Mord Sith who have joined in that struggle are not weak for wanting freedom. They are stronger for it. I have held Mord Sith in my arms as they died for our shared cause. I have worn the Ajeel of Mord Sith who have given their lives fighting for our beliefs. Those people, like those Mord Sith who want the same things in life that I want, are the reason I fight. I fight on behalf of all of them. There have been times when I have been weary and wanted to give up that struggle and leave the fighting to others. He glanced briefly at Colin, but the Mother Confessor, who is the one who came to ask for my help in the first place, is my strength. And it is for her, and all those like her, that I fight. I will fight for what is right to the very end. I will fight with my dying breath, if need be. That, Cassia, Lauren, Vale, is why I killed Dark and Roll. He needed killing, and I was the only one who could do it. That is why I am, and must be, the Lord Roll. Colin gave Richard her special smile. He was heartened to see it, even if it ended up being for the last time. Cassia abruptly turned to Niki. I've heard that you were once a sister of the dark, but no longer. Why not? Niki was straightforward and simple in her answer. Richard showed me a better way. He is a good man. Colin is a good woman. I wanted to live life the way they showed me I could, if I chose to. Cassia nodded in thought. She looked down as she rolled her ajeel in her fingers for a time, carefully considering her next words. Richard knew the agonizing pain caused by holding that weapon. Mord Sith were taught to endure and ignore pain. In the madness these women had been cast into, pain was a refuge. The pain of the ajeel helps you to think, he said. It's familiar, ever-present, comforting. She looked up in wonder. I guess Denna really did teach you many things. She taught me that people who had been ripped from everything good they knew in life and were made to suffer for no reason but to turn them into monsters who could be used to serve the cause of evil could still find their way back. Not all of them, she said with quiet remorse. No, not all of them. Some have been severed from their souls and can never come back to humanity. But some still can. Cassia let her ajeel drop to dangle on the fine gold chain on her right wrist, as if suddenly not wanting to be reminded of the pain. We served under Dark and Roll. She gestured back at the other two. The three of us. He was everything you say. I would venture to say that we know that better than you ever could. Richard nodded. I understand. I know some of what was done to you by that man, but I'm sure I could never know it all. The truth of his words ghosted across her face. We finally found a way to leave him, Cassia said. Bishop Ark offered us refuge by using his powers to take up our bond. We thought it would be better. We found life with Hannes Ark to be little different, except that his schemes for evil were even more grandiose than Dark and Rawls had been. Once bonded to him, we only then learned that one of our own, Alice, had tricked us, betrayed her sisters of the Aegeal. The dark look settled into her features. She had delivered us to him in exchange for favors for herself. Then, just days ago, Lord Dreyer arrived and enslaved us in service to him by using his occult powers to link our bond to him instead, as if we were property he could walk in and seize. In many ways, personal ways, he has proven to be more than a match for the savagery of Dark and Rawl or Bishop Ark. Those two used torture as a means to an end. Lord Dreyer, though, gets pleasure from the things he does to people. Sick pleasure. There were four of us he put into bondage to him when he arrived here. Like Dark and Roll, he took us to his bed as a form of domination, to show us our place as his property, to let us know that he can use us as he wishes, however he wishes. One night he took Janelle to his bed. He was fascinated, captivated by her beauty. In the morning, he decided that because she was Mord Sith, 
and he found her so achingly beautiful, she would be the perfect one to use in his effort to obtain prophecy from the other side of the veil. He tortured her? Richard asked. One of his own, Mord Sith? Cassian nodded. He and Erica commanded the three of us to watch it being done. To show us, he said, the tremendous value and importance of the work he does. There was no value in what he did to Janelle. There was no point to it other than his desire to watch her naked body break. He got no prophecy in exchange for her life. He shrugged it off as a worthy attempt. When she fell silent, Richard said, Believe me, Cassia, I share your revulsion at all three of the men who enslaved you. That's why I fight against them and those who help them. She nodded, looking down, rolling the red leather weapon in her fingers again as she considered. She spoke as she watched her Ajeel turn first one way and then the other. Our lives have been in service to brutes, each worse than the last. We have never had any say in it. It was always framed as a choice, but it was never really any choice at all. We have been the chattel of evil men, property, weapons they used for their ends, weapons they used to intimidate and harm others. Some moored Sith came to embrace that role, some did not. The other two silently watched Cassius speaking for them. Richard didn't say anything, giving her the space to find her own words. What we have come to ask, she finally said in a quiet voice, is if you will take us back, if we can serve as your Mord Sith, if you will be our Lord Rawl. Richard shared a look with Colin. Cassia still hadn't looked up into his eyes. Richard spoke softly. I can't do that to you, Cassia. Finally, she looked up, a tear rolling down her cheek. May I know why not? Richard nodded, as best he could in the iron collar. Cassia, I'm dying. We came here because we thought there was a containment field here where Niki could heal us. But there isn't. With this sickness inside me and Colin, our abilities are cut off from us. If I were to take you up on your offer, I would only put your lives in mortal danger because I can't power the bond. And without that bond, your Aegeal wouldn't work. Worse... It's now only a matter of days at most until this poison kills me and Colin. Then you would be defenseless against the man who would want to extract revenge. The ancient bond the people of Dahara have with the Lord Rawl is meant to be balanced. It does not mean you are merely in service to the Lord Rawl. It means he is also in service to you. You are his protector, but he in turn is yours. The people are the steel against steel, so that he can be the magic against magic. I'm dying. I can't do my part to protect you. I admire your choice. I sincerely do, but I can't fulfill my duty not only as your leader, but to be the magic against magic for you. So you see, I can't accept your offer of service because it would be a fatal disservice to you. Cassius smiled then. It was a beautiful, warm, wonderful, sad smile. Another tear ran down her cheek. That, Lord Rawl, was the right answer. With that, all three moored Sith went to their knees and bowed forward, putting their foreheads to the ground. Together, with one voice, they recited the devotion, the bond they had learned as young women, as did all Daharans. Master Rawl, guide us, they said with reverence. Master Rawl, teach us. Master Rawl, protect us. In your light, we thrive. In your mercy, we are sheltered. In your wisdom, we are humbled. We live only to serve. Our lives are yours. When they finished, our lives are yours echoed around the dungeon, dying out slowly. When that echo had whispered away, they remained where they were, foreheads to the floor, and then together recited it a second time. And when the echo had died out, they recited it a third time, as was the tradition. Finally, when they had finished, they returned to their feet, sharing a last look among themselves. Lauren and Vale gave Cassia a nod for her to speak for them. Lord Rawl, Cassia said for them all, 
We would rather our lives end today in service to you as our Lord Roll than to live another hundred years in service to monsters, as slaves to tyrants, as instruments of evil. To live only one day as we wish, as we choose, for our own purpose, for something good, is better than to live an entire life as slaves to hate. Please, Lord Roll, we beg of you, accept our service, our bond to you. Be our Lord Roll, even if it is only for your last day of life. It would honor us to uphold our side of the bond, even though you are unable to fulfill your part of it. To have your bond to us in your heart alone, even if you can do nothing to uphold it, is enough for us. It is everything to us. The three women pressed their right fists to their hearts and bowed their heads, awaiting his decision. Richard swallowed back the lump in his throat. This was why he couldn't quit. This was what he was fighting for. For those who needed hope, who needed to live for something good, who hungered for ideals in life instead of living in savagery and hate. I accept, he said, fearing to test his voice more than that. All three women broke into wide grins. The smiles sparkled in their wet eyes. The one in back, Vale, immediately ran to the door and ushered the shadowed figure into the room. As he shuffled in, Richard recognized that it was Mahler, the old scribe. Lord Rawl, the man said, I feel the same. I have worked here my entire life. I have known Hannes Ark since he was but a boy. I have watched as he grew into a man driven by bitterness and envy. Now, Ludwig Dreyer has taken his place, and he is no different. Like these women, I no longer wish to stand by and watch their kind destroy everything good in order to impose their will on everyone. I have known these four, now three, Lord Sith, since they have been in servitude here at the Citadel. We have all been enslaved by tyrants. I told them what I knew of you, what I have learned. I told them that I decided to help you, and I asked them to join me. I too, Lord Rawl, am in your service. Without further word, he shuffled forward with a big ring of keys, the right one already selected. He undid the lock on the collar first, then the manacles. When he was free, Richard collapsed to his knees, unable to stand. As Cassia and Vale helped lift him to his feet, Mahler immediately went to Colin to unlock her restraints. Richard was there for Colin when she was finally free. She fell into his arms and hugged him with all her strength. Thank you for not giving up on any of us, she whispered in his ear. Never, he said. Chapter 79 do any of you know where the others are? Richard asked the three moored Sith and the scribe, Mahler. All the soldiers of the first file. There were a lot of men. And my mother, Samantha added. They are all down in the dungeons, Mahler said. The dungeons? Richard asked. Dreyer used his occult ability to render everyone unconscious, like he did to you, Lauren said. There are only shackles for four people in here. So the Citadel Guard brought you four in here and carried all the others down to the lower cells in the other dungeons. Richard looked around at the stone room. It was shielded and secure. But I thought this was the dungeon. Cassia shook her head. This is only the upper dungeon area of the Citadel, and by far the smallest. The Citadel has an extensive dungeon complex, three full floors below us, with dozens and dozens of individual rooms. Some cells are only large enough to hold one person, but most are a great deal larger than this one. They could easily house hundreds of prisoners at a time down there. Richard frowned at the three moored Sith. Why would they hold so many people? Cassia pulled a finger across her throat. To await execution. Vale nodded. There is an execution room on each floor below. Trains are cut into the stone for all the blood running from the blocks where the beheadings were done. Each execution room has a number of stations with well-worn blocks. Cassia gestured downward. The way it looks, they probably only used the cells to house people temporarily until they could be executed. From what I've seen of those rooms down below, it doesn't look like the dungeons and execution rooms have been in use for ages. But there is plenty of evidence that they were once in heavy use. The bodies were thrown in pits below the dungeons. One pit contains only skulls. The bones in others are a jumble. The bodies likely thrown in and left to rot. I have no idea how deep the layers of bones might be. 
We have to get my mother out of there, Samantha insisted, sounding on the verge of panic. We have to get her out now. Richard put a hand on her shoulder as he thought it through. We will, Samantha. We will. She would get me out, she insisted. Richard looked back up at the Mord Sith and the scribe. I don't understand. Why are there so many prison cells here? Do any of you know? I mean, this is a pretty small city for so many dungeon cells, to say nothing of all the executions. From old accounts I've seen, Mahler said, the Citadel has long been a prison for the Dark Lands, a place to confine the most dangerous people, such as those with occult powers, until they could be executed. It was suddenly making sense to Richard. The barrier to the Third Kingdom was in this general area of the Dark Lands, he said, the people back in the time of the First Confessor. The time of the Great War knew that the seals of the barrier would begin to fail one day and that occult powers confined there would begin to seep out. They left people in Stroiza to watch for the barrier to fail completely. But more than that, they built the Citadel to collect and confine anyone with dangerous occult powers that from time to time had leaked out from beyond the barrier. People like Jit. Unfortunately, those powers apparently also settled into Hannes Ark and Ludwig Dreyer, Colin said. Nikki gestured in frustration. Great. So a man with those occult abilities came to be the very one running the prison meant to confine him. More likely to execute him, Colin said. Richard looked back at the shackles pinned to the wall. He was beginning to get an idea. He just needed time to think it through. But there was no time. He needed to act before it was too late. I know that look, Colin said. What are you thinking? Get everyone out from below and do a lightning quick attack? Richard's mind was filled with the flow and form of the dance with death. The way of a war wizard. He was lost in that dance he had come to know so well. The threat we face is not one that will be helped with soldiers. For the moment, we need to leave them down there, out of the way. We need everyone in the Citadel to think we are all still locked up and under control. Samantha's hands fisted. My mother's gifted. We need to get her out. She can help. Samantha, calm down. I know how much you want to get her out, but I know what I'm talking about. We will get her out, I promise. But we first have to make it safe to do so. You need to trust me in this. You wouldn't want to get her out only to have her killed because we failed to recognize the full extent of what we face, would you? Well, no, I guess not, but... But nothing. Dreyer possesses occult abilities. He has already proven that he can cut any gifted person down in a heartbeat. He put all of us and the men down before any of us knew what hit us. Your mother has no chance against him. None of us do. A devious smile spread on Nikki's face. I have some ideas. Richard was sure she did. Nikki was experienced at this sort of thing, and using her head rather than brawn. She also knew better than to try to use what they knew wouldn't work. We need to act with surprise, swiftness, and violence, Richard told all of them, Capturing Dreyer is the priority. Colin's expression suddenly took an angry set. Capture him? Richard, we can't risk capturing him. And what would be the point? The best thing to do is what you said. Surprise, swiftness, and violence. We need to kill the bastard before he has a chance to strike back. With his abilities, he could kill us all. We wouldn't stand a chance of stopping him. We need to kill him, not capture him. Now we have the chance to surprise him and end the threat. The threat from Dreyer, Richard said. But what about the rest of it? What about it? Colin lifted her hands and let them flop down into her sides. What can we do, Richard? We're going to be dead from Jit's poison before we have a chance to do anything else. We can at least kill Ludwig Dreyer before we die. To be able to do anything else, we would have to be cured. Exactly. Richard smiled as he drew his sword. The ring of steel echoed around the stone dungeon. Everyone looked puzzled as he turned. With a mighty swing, he struck the chain holding the collar that had been around his neck. As it cleaved the chain away at the wall, the blade sent hot fragments of steel flying through the room, some skittering along the floor, some rebounding off walls. When the collar clattered to the floor, Richard picked it up by its short length of chain and held it up before the others. This is a collar meant to contain the powers of the gifted. Dreyer has occult powers, Colin pointed out. Those are even more powerful than his gifted abilities. A grin spread on Nikki's face. But this place was made specifically to confine those with occult powers, not merely the gifted. Right, Richard said. With this, we can capture Ludwig Dreyer and keep him from using his power against us. 
Colin folded her arms, interested but not yet convinced. Why? It would be easier to kill him. What's the point of going to the trouble of capturing him? What kind of poison do we have in us? He asked her. Colin shrugged. The call of death from Jit. Which is? Richard prompted. Her eyes widened with understanding, caused by an occult power. That's right. Jit had occult powers. That's what is infecting us. Nikki was smiling, and Ludwig Dreyer has occult powers. So if we can capture him alive and hold him in that collar, maybe we can find out if there is a way to cure you two of that occult poison without a containment field. It's our only chance, Richard said. We have to try. Even if you somehow get him in the collar, Colin said, how are you going to get him to cooperate? Cassia leaned in as she smiled in the chilling way that only Mord Sith could smile. You leave that part to us, Mother Confessor. We are Lord Rawls Mord Sith now. We will get Dreyer to cooperate. With this sickness in me, my bond doesn't work to power your Ajeel, Richard reminded them. No, she agreed, the smile still in place. But Dreyer said that his occult abilities power our Ajeel now, and the bond that powers them can't be broken as long as he's alive. So, Vale said, we can use his own ability against him. We're going to do whatever it takes to protect Lord Rawl's life. Lauren added, that is what Mord Sith do. We will get him to talk. If there is a cure, he will tell us what he knows. Colin looked at the determination in their eyes. Just leave him alive when you're done, so I can kill him. You've got it, Mother Confessor, Lauren said. He's yours to kill, Cassia agreed. But until then... He is ours, Vale said, with a gleam of menace in her eyes. Do any of you know where he sleeps? Richard asked the three moored Sith. They all shared a look. Oh, yes, we know, Cassia said. It's up on the third floor. Lead the way, Richard told her. I'll explain the plan on the way. Gladly. Is there a back way up to his bedroom? He asked. Yes, Cassia said. Some of the doors are kept locked, though. Mahler held up the big ring of keys he carried. Not a problem. He has soldiers guarding his bedroom, Lauren said. Tonight he has Erica entertaining him, rather than one of us. He was eager to get to bed, so I doubt he will be asleep. That means he will be distracted, Richard said. But this is still going to require stealth. All of you will need to do exactly as I say. Along the way, I'm going to need some of you to stay behind to guard our backs. I don't want any questioning or second-guessing. There won't be time to explain or argue. We can't have that if we are going to succeed and then get the others out of the dungeon. You will all need to do exactly as I say when I say it, if this is going to work. He was directing his comments mostly at Samantha without looking at her because he didn't want to sound like he was accusing her of something before she was guilty of it. But he also knew how she could be. He knew that he could count on the rest of them to follow instructions. If any of you have a problem with that, then you need to wait down here. Otherwise, you can come with me. Agreed? Everyone nodded. Chapter 80 At an intersection of corridors, Richard took a quick look around the corner. He didn't see anyone before quickly pulling back behind cover. The corridors, dimly lit by reflector lamps hung at regular intervals, were interior passageways, so there weren't any windows. Cassia had told him that the bedroom had windows. Since it was still night, they wouldn't provide any light, but they were a possible escape route. Richard doubted, though, that if things went bad, Dreyer would jump from the third floor. How much farther? he asked. Cassia took a careful look. At the end of the corridor, the halls go to either the right or the left. The bedroom is to the right, at the end, but it's not far. Like I explained, at the end of the hall, that corridor opens up into a small rotunda right outside the bedroom. He keeps at least two soldiers there all the time. Sometimes more. Sometimes he stations eight or ten in the rotunda to stand guard. We won't know for sure until we make the final turn toward the bedroom. With Erica in the room with him, Nikki said, he might not feel the need for more. Mahler shook his head. They aren't for protection. The abbot is sufficiently powerful to handle any threat himself. I think he likes to have the men there for show, as a display of his importance. Cassia made a sour face. He has them there because they can overhear what is going on in the bedroom. Dreyer commands the women he takes in there to be noisy so that the soldiers outside the door will hear. He knows they will gossip about what they heard. 
He thinks it makes for an impressive image among the soldiers. Vale was nodding. He's a pig. All right. Mahler, Samantha, Lauren, Vale, and Colin, you five wait here. Richard pointed to the two moored Sith and Samantha. You three protect the Mother Confessor. I'm counting on you. If, for some reason, Dreyer gets past us, this is his likely way out. You will have to stop him and protect Colin if he comes this way. Mahler, do you have the collar ready? They all nodded. The scribe held up the collar by the chain, as if he were holding up a dead varmint by its tail. Richard took the collar in his left hand, balling up most of the chain in his fist to keep it from making any noise. You ready for this, Cassia? She flashed him a cunning smile. You have no idea. Colin caught his arm. Richard, are you sure about this? It seems too simple. Sometimes simple is the best approach to a fight. Complicated plans have more to go wrong. We will only have one chance before he uses his powers. Simplicity, speed, and violence of action is our best chance. Colin leaned forward and gave him a quick kiss on the cheek. If anyone can do it, you three can. All right. Let's go, Richard said to Niki and Cassia. Keep it quiet. You both know what to do. Richard already had his sword out so that he wouldn't have to draw it anywhere near the bedroom. He knew that the ringing sound of pulling the blade would carry in the confines of the corridors. He didn't know how good the guards were, if they were really listening for the sound of any threat in the halls, or if they were instead listening to the sounds from the bedroom but he didn't want to take any chances with making an unnecessary noise. They had to remain undetected until the last instant. Around the corner, the hallway was empty. The long, dark blue carpet running down the length of the hall muffled the sounds of their footsteps as they moved swiftly along the hall. The three of them slipped carefully around a long table against the wall that held two empty glass bowls. Small tapestries hung in several places, further helping to quiet any sound they made. When they reached the end of the corridor, before the intersection, Richard squatted down with the other two. When he gave her the signal, Cassia lay down on her belly and carefully crawled to the corner. She stretched her neck so that she was just able to peek around the edge. She pulled back and held up two fingers. Richard let out a sigh of relief. That made it easier for Niki to do the first part. Once they started, they needed to be quick. Niki set down what she had been carrying. Cassia backed away from the corner and stood. She unfastened buttons and the black leather straps, turned away from Richard, and then pulled the top of her outfit down to her waist. She looked over her bare shoulder and gave him a nod that she was ready. With two fingers, Richard signaled for her to go. Cassia boldly walked around the corner and off toward the bedroom. All the guards knew the three moored Sith and knew that they frequently went to Ludwig Dreyer's bedroom to be with him. She walked deliberately, as if she had been summoned. When Richard and Niki heard Cassia tell the guards, Lord Dreyer sent for me, Niki stepped around the corner. Without pause, the sorceress thrust both arms out, palms facing outward. When Richard heard the two thumps, he knew that Niki had stopped their hearts and both men were dead. Death was so swift, they hadn't cried out. They probably hadn't even seen Niki. Richard handed her what she had brought. Niki leaned out around the corner again and with her gift sent it silently floating down the hall the way Richard had seen Zed float rocks through the air. He hoped she would have enough control to keep it from hitting a wall to say nothing of holding it stationary for a time and then at last hitting the target. Niki had acted like it was a foolish question but he didn't know how to use his gift to do such a thing so he would have no way of judging the difficulty. He had to trust that Niki knew what she was talking about. Richard heard Cassian knock on the bedroom door. The corridor remained silent. Richard took a quick peek. The two soldiers were slumped dead on the floor to either side of the white double door. A number of reflector lamps lit the rotunda. Cassia stood facing the door, her breasts exposed to get Dreyer's immediate attention, as they had the guards. They needed him to keep his eyes on Cassia and not look to the side. Cassia knocked again. Richard heard the door open. What is it? It was Dreyer's voice. Oh. Niki immediately sent the stone block sailing in at him. The instant Richard heard the sound of stone hitting the man's skull, he was around the corner racing the rest of the distance. 
As he ran in at full speed, sword in one hand, collar in the other, Richard kicked the round table in the middle of the room aside. The table crashed against the wall and shattered. Dreyer was on his knees, bent forward, his head almost touching the floor. He was naked. Both hands clutched his bloody head as he moaned, sounding dazed and confused. The heavy stone block Niki had sent flying in at him lay off to the side. Richard slid to a stop on his knees just as Cassia threw a leg around Dreyer to saddle his back. She grabbed his thick hair in a fist and pulled up on his head. His hands fell to his sides. Blood pouring from a long gash back across his scalp ran down the side of his head, turning an ear and his neck red. As soon as Cassia had pulled Dreyer's head up, Richard pushed the collar around his neck and slammed it closed. It made a clang that echoed through the hall. Dreyer was so groggy from the blow to his head that he didn't even know what had happened. He was like a rag doll and offered no resistance. The other two Mord Sith, having heard the sound of the stone hitting the man's skull and the clang of the metal collar locking closed, came around the corner at a dead run. Erica, also naked but for the agile in her fist, ran out toward the hall and skidded to a halt before she ran into Dreyer, still slumped on the floor, now holding the loose flap of scalp up onto his head to cover the wound. Sword in hand, Richard stood. Erica smiled at him over the top of her stricken master. Richard knew that she expected him to try to use the sword against her, and then she could capture him by capturing its magic. Richard instead slid the sword back in its sheath. Sorry, but I've done that dance before. I'm not going to do it again. Vale and Lauren came up on either side of her. They had their agile in their fists as well. Your choice, Richard said. Surrender? Her tangle with my Mord Sith. Her brow twitched. Your Mord Sith? Who do you think... Lauren jabbed her agile into Erica's kidney. The woman cried out as she dropped to a knee. If you would like, we can take turns doing this to you all night, Lauren said. I suggest you get dressed instead, Erica. Cassia held out her hand. Give me your agile first. Erica reluctantly handed it over before going back into the room. Richard followed her in to get Dreyer's clothes. He found them thrown over the back of a chair. When he picked up the purple robes Dreyer had been wearing, Richard felt an odd lump. He groped the robes and found a concealed pocket on the inside at the waist. With a finger, he fished out something small and flat. He was surprised to see a journey book. He opened the black leather cover to see what it said. Nikki looked as surprised as Richard. Well, she asked. Nothing in it, he told her. Wiped clean. She nodded. A lot of the sisters wiped theirs clean as a precaution. Others liked to preserve the messages in case they needed confirmation of instructions or to remember certain things, or even as proof that they were acting on orders. Richard sighed as he slipped the blank journey book into his pocket. Unfortunately, this one tells us nothing. Nikki gave him a meaningful look. I'd sure like to check its twin. Me too, he said. But I have no idea who might have it. When he came out of the bedroom carrying the robes, he found Colin glaring down at the stuporous prisoner on the floor. He had better prove useful. Nikki may need to heal him first, Richard said. I think she might have cracked his skull. Samantha briefly stared down at the naked man. Can we please go get my mother out of that dungeon now? Of course, Richard said. We need to get Commander Fister and the men out as well. They need to get the Citadel Guard under control, or we will soon have trouble. I can handle any who cause trouble, Nikki said. Samantha or her mother could as well. They have archers. Richard reminded her, an arrow in the back and you would be just as dead as if a sorcerer stopped your heart. Nikki sighed. I suppose so. Can we go chain this pig up in the dungeon now? Cassia asked as she fastened the sides of her leather top back in place. Good idea. Richard smiled at the three moored Sith. You did good, all of you. I'm proud of you. We just captured a dangerous man with powerful occult abilities and none of us were hurt. I got the idea from Samantha. Nikki said, smiling down at her. If you can't use magic to stop those with occult abilities, just drop rocks on their head. Samantha looked proud as she watched the Mord Sith haul a profusely bleeding, groggy Ludwig Dreyer to his feet. Chapter 81 Once the men of the first file had been freed from the dungeons down in the lower levels of the Citadel, they had raced up the stairwells into the grand greeting room and spread out through the gallery. As they had poured out among the columns, surprised citadel guards drew their weapons. 
These Citadel guards had been the ones who had carried the unconscious men of the first file down into the lower dungeons and locked them in. Commander Fister, at the head of his men as he led them into the grand meeting hall, without ceremony cut down the first two men who rushed in at him with swords. It was as shockingly swift as it was decisive. He hadn't even bothered to loose his men on the soldiers, as if the defenders were a mere pesky annoyance he could deal with himself. Almost as soon as the two soldiers hit the ground, dead, and lay bleeding out on the rich carpet, the rest of the men had dropped their weapons and raised their hands in surrender. Until it was decided what to do with the Citadel Guard, they had all been locked in the dungeons. Ludwig Dreyer, too, had been chained in the dungeon, right where Richard had been chained, with the shields to the collar and the room itself, containing both his gift and his occult powers, as they had been meant to do by those in ancient times who had built the citadel, the same people who had once built the barrier to the Third Kingdom. Erica had been chained up beside him, where Niki had been restrained. As Niki was seeing to the abbot's wounds to make sure he lived long enough to be of help, Cassia returned and said that she had found Richard and Colin a secluded bedroom to use while they waited for Niki to finish. Richard had figured that after the ordeal of being chained down in the dungeon, he and Colin could at least get a couple of hours of sleep. With the way the sickness was wearing them down, they couldn't afford to let exhaustion pull them into unconsciousness before Niki was able to get answers, and they could finally, hopefully, be healed. Dreyer was now their only remaining hope. As he and Colin followed Cassia through the complex of halls on the way to the bedroom, Richard tried to think of some other solution, some other chance, some other way for them to escape the grip of the poison, but he could think of nothing. Irina, rushing up one of the side hallways, spotted them out ahead and called out Richard's name. When Richard turned and saw her back down the hall, she hurried all the more to rush around the corner and catch up with them. Richard knew that the woman was always trying to find a way to place herself close to him. He saw the looks Colin gave the woman when she giggled and fawned over him. Richard disliked it even more than Colin, but he wasn't exactly sure what to do about it. He didn't want to be rude, but more than that, she was Samantha's mother after all. He figured that the least he could do was to be polite. Richard, there you are, Irina called out, lifting a hand to keep his attention. I've finally been freed from that terrible place down below. It was awful. I thought I would never get out of there. I was so relieved to hear that you escaped as well. Are you all right? Were you hurt? Is there anything I can do to help? Richard and Colin shared a look of silent resignation. Cassia stopped between two reflector lamps a short distance farther up the corridor, waiting for them to speak to Irina. We're fine, Richard said without elaborating. As Irina cut around the intersection, rushing toward them, her hip bumped the edge of a table she hadn't seen against the wall just around the corner. When her hip hit the table, something dark fell out of her dress and dropped onto the gold and blue carpet. She cursed the table under her breath for being in her way as she snatched up the skirts of her dress in order to hurry to catch up with him. She didn't notice that something had fallen out of her dress. Nikki told me that she told you to get some rest for now, Irina said. You need to rest, Richard. That's where we're headed right now. Colin said, hoping to get the woman to go away. Instead of getting the hint, Irina gestured with a flick of her hand. I told the soldiers to take up their posts back there and that I would watch over you and Colin to make sure that you rested in peace. I told them to set up stations a good distance back up the halls to keep anyone from bothering you. It's important that you not be disturbed for now, and you know how noisy they can be. Richard was about to tell her that he and not she, would be the one to give orders to the men and that she had no business making such presumptions when he was stopped in his tracks by what he saw lying on the gold and blue carpet. The small dark thing that had fallen out of her dress was a journey book. He froze for an instant, his gaze locked on it. Before she could notice him looking at the journey book lying on the floor behind her, Richard put a hand on Irina's back and guided her forward toward Colin. Good, Irina. We would be thankful for your help. In fact, Colin was just saying that she wanted to ask you about something you could do for me. And, well, here you are. He shot Colin a look over the top of Irina's head. Colin, knowing him as well as she did, got the message and said, Yes, I was wondering if you could help us. Irina twined her fingers together as she gazed expectantly at Colin. With what? What kind of help do you need? While she was focused on Colin, Richard slipped unnoticed behind her and snatched the journey book off the carpet. 
He held it up high behind Irina's back to show Colin what it was, then rolled his hand, letting her know that he needed her to keep Irina's attention. Colin understood. He turned his back in case Irina should happen to look around behind her. The journey book was filled with page after page of writing. He was sure that this was the twin to the one they had taken out of Dreyer's robes, but that didn't make a lot of sense. Why would Irina have the twin to his? He had to find confirmation, one way or another. It was possible that this one had an entirely different twin. There could be a perfectly logical explanation as to what she was doing with a journey book and why she had kept it a secret from them. Well, Colin said in a drawl to drag it out longer, we were hoping you could help with Richard's headaches. Nikki is busy at the moment, and I was hoping you could come to our room with us and see if you might be able to do something for him. You know, with your gift. Put your hands on him and do some small healing to ease his pain and help him sleep. Something like that. You are so talented that I thought if anyone could do it, it would be you. Irina touched her fingers to her neck, cooing with satisfaction at the flattery. I would love to. Irina droned on, asking Colin specific questions about the nature of his pain. Richard didn't even hear what Colin was saying to the woman as he focused on reading the messages back and forth between the journey book Irina had and its twin. A sudden, icy sensation flashed through him when he saw what he had been looking for. His heart hammered over what he was seeing in the journey book. Irina had been communicating with Ludwig Dreyer all along. Chapter 82 The book was filled with messages. She hadn't erased any of them. All the messages back and forth for more than a year were still there. There were messages from Ludwig Dreyer telling Irina the specifics of what he wanted her to do for him, along with promises of rewards for her loyalty and service to him. There was even a message Dreyer had written from the People's Palace telling her about the wedding of a moored Sith that he was attending. By the conversational tone of the messages and comments going back and forth, it was easy to see that the two were like-minded and quite at ease with each other. Richard quickly came to see that Irina's handwriting was neater and more legible than Dreyer's. He spotted an account where she told Dreyer that she had let herself be captured by Hannes Ark so that she would be closer to him in order to report on what he was doing to raise the spirit king from the dead. She recounted to Dreyer how Richard had rescued her and the things he had done to escape with them from the caves and how he had been able to defeat the half-people holding his friends prisoner. She had subsequently used the opportunity to join and travel with Richard and Colin's group. Ludwig Dreyer in turn advised her on how she should react and behave and the things he wanted her to find out. He told her to be especially careful not to let anyone know of her occult abilities. Irina had been right under their noses the whole time, watching and reporting everything they were doing to fight and escape the half-people coming after them. Irina had been a traitor the entire time. There was far too much in the journey book to read it all right then. With the way his heart pounded at the betrayal and his mind raced trying to piece together all that had been compromised, Richard was having trouble focusing enough to read. He flipped over a few more pages, skipping ahead, and spotted the passage where she told Dreyer that Richard and Colin needed a containment field in order to be healed. She told him that she recognized it as an opportunity to finally offer an excuse to get them to the Citadel, where Dreyer would be able to capture them. Richard trembled in shock as she read Dreyer's message back, telling Irina how pleased he was that she had found a way to convince them to come to the Citadel. He described where he wanted her to say the containment field was located within the Citadel and how to get down there in order to get them to a place where he could take them by surprise. She reported to him their progress along the way, keeping him abreast of when they thought they would arrive at the Citadel. Richard felt shame and rage that he had been so completely fooled by her story. When he quickly flipped back to the beginning, as he suspected, he spotted Irina's report to Dreyer that she had killed her sister Martha and Martha's husband when they had gone to see if the reports about Jit were true. She had then dumped their bodies in the swamp. She and Dreyer discussed how they couldn't risk any of the gifted in Stroiza, learning that the barrier was failing. Dreyer said he would send soldiers to collect her other sister, Millicent, and her husband, Giles. 
and take them to the Abbey to make sure they couldn't interfere either. Richard could hardly believe she had killed her own sisters and their husbands and was shocked to see Irina's report that her husband had started asking too many questions. So when an opportunity presented itself, she had killed him. The casual manner in which she reported killing her husband was shocking. Dreyer told her that if her daughter ever became suspicious, Irina would need to eliminate her as well. Richard was horrified to see Irina's reply that once Richard and the others were taken prisoner at the Citadel, he was welcome to take care of Samantha if he wished so that she would cease to be a potential problem. And then he saw it. The passage read, The old wizard was getting suspicious. Tonight I cast a concealing spell to make it appear I was in my bedroll so that I could go off to report to you. He somehow followed me and caught me writing in my journey book. Fortunately, he thought me merely a sorceress and was unaware of the occult side of my abilities. When he used his gift to try to restrain me and take my journey book, I was happy to finally have the opportunity, and I beheaded the troublesome old man. He will no longer be a problem. Richard's vision went red. He turned and with a scream of rage rammed into the woman, catching her completely by surprise. Richard had both hands around her throat before she knew what hit her. He slammed her up against the wall hard enough for her head and shoulders to break the plaster. Her hands snatched desperately at his wrists. He smashed her head into the wall again before she had a chance to summon her occult abilities. The sound of the powerful blow echoed through the hall. Blood splattered across the whitewashed plaster wall. Stunned, her eyes rolling, she fought to remain conscious. Her face glowed beet red as she struggled in vain to get air. Irina's feet kicked above the floor as Richard pinned her up against the wall, crushing her windpipe. He was in a blind rage, screaming the whole time. Nothing else mattered to him but choking to death this traitorous woman who had killed Zed. As he strangled her, her face went from red to dark red to blue. Her wide eyes bulged. Her limbs hung lifeless, swinging from side to side as he repeatedly bashed her head against the wall. Richard, what is it? Colin cried out. What's going on? He realized that Colin had been asking the question over and over. She had been screaming it at him. He was panting so rapidly he could hardly speak. She killed Zed. Colin's eyes widened. What? Richard's lethal focus remained riveted on the woman he was strangling, on her blue skin, her dead eyes staring at him as his big hands shook with the effort of crushing her throat. She's been a traitor among us the whole time working to sabotage us, to make sure we were captured, to see us all murdered by Dreyer. Richard gritted his teeth in rage. Tears ran down his face. She killed Zed! With a growl of fury, he slammed her lifeless body up against the wall yet again. He kept choking her, even though he knew she was dead. He wanted to kill her a thousand times over. His grandfather, the man who had raised him, the best the smartest, the kindest, the wisest man Richard had ever known had been murdered in cold blood by this evil, conniving traitor. Colin gently pulled on his arm. Richard, it's over. He finally dropped her in a lifeless heap, her limbs flopping out to the sides as he stood over her panting. It was then that he realized Samantha had just come around the corner. She stood frozen in shock. Her dark eyes were as wide as they would go. Her face stood out white against her black hair. Chapter 83 Frozen in horror, Samantha stared down at her dead mother for a moment. And then she ran toward Richard, screaming, her fists flying. What have you done? You monster, what have you done? Samantha, Colin said, trying to pull the young woman back away from Richard, or at least to catch her furiously flying fists. You don't understand. I understand perfectly well, she screamed. He killed my mother. He killed her. I saw it. Samantha, Richard yelled back. You don't understand. I do too understand. I understand that you've taken everything from me. I hate you. You killed her. She was all I had left in the world, and you killed her. You took her from me. You took everything from me. Down the hall, Richard could hear the sound of boots as men raced at a dead run toward the shrill screams. Nikki ran in around the corner. What's going on? Samantha! Colin yelled as she again tried to pull the young woman away. Listen to us! 
Nikki skidded to a stop when she saw the crumpled body of Irina on the floor. What happened? Richard killed her, Samantha screamed. Cassia reached for the young woman to help Colin try to contain her. Samantha jerked away from them, moving back out of reach, her hands fisted at her sides, her teeth clenched, tears streaming down her face. Samantha, Richard said, you don't understand. You need to listen to me. I'm so sorry, but your mother was working with Dreyer against us the whole time. She murdered Zed. She helped Dreyer capture us so the two of them could... Liar! You're a liar! You didn't like her, so you killed her. Now you're just making excuses. She loved us all. You're a liar! Samantha, Richard said, trying to find a way to get the young woman to calm down and listen. Your mother killed your aunts to help Dreyer. That's a lie. That's not true. You're lying. You're lying. Samantha, listen to us, Colin put in. She murdered your father as well. We can show you liars. You all only pretended to like us. You're liars. I hate you all. Colin took a step toward her. Samantha, please. You have to listen to us. You took what I loved most. I hate you, she screamed at Richard. You took what I loved most in life. Men running up the halls from every direction raced toward the sounds of trouble. Samantha thrust her arms to either side, driving them back with powerful fists of air that tumbled the men back. You took what I loved most, she said with venom to Richard. Now I'm taking what you love most. She reached out and snatched the knife from Colin's belt. Richard shot toward the girl. Before he could reach her, Samantha spun, whipping around in an arc and slammed the knife in her fist, hilt deep into the center of Colin's chest. The impact made a sickening sound. In shock, Richard saw Colin's eyes go wide as she tried to pull a breath. Her eyes rolled up in her head as she collapsed. Richard was too late to try to stop what had already happened. Samantha had already dodged back out of reach. Colin was dead when she hit the floor. Samantha darted to an intersection in the hall and turned back, fists at her side, glaring at Richard. I hate you. We are enemies from now on. As men reached to grab her, she swept an arm out. The power she released sent the men flying, slamming into walls, smashing tables as they tumbled back down the corridor. Samantha gave Richard a last glare and then took off running. Richard didn't give any thought to going after her. He was instead already on his knees and bent over Colin's lifeless form. Her dead eyes stared at nothing. No, he screamed. No! Nikki pushed at him, but couldn't budge him. He didn't even feel her trying to shove him aside. He was lost in numb panic. Get him back, Nikki said to Cassia. She tugged at his arm as Lauren and Vale came racing into the hall, leaping over men still down on the floor and groaning in pain. Both moored Sith came to a dead stop when they saw Irina's lifeless body in a heap, and then Colin, dead on the floor, the knife buried in the center of her chest. Richard needed to do something. He needed to stop what was happening. He needed to make it all right. He tried to think of how to undo what had already happened, but he couldn't seem to form thoughts. Get him back, Nikki growled, tears running down her face as she urgently tried to get Richard back away from Colin, tried to get his hands off her shoulders so she could see if there was anything she could do. Richard didn't want to let go of Colin. He couldn't let go. He was in a dream world where everything was happening so slow he couldn't make sense of the echoing voices. He didn't even know what they were saying. None of it seemed real. He couldn't allow this to happen. He had to stop it. He couldn't comprehend the sight of only the handle of Colin's long knife jutting up from the center of her chest. She wasn't breathing. Her eyes stared at nothing. No! He cried out again as the three moored Sith pulled at him, trying to get him back. Richard had seen more than enough dead people to know that Colin was dead, and yet he couldn't seem to make sense of it. It couldn't be real. He knew it couldn't be real. Not Colin. Richard! Nikki screamed at him as tears streamed down her face. Please, let me see what I can do. Please, Richard, get back. The three moored Sith trying to pull him back were no match for his muscle. Lord Rawl, Cassia said, putting her face right in front of his, blocking his view of Colin. Lord Rawl, her only chance is Nikki. You have to let Nikki help the Mother Confessor. Richard blinked. That made sense. Nikki could help her. Shaking uncontrollably, he finally moved back with the help of the three moored Sith pulling urgently at him. 
He reached a hand out toward Nikki. Do something. She ignored him as she bent over Colin and worked swiftly to try to fix the unfixable. The men had recovered and collected a ways back down the halls, standing in silent shock, watching. You have to heal her, Richard said. Nikki, you have to. Don't let her die. Please, Nikki, don't let her die. Nikki stared up at him briefly, then swallowed back her emotion as she turned to the moored Sith. Get her into the bedroom. Put her on the bed. Don't touch the knife. Richard wrenched himself away from the three trying to restrain him and rushed back in to scoop Colin's limp form up in his arms. I'll do it. Chapter 84 The walls of the room Cassia had found for them were creamy stone. One of the walls displayed a large, thick tapestry depicting a dark forest scene. It reminded Richard of the place in Heartland where he had first met Colin. The room's one window let in the darkness from out in the dark lands. Raindrops pattered softly against the diamond-shaped pieces of leaded glass. Dark, rust-colored carpet muted the sound of the rain and low rumble of thunder. The canopy bed was covered with dark blue-green fabric embroidered with gold edging. Heavy draping of the same blue-green fabric was gathered with ties around the posts at each corner, making the bed look like a holy shrine. Now, Colin lay dead on that bed, as if she were lying in state. Richard stood numb and silent as he watched Nikki frantically trying everything she could do. Even as he watched, even as he hoped, even as he tried to tell himself that Nikki would be able to save Colin, he knew better. The sorceress had slowly withdrawn the knife, sensing the nature of the damage every inch of the way as she had drawn it out. Richard couldn't believe how long the blade was. He couldn't believe how much steel had been plunged through her heart. Richard had sharpened Colin's knife for her, so he knew that it was razor sharp. It was sharp enough for even that skinny girl to drive it right through Colin's breastbone. When Nikki had finally withdrawn the entire length of the bloody blade, she had looked at it a moment not knowing what to do with it. She had finally returned it to its sheath, where it belonged, probably so that no one would accidentally get cut on it. The three moored Sith quietly guarded the door, making sure that no one could come in. They hadn't known Colin very long at all, yet they had known her long enough. The tears ran down the faces of all three as they stood silent watch. Richard had given Commander Fister orders to have the men kill Samantha on sight if she came at them, but otherwise not to go after her. She had abilities they had no defense against. He would have gone after Samantha himself, except he didn't want to leave Colin. But Samantha didn't really matter now. No matter what he did to Samantha, it couldn't undo what she had done. Colin's body heaved several times with a sudden jolt from Nikki's power. It was a desperate attempt to bring life back to Colin's lifeless form. It didn't do any good. There was no movement, no life in her. Richard stared at the terrifying stillness of the woman he loved more than life itself. Nikki had closed Colin's eyelids so her beautiful green eyes wouldn't be staring up at nothing. Richard had never imagined how terrifying those eyes would look without a soul behind them, without her life in them, without Colin in them. He would do anything if he could trade places with her if she would just draw breath again, look at him again, smile with her special smile for him again. After a time, Nikki pushed herself up and slowly, reluctantly turned. Richard, we need to talk. So talk. Nikki rose and stepped closer to lightly grasp his arm. Richard, she's gone. No, she's not. She can't be gone. You need to heal her. Nikki looked away from his eyes as she pressed her fingers to her brow. Richard, the knife went right through her heart. Her chest is full of blood. My chest was full of blood one time, and you healed me, remember? Nikki nodded. I remember. You used subtractive magic to take the blood out, an additive to repair the damage. Do that now for her. Richard, she said as patiently as possible. You were alive when I did that, and that arrow had gone through your lung, not your heart. Do it, he repeated. Nikki stared at him. 
Richard gritted his teeth. Do it, Nikki. Repair all the damage. Use your gift to put her back the way she was. Nikki licked her lips. Richard, her soul is gone. That knife did more than pierce her heart. It severed her soul from her worldly form. She's gone, the same as Zed is gone. I can't heal death. Richard was losing his patience. Nikki, I know some things about the world of life and the world of death. I have both in me. So does she. My soul, her soul, carry both. And what good is that going to do? What can you hope to accomplish by having her dead body put back the way it was when she was alive? Do it. Do it now and be quick about it. We don't have much time. Nikki stared at him. Do it! Nikki flinched. Finally, she nodded with a look of sympathetic understanding. She sat on the edge of the bed beside Colin and immediately went back to work, placing both hands around the bloody wound as she closed her eyes. Richard watched as Colin's chest compressed with the pressure of Nikki's hands. The sorceress gritted her teeth. Outside, lightning flickered and thunder rumbled through the mountains. Inside, the room crackled with threads of lightning that lit the stony faces of the moored Sith. The lamps dimmed, not because their flames went down, but because the air itself grew thick with what Richard recognized as subtractive magic. The magic of the underworld itself. The realm where Colin had gone. Ropes of black lightning arced and crackled around the bed. Blinding threads of lightning threaded themselves around it, spiraling and twisting, jumping from one place to another. The sound it all made, especially when the white and black lightning touched, was at times deafening. Several times Richard saw Colin draw a breath under Nikki's hands, but he knew that it wasn't Colin breathing. It was Nikki trying to pull life back into her. She was doing everything she knew to try to bring Colin back. Finally, the sound and fury died away. Nikki stood and stared down at Colin for a time. The blood was gone, wiped out of existence by the subtractive magic while the additive had knitted tissues back together and made her still heart whole again. Nikki took a deep breath. She looked exhausted. She looked defeated. I'm sorry, Richard, she whispered, unable to look up at him. I repaired everything that was damaged. She is again as she was before. It is not enough. Richard stared at Colin's still lifeless body. Thank you, Nikki. You cannot imagine how much I appreciate what you've done for us. Richard, I've done nothing of any real use. Her life is gone. Her spirit has already crossed over through the veil. Her soul is already on that journey along the lines of the grace. She's gone beyond now. I know that, Nikki, Richard said, holding himself together for what was to come. Now, I need you to do one more thing for me. Chapter 85 Nikki frowned suspiciously. What one other thing do you need me to do? Without answering, Richard walked to the door to the Mord Sith standing silent guard. He touched the cheek of each one of them in turn. Thank you for reminding me why I fight for life. A little puzzled, they nodded. Thank you for giving us ours back, Lord Rawl. Cassia said. He smiled as best he could. It was forced. Now, I need you all to wait outside, please. The three shared looks with one another, uncertain what he had in mind. Lord Rawl, Cassia said, we... I know, he said. Now, please wait outside. They nodded tearfully and then reluctantly, quietly left closing the door behind themselves. Richard went back to the side of the bed. His heart pounded so hard that he rocked slightly with each beat as he stared down at Colin. We have to hurry. Nikki's head came up. What? Every moment counts. I need you to do one last thing for me. We have to hurry. Nikki stared suspiciously up into his eyes. What do you want me to do, Richard? He swallowed. I need you to stop my heart. She did not look surprised. I can't do that, Richard. You can, and you must. You heal her body. Now I have to go beyond the veil and retrieve her spirit before it travels too far along the lines of the grace, and she is lost forever to the underworld. Richard, that's... Richard, I understand how you feel. I swear I do. But that's just not... I have the touch of death inside me. And so you want to hurry it along? 
Richard's gaze turned from Colin back to Niki's haunted blue eyes. When Hannes Ark captured all of you, he kept you trapped in chambers behind a veil to the underworld. I stepped through that veil and into the underworld to come and get you out, remember? We weren't dead, Richard. In the Third Kingdom, both worlds existed together at the same time in the same place. Because I have death inside me, I am part of that Third Kingdom. I'm not only alive, I also carry death inside. I passed through the world of the dead to get you out of that prison. I was there briefly in the underworld, and I made it through. I know a great deal about the underworld. Richard, this is different. You can't go to the world of the dead and retrieve a soul that has crossed over. You can't do such a thing. Ordinarily, no. But Colin has that same touch of death in her that I do. That means that in this world, the call of death we have in us has been slowly stealing life away from us. But Colin and I are of that third kingdom, with both death and life in us together at the same time. That means that right now, in that place, Colin has the call of life still in her. She carries both worlds until the spark of life still attached to her soul extinguishes in that dark place. I have to go get her before that happens. I'm dead anyway. This poison is killing me. But we may be able to get Ludwig Dreyer to show us how to heal you only after I bring Colin back. Then you can heal us. But before we try to heal that touch of death, I need to use it. Richard, it isn't so simple as you... Nikki, you were a sister of the dark. You know that there is more to it all than most people can begin to understand. You must stop my heart and send me beyond the veil. You must. Nikki shook her head. No, Richard, I can't do that. Tears started coursing down her face. I can't do that to you. I can't. Please don't ask such a thing of me. Richard gripped her shoulders and made her look back at him. I am asking it. She started sobbing in earnest. I can't, Richard. Would you die for me? He asked. Surprised by the question, she looked up into his eyes. Yes. Then you understand that sometimes those we love are worth dying for. If you care about me, if you love me, you will grant me this. Richard, it just won't work. Nikki sobbed. She's gone. You can't change that. It would be for nothing. Don't you see? If I can't bring her spirit back, then I want to be with her. Please, Nikki, don't deny me this. Colin needs me right now. She needs what only I can do. There is no one else with the kind of chance I have. I have to do it now before it's too late. Let me go. Let me be with her. Don't hold me a captive in the world of life when you have the power to send me beyond the veil. Don't make me do it myself and damage my body so that I don't have a chance to return. You have to do it now, while the spark of life is still in her soul and before her spirit travels too far into that darkness for me to find her. Every second counts. Every second allows Colin's soul to slip farther and farther away into the depths of the underworld where the winged demons wait for her. Nikki shook as she sobbed, hardly able to look at him through the tears. They are waiting for you, too. Richard drew his sword. If he had to, he could do it himself, with the sword. If he had to, he would. I have my sword. Are you crazy? She asked in fury through her tears. The sword is of this world. It can't cross over with you. With the hilt in his hand, his anger had been ignited. It powered him, gave him strength to do what he needed to do. It's anger will. The blade is bonded to me. That bond will cross over with me, even if the blade itself won't. Richard lay down on the bed beside Colin's still lifeless form. He had never imagined that he would lie next to her when she was dead. He had to partition his mind to be able to function, to be able to think at all, or the grief would claim him, and then he had no chance. He laid the blade of the sword down the length of his body, holding the hilt over his heart, feeling the word truth pressing into his palm as Niki stood beside the bed crying. Only the rage of the sword kept him from losing control and screaming in agonizing grief. Hurry, Niki. It must be now. Her teeth gritted. Her hands fisted. She leaned closer. Richard, I don't want to lose you. We can't lose you. We all need you. Why do you need me? He asked, looking up into her wet blue eyes. Because you are the one. You always have been. You always know what to do to save us. 
You always do the right thing. That's what I'm doing now. He smiled. You know that you are far more than special to me. You have saved my life more times and in more ways than I can count. Now you must take it. How can I? She asked. It's all right, Nikki. This is what I want. As he stared into her eyes, as she wept nearly uncontrollably, she leaned over, her long blonde hair falling forward over her shoulders as she placed her hands to either side of the hilt of the sword over his heart. Richard didn't tell Nikki that while he thought he had a chance to return Colin's spirit to her body in the world of life, he knew that he had no chance to return. There could be no one with both life and death in them, no one with the knowledge and experience of having been to the underworld who could come after him. He believed that he had a chance, a slim chance, but a chance, to capture Colin's spirit in time and let it return to the world of life, to her healed body. But he knew that, for him, it was a one-way journey. This time, there was no way he could come back. He was terrified of dying, of giving up the only life he would ever have. But he was more terrified of living without Colin. He was fully committed to what he had to do. He had made his decision. Nothing was going to deter him. He knew full well that this was the last time he would cross through the veil. Chapter 86 Nikki's power slammed into him like a bolt of lightning, compressing his chest. In an instant, his heart was stilled. Richard's eyes squeezed closed under the unrelenting pressure. With desperate effort, he gasped a breath under the enormous weight of pain pressing in on him. He was all too aware that it was the last breath he would ever draw. His muscles went rigid against the searing pain. Pain burned through the nerves of his jaw, down his arms, and into his back. Things were happening too fast, spinning out of control. He felt himself suffocating as he was unable to get any air. Time stretched until it became meaningless. Gradually, the agonizing pain began to become more and more distant. The pain seemed to recede in his awareness as darkness increasingly seeped in around him to take its place. He felt as if he was trying to hold back the night, but the weight of it was overwhelming. At some point, he lost track of what the pain had felt like. It no longer seemed important. But in place of the pain came something far worse. A kind of blind panic at the sensation of slipping away from the world of life. It was happening too fast. He felt icy cold fear as he fully grasped that he was dying, felt the finality of it, and tried desperately to cling to the slender thread of life he still had left as light and images flashed through his mind. He saw people he remembered, places he had been. The colors were vivid and bright and real. He heard distant laughter. It was him when he was a boy, laughing as he ran from Zed. Zed was laughing as he chased after Richard. Mostly, though, through it all, there was Colin. He saw glimpses of her gazing at him with love, her whole face radiant with it as she smiled with her special smile that she gave no one but him. Then that, too, faded away as his mind descended into ever-gathering darkness, a kind of heavy, thick darkness unlike any other. He could smell sulfur. There was no up, no down. There were no boundaries of any kind, only a black void. He focused on what he had to do, on why he had done this. That overpowering need became all. In that eternity of darkness, he had to find the one person he loved more than life itself. He had to find his soulmate. With that thought, the thought of how Colin was the one, the only one that he could ever love in the way he loved her, in the way that only one soulmate could love another, he began to have a sense of a track of light in the forever of darkness. It wasn't light, though, the way the sun created light. This was a kind of spiritual light, the kind of glow that he would expect to see from the good spirits. It seemed to be everywhere and nowhere. It was a feeling, a presence of spirit. He recognized that it was the right one, the right spirit. He thought that the light was beginning to coalesce, but then he realized that it really wasn't. Rather, it was that he was traveling along the trail left by that spirit he knew so well, and as he did, he was moving along a line, a pathway that it formed moving through the eternity of darkness. 
He knew then that he was actually seeing the glowing line of the gift within the grace itself. And then he spotted the glow of her spirit moving ever onward, farther and farther away, sinking ever downward. He was confused. It felt wrong. He didn't understand why it was spiraling downward. And then he saw them. The demons. They were so dark they blended with the eternal blackness. They were darkness itself, the way a night stone was dark beyond simply black. And yet he could see them, see their shape when they writhed and tumbled and twisted downward. The Dark Ones had enveloped Colin's spirit and were taking her with them as they descended ever deeper toward the darkest depths of eternity, taking her where they could smother her spirit and keep it forever from the light. Even as they smothered the light of her spirit so that only the glow of the trail it left was visible to Richard. A snarl of glistening black fangs turned to him. With menacing, fluid grace, they spread their wings wide. Rather than resist... Richard used the rage from the sword to propel himself toward them. It felt like he had jumped from a cliff, falling through bottomless space that was not even space, but merely a black emptiness as he traveled ever farther from any light. Even Colin's spirit was dimming as it was being suffocated under the weight of dark wings wrapped around her, pulling her downward. Richard shot through that dark tangle of wings and reached Colin, embraced her, joining with her soul to do what he needed to do. In that instant, for a glorious, singular spark in time, he joined with his soulmate, and they were one. He knew that that brief, singular connection when they were alone and together in the darkness would have to last him, would have to last both of them for eternity. And yet in the underworld, there was no time. He knew that in the brief spark of time when they were joined, he had forever to do what he needed to do, even if it might be only a fleeting second back in the world of life. But here, time was his. Once it was done, Richard used all his will to leave her and streak past the demons, running from them, drawing that overwhelming, uncontrollable, predatory need to chase. Hungry for his soul, driven to chase, they all turned and then suddenly swept through the darkness to go after him. They drew ever closer as he streaked away. Black fangs glistened in the darkness as they growled and snapped at him, eager, hungry for his soul. Richard let their claws hook into him, sinking ever deeper, so they could pull him in until they were close enough for their black wings to wrap around him and capture him. Even as they did, he let the rage power him so that he could keep racing away from Colin's spirit, keep their fury and their attention on him. And then, claws firmly gripping him, wings enfolding him, the Dark Ones dragged him downward, tumbling ever downward with him, suffocating the light of his soul. But in doing so, in coming after him as he raced away, they had abandoned Colin's spirit, her soul. In that infinite span of time, he had been with her spirit. He had accomplished what he needed to accomplish. He had given her the chance she needed to live. Suddenly freed from the weight of the Dark Demons, the light of her essence... That spirit, that soul, still carrying the buoyant spark of life from being part of the third kingdom, part of both worlds fused together, began to ascend, ever faster all the time, ever higher, escaping the forever of darkness. Richard saw her glowing arms open, reaching for him as she was pulled ever upward toward life. She tried to reach out to touch him, to draw him to her, to bring him with her, but she no longer could because as she rose... He was sinking with ever-increasing speed under the weight of the demons that had cocooned their inky black wings tightly around him. The last thing he saw was her spark in the darkness high above him as it winked out, and then she was gone. He was suddenly alone with the Dark Ones, alone with them in an eternity of blackness under the dead weight of oblivion where there was nothing where even his soul would be crushed under the pressure of darkness until it ceased to exist. His last thought was one of joy that he had been able to save Colin from that fate, that he had been able to give Colin the gift of her life, that he had done what he had always said he would willingly do. He had traded his life for hers so that she might live. In so doing, he had also been able to draw all the demons with him into the dark eternity below. 
They could no longer shadow her in death. When it was her time, she would rest forever in the light. Even as he felt his own spirit become insubstantial, as it faded away into an eternity of darkness, he felt joy. It had been worth it to him. Colin would live. Chapter 87 Colin gasped as she sat bolt upright, her eyes wide. She desperately gasped again, trying to get enough air. Niki cried out, jumping back as if she had seen a ghost. Colin was only dimly aware of the warm colors of the strange room, the rust-colored carpeting, the heavy blue-green fabric draped overhead and down around the bedposts. Almost her entire focus was on urgently drawing life and air into her lungs, on desperately drawing her severed soul back into her worldly self. None of it really made any sense. Everything was a jumble. She couldn't quite put all the images and events together into a coherent concept. Colin, Niki cried out as she rushed in close to take up Colin's hand. You're alive. Colin looked down at her own hand and Niki's. It did not look to her the way she thought it should look. It didn't look like it belonged to her. Or like it could possibly be hers. It should be light. Luminescent. It should be without form. It should be insubstantial. But this was substantial. It had form. It was not made of light. It was flesh and bone. She could feel blood pumping through her. She could feel life coursing through her. She could feel weight, touch. She could feel herself whole again. She still gasped for air, still struggled to get enough to catch her breath, but she was beginning to feel like she was finally getting it under control. Where am I? She asked, gulping for air. Nikki was crying for some reason. In one of the bedrooms in the Citadel. No, I mean, where am I? Niki frowned through her tears. I don't understand. Is this death? It's all wrong. It doesn't make sense. Something isn't right. Where am I? You died, Niki said through her tears. You were murdered. But you have both life and death in you, and that life sustained you for a bit while you were in the underworld. But now you are back, Colin. You're alive. Dear spirits, you're alive. Colin felt euphoric. She had been murdered. But now she was alive. She understood what it meant that she was going to live. Life, wonderful life, wasn't over. She couldn't stop smiling as she looked around. She was going to live. Where's Richard? Nikki's face went ashen. Colin followed the woman's stricken gaze and saw that someone lay beside her. It was Richard. Her heart jumped with a flash of joy at seeing him. But as soon as she saw him, she knew that something was terribly wrong. He was too still. He wasn't breathing. He stared up at nothing with dead eyes. Collins screamed when she realized the awful truth. The instantaneous joy she had felt at seeing him turned to horror. She fell on him, throwing an arm over his chest, over his sword's hilt clutched in his fists, resting over his heart. No, dear spirits, no. Don't bring me back to this. Please don't do this to me. Nikki rushed to draw Colin back pulling her arms from him, turning her away from Richard to take her up in her arms. What's happening? Colin wept against Nikki's shoulder. Nikki swallowed back her own sobs. I'm so sorry, Colin. Richard gave up his life to go after you, to bring you back to life. He has only been gone a moment. Colin looked over at the horrifyingly still body of the man she loved, her everything. But why isn't he here? If I was able to return because I still had that third kingdom spark of life in me, then why didn't he... She remembered then. It all flooded back in like a terrible, dark, profoundly troubling dream seeping back into your memory after you woke. A dream that left a sickening feeling behind in you that you couldn't escape, no matter how hard you tried. What? Nikki asked, seeing the look on Colin's face. Do you remember? Colin nodded. Richard's spirit found me. In all that darkness, in all that eternity of nothing, Richard found me. I was lost in darkness, and yet he found me. Then what? Nikki asked, when Colin fell silent, staring off into the nightmare. Then he pulled the dark ones off me, drawing them away to chase after him instead. I tried to stop him. I didn't want him to do that to himself. But he was stronger and tore them away from me. 
He somehow pushed me back into the glowing lines of the grace. I had no control. I wanted to stay with him, but I couldn't. Those glowing lines pulled me back. I don't know how. Because you still had life in you, Nikki said. The grace was healing itself, putting you back to where you belonged on that line of the gift coming from creation. Colin gazed at Nikki in desperation. Then why didn't it do the same for Richard? Why didn't he return with me? He couldn't. He went there to save you from Sulachan's dark demons, and he did. He did what only Richard could do. He pushed you back toward life. But now there is no one to save him, no one to help him get back to the light, to his lifeline. Colin looked over at him, lying next to where she had lain. He had his sword clutched in his dead hands. His eyes no longer saw the world of life. Now he was lost in a world of darkness. To see Richard so still, without life in him, was beyond any kind of agony she had ever known. How did he die? Her own voice sounded like someone else, asking the unimaginable. She looked back at Nikki when she heard the sorceress softly sobbing. Nikki, how did he die? What happened? She finally looked up with torment in her blue eyes. He asked me to stop his heart. Colin's eyes widened. You killed Richard? Nikki nodded, but couldn't find the words as she wept with a horror at what she had done. It was a torture she would always have to bear. Nikki, how could you kill Richard? How could you possibly do such a thing? You, of all people. After all he has done for you, how could you have done such a thing to him? Nikki sniffled to get herself under control so that she could explain. Because not to have done so, not to have let him have his deepest wish to go after you to try to save you, would have been worse. It would have been saving his life, but killing his soul. It was obvious what such a burden was doing to the woman. She looked ready to end her own life. Colin reached out and cupped Nikki's face. Dear spirits, I understand. I'm so sorry, Nikki, that it had to be you to do such a thing. You, of all people. I'm so sorry, Colin. Nikki wept. I'm so sorry. A spark of an idea, a spark of hope, came to her then. Nikki, you stopped his heart. Can't you start it again? You said you did it only a moment ago. Can't you start his heart and let life come back into him the way it came back into me? No. That single word had a world of finality to it. Colin touched her chest, where she remembered the knife slamming into her. She remembered the pain, the helpless terror. But I was stabbed through my heart. How is it working now? I don't understand. Why can't you do that for him? Richard had me heal the damage to you before he went. But I couldn't bring back your life, and I can't bring back his. I don't have the power. Your heart started spontaneously when your soul returned, when Richard sent you back. Even if I could start his heart beating again, there's no soul there, nothing to keep it going. I can't pull his soul back from the world of the dead. Tears ran down Colin's face as she stared at Richard lying there still a stone. She had fought countless battles, seen death more times than she cared to contemplate. She recognized that terrible stillness that existed only in death, when, after the last breath of life had faded away, the soul had left the body to journey beyond the veil. It was a kind of stillness that was beyond redemption. Richard was gone. It didn't seem like it could be real, and yet she knew it was. Colin lay down against Richard's dead body as she gave in to the agony and lost control. All she could think was that he had come for her, traded places with her in death. And now there was no one to save him. Chapter 88 Even as she wept against Richard's body, the words kept echoing around in her mind, no one to save him. Colin sat up suddenly. She sucked back the sobs and wiped the tears back from her face as she scooted to the edge of the bed and hopped down onto the floor. Where are Cassia, Lauren, and Vale? Nikki gestured, standing watch outside the doors. Colin raced to the doors and flung them open. The three moored Sith turned and gasped when they saw her. Mother Confessor, Cassia cried. How? I mean, I don't... Richard traded places with me in the world of the dead so he could send me back, she said in a rush. 
Their eyes widened, stricken with horror. Lord Rawl is dead? Vale asked in a shaky whisper. I'll explain it later. Listen to me. Cassia, go get Commander Fister. She pointed to a hallway branching off not far down the corridor. He is waiting right down there, not far, but out of the way, along with a number of the men. Good. Tell him to bring a few dozen men. At least half of them archers. Lauren, Vale, you two go down in the dungeon and get drier. The collar he is wearing keeps his powers contained, so you will be able to handle him. Although shocked to see her alive and at a loss to understand what she could be thinking, they nodded earnestly. What do you want me to do? Cassia asked. I mean, after I give the commander your instructions. I want you to go get Mahler and bring him back here. We need his keys. They looked confused. Or maybe it was just that they thought she might be a ghost or a good spirit. Go, hurry, Colin said. If we are to have any chance of saving Richard's life, we have to hurry. Cassia blinked. You mean there's a chance to save his life? Yes. All three turned and raced away to do as they had been asked. Colin rushed back inside. She thought there was a chance. She had to believe that there was. She forced her grief aside so that she could act. Now was not the time to grieve. Richard would tell her to think of the solution. Dreyer has abilities we can't even imagine, she told Niki. Niki turned away from staring at Richard's lifeless corpse stretched out on the bed. What of it? What if he could bring life back into Richard? Niki wiped back her tears as she frowned. Bring back life? What are you talking about? What do you mean, bring life back into him? You can't do such a thing to... She closed her mouth. She looked like she had been about to say, to the dead. She didn't want to refer to Richard that way. Sulachan and Hannes Ark can, Colin said. Even those half-people soul trackers could wake the dead, remember? A horrified look twisted Niki's face. You want to... What? Have Ludwig Dreyer turn Richard into one of those walking dead? You want the man to use his power to reanimate Richard's dead body? Colin, you can't. You wouldn't. He wouldn't really be alive. He would just be another of those monstrous corpses that moves. But he wouldn't be alive. It wouldn't be Richard. Colin, Richard is gone. His life force, his spirit, his soul has left him and gone beyond the veil. Colin paced for a moment, thinking, refusing to allow herself to give up. Nikki, I'm just trying to think of how to do what he did. What he did? What do you mean? Richard, had you heal my body, the wound and my heart, so that my body would be ready for my spirit to return. Nikki was frowning at her. So you were suggesting that we get Dreyer to make his body alive again like some kind of mutant half-person without a soul? Colin paced to the window and back along the thick, rust-colored carpet. No, I don't know. I'm just trying to think of a way to help him. We have to help him. Nikki cocked her head. Help him what? Well, you remember when he saw those people who snuck up on him? Back right before all those half-people spirit trackers attacked us? Yes, I remember, but they weren't there. They vanished somehow. Colin nodded. Richard said that the souls of the half-people Sulachon created were ripped from them. And also that in order to animate the dead, part of that process involved ripping the dead person's spirit from the underworld, disconnecting them from where they belonged. Those spirits were lost. They were severed souls. Nikki folded her arms, frowning as she tried to follow what Colin was getting at. All right. What did Richard say they said to him? Bring us our dead. He said they expected him to reunite them with their dead bodies. Nikki rubbed her eyes for a moment. You mean, you think that maybe Richard's spirit could be reunited with his dead body? How? Colin lifted her arms in a gesture of frustration. I don't know, Nikki. All I'm saying is that if there is any chance for Richard to ever return, it has to be soon, and he has to have his body ready for his soul to return, too. Like Richard wanted your heart healed so that when he went to get you, your soul could return to your body, because there was a home for it after I fixed it. So you think that maybe Richard's spirit will find a way back to his body? Colin shook her head in frustration. I don't know, Nikki. I'm just trying to think of something. Anything. I can't accept that Richard is really dead. The way he crossed over and came back before makes me think there has to be hope. Richard has gone to the Temple of the Winds in the Underworld. He is of the Third Kingdom, and so he went through the World of the Dead to rescue you and the others. This is Richard we're talking about. 
He's done it before. He has gone to the underworld before and returned. Nikki gently grasped Colin's shoulders then and looked into her eyes. Colin. Richard made sense after a fashion. A crazy, wild, Richard kind of sense. But sense. This is different. This is... I don't know. This sounds to me like you were just trying to wish something into being true because you're desperate. Colin stared back. Hopelessness clawed its way back into her. Maybe I am. But don't you think we should try? Do you want to let him go without trying? We have to try. Colin, look at him. Nikki turned Colin's chin to make her look past her toward the still body lying on the bed. Look at him. Colin, Richard is dead. Colin looked back into Nikki's eyes. So was I. Nikki wiped a trembling hand back over her forehead. Yes, and you had Richard to go to the underworld itself to bring you back. Who is going to bring him back? Colin felt the terrible weight of despair crushing her. I don't know, Nikki, but we can try, can't we? Please, Nikki. We can try every last crazy thing, can't we? Nikki took a deep breath then. Yes, of course we can. You're right. We have to try. Chapter 89 Colin and Nikki were standing beside the bed waiting when there was at last a knock on the door. Without waiting for an answer, Cassia opened the door and stuck her head in. Mother confessor, we have him. Colin gestured impatiently. Bring him in. She put on her confessor face, the expression her mother had taught her, the countenance that showed nothing of what she felt. She was dying inside, terrified and in agony inside, but none of it showed on her face. She was again the mother confessor. The doors opened, and the three moored Sith led Ludwig Dreyer in. They gave him a last rough shove so that he stumbled into the room. He wore filthy old groundskeeper clothes they had found for him. He missed a step, balking when he saw what was waiting for him in the room. Commander Fister stood near the foot of the bed behind Colin and Nikki. The room was ringed with over a dozen archers, all with arrows knocked, holding them in place, the strings with tension on them, but not yet drawn fully tight. There were also men with swords out, as well as men with axes in hand and others with pikes. It was the archers, though, that Colin could tell worried Dreyer the most. When he had rendered them all unconscious with his occult ability, they had not had time to do much about it. A man with a sword, no matter how swift, still took a brief bit of time to reach his target. But an arrow could be released in an instant. Well, well, Mother Confessor, Dreyer said as he straightened, it seems you have me at a disadvantage. I'm glad that you recognize the reality of the situation. He looked around at the room. I know you said you intended to kill me, but this seems an odd place for an execution. Colin stepped aside so he could see Richard's body on the bed. He frowned when he realized who it was. Is he actually dead? He asked, his astonishment overcoming his fear. I stopped his heart, Nikki said. His frown deepened. Not that I object, but why would you do that? Here's the thing, Colin said. We want you to do something to keep him alive for now. He scratched an eyebrow. What? Use your occult abilities to keep him alive, she said. He stared at her a long moment, looked over at Richard, and then back at Colin. He's dead. You must realize that. I can see from here that he's dead. We know his condition, Nikki said. It was necessary to stop his heart, but I don't have the ability to restart it. We need you to do that. His frown grew even more incredulous. He is dead. We didn't bring you up here to tell us what we already know, Nikki said, heat increasingly coming into her tone. If you want, we can take you back down to your cell, chain you back up, lock the door, and throw away the key. Or maybe we can have these three fine young ladies convince you of the benefits of not being tortured by a moored Sith. Cassia briefly jammed her ajeel into the small of his back. He grunted with a cry of pain as he dropped to one knee. She motioned with her ajeel in front of his face for him to get up. He stared at the weapon with open fear as he rose. What is it exactly that you want me to do for the corpse of Richard Rawl? Colin hated the way he was referring to Richard, but she maintained the confessor face. She had more important matters on her mind. She needed to stay focused, despite her inner anguish. We know that occult powers can do some remarkable things with creating the likes of half-people and reanimating the dead. 
But beyond that, we don't know if you can do anything that would convince us not to have you tortured to death. So, you tell us, what can you do to keep him alive? He tilted his head to look past him. May I get a closer look? Colin nodded and the moored Sith walked him closer to the bed. He reached out and touched Richard's face, then his neck. What's in it for me? He asked as he looked back. Depends on what service you can provide, Colin said. Well, I can't really be of any use to you at all with this collar around my neck. It prevents my ability from functioning. If we take the collar off, what can you do? You don't need it off to tell us. He checked the resolve in her eyes before again studying Richard more closely from the side of the bed. Well, not a lot. I may be talented and may have a great many skills, but I can't revive the dead. Then I guess you will soon find yourself in the same condition. Colin said, dead. I guess this conversation is over. He put a finger under the collar, trying to ease the discomfort of it. Colin could see his hands trembling slightly. Well, there are things I can do with occult abilities that suspend the death process. What does that mean, exactly? Nikki asked. He gestured toward Richard. If he stays like that, he will soon go all stiff, then begin to decompose and rot just like any corpse. With my occult abilities, I can suspend that process before it starts so that the body stays viable, after a fashion. How does that work? The sorceress asked. It's complex to explain to someone not schooled in the use of occult abilities. Make it simple for me while you still have the ability to talk. He swallowed at the look in her eyes before again glancing over at Richard. Well, you were a sister of the dark. You must know some of the basics about the underworld. I do. Then you know that time means nothing there in the eternity of the underworld. What I can do is create a bridge to link some of that timelessness of the underworld to his body. And what would that do? Colin asked. He shrugged. I'm not positive. I've never done it before. Never had cause. But it's the basic concept behind using occult powers to enliven corpses or to create half-people. The half-people, for example, live for long periods of time because they carry a link to the underworld. That timeless link keeps them from aging like normal people. Keeps time from working on their living body the way it ordinarily would. By using a link like that, I can keep his body the same as it was the moment he died. With time moving slower for him, he will remain in that state for quite some time. Nikki rubbed her arms as she glanced over at Colin. The Palace of the Prophets was like that, she admitted. Nathan Rawl lived there for close to a thousand years because the spell around the palace was linked to the underworld. Exactly, Dreyer said, lifting a finger to make the point. It can't bring back the dead, but it keeps the body in the state it was in when he was alive. Doesn't let it age the way the dead ordinarily would, and thus not decompose. Then how do we bring him back to life? Colin asked. I never said you could. I only said that I could keep him viable. I can't make the dead come back to life. I can animate corpses, but they aren't actually alive. So what good would this do him? Nikki asked. Dreyer lifted his hands in frustration. None, as far as I can see. He's dead. His life force is gone. His spirit is in the underworld. You asked what I could do. That's the closest I can come. I can link his remains to the underworld to halt the process his body would go through after dying. So that would preserve him for now, Colin said, until we can figure out how to bring his life force, his spirit, back into his body. Dreyer made a face. Preserve him for a time, yes. Bring his spirit back into that preserved body? That can't be done. He is dead, ladies. Dead, dead, dead. I don't know how to bring the dead back to life. But if you do, then I suppose this would keep him from deteriorating until you bring him back from the dead. I can do a great many things with my abilities, but there are limits to how far one can bend the laws of nature. One of those limits is the grace itself. It defines life and death. It can't reverse death. Colin wondered if the man was telling the truth, if she could trust him to tell her the truth. She looked from Dreyer's eyes to the still form of the man she loved, the man she desperately wanted back. Colin knew that Richard hadn't actually, technically, reversed her death. He had used the spark of life still in her soul. That spark was what had brought her back. Richard had that same spark of life in his soul. At least, she hoped he still did. In the underworld, it would fade rapidly. It was the balance to the poison Jit had infected them with. She had put death into them when they were still alive. That death had been extinguishing their life force. 
but for a time life and death existed together. They were part dead, yet part alive. All right, she said, do it. If that's the best you can do for now, do it. Dreyer waggled a finger. Not so fast. What's in it for me? What do you want? I want you to let me and Erica go. Colin, still wearing her confessor face, stared into Dreyer's eyes. Her entire life had been devoted to uncovering truth. She weighed what to do, what she dared to do. Everything hung in the balance and on the choice she made. The right choice did not mean success, but if she made the wrong choice, all would certainly be lost. In that brief instant, she weighed his words, the risks, and made her decision. Colin gave him a single nod. Done. You do what you said to keep Richard's body viable, and we will let you go. Nikki took hold of Colin's arm. Mother confessor, I don't think that's such a good idea. What he is proposing to do, when it comes right down to it, is of virtually no value. And for that, we would be giving him his freedom, so that he could plot his revenge, so that he could use those occult powers against us on another day. If he could start Richard's heart, maybe, but just to keep him the way he is... Colin stared at Dreyer for a long time. It was his occult powers she was considering. Finally, she turned and paced to the bed. The big men all around the room looked grim and despondent. They had lost their Lord Rawl. It was unthinkable. What was to become of them all without Richard? When I was young, Colin said, there was a boy I knew of who lived there in Idendril. One day, in late winter, he fell through the ice on a lake. He was under the ice for hours before they were able to get his body out. He was dead, of course, drowned under the ice. They wrapped him up, preparing to bury him when he revived. I don't know much about such things, but I saw it with my own eyes. Who are we to say when the soul has actually crossed over for good, when that veil has closed? If there is a way to keep Richard on ice, so to speak, to give him a chance to return back through that veil, then I want to take it. Nikki regarded her with an understanding look. If you say so, then I agree. Colin gave the signal. All around the room, the archers drew back their bowstrings. Take off his collar, she said to the scribe, standing quietly back against the wall. Mahler shuffled forward with his keys. You make one wrong twitch, Colin told Dreyer as Mahler unlocked the collar, and you will have a dozen arrows through you from every which way. He nodded. And do I have your word as the mother confessor that if I do this, you will let me go? Colin glanced at the sorceress a moment, then to Dreyer. You have my word as the mother confessor. If you keep your end, we will let you go. In unison, the archers tracked Dreyer's every step. He kept a wary eye on them as he went to the bed where Richard lay. He gestured over the body. Can you remove that sword, please? It interferes with what I have to do. Colin lifted the weapon and slid it back into the scabbard at Richard's hip. Being that close again, touching his cold flesh, seeing him that still, almost made her panic. Almost made her lose control of her confessor's face. Colin finally stepped back. All right, go ahead. They all watched as Dreyer wasted no time in laying his hands on Richard's chest. He closed his eyes a moment, then placed one hand on Richard's forehead. The air in the room began to hum. The sound built until the glass in the window rattled. A momentary glow came to Richard's body as the room darkened. Dreyer lifted his hands back. It is done. Colin stood by the bed and stared at Richard for a moment. I don't see anything different. I told you, the man is dead. Nothing is going to change that. He gestured in frustration at Richard. I did what I told you I would do. He will be preserved for now. He will not go stiff in death and decompose. He will stay as he was when alive. You will be able to tell for yourself when, in a short time, he does not get stiff, as the dead always do. Colin went to the window, set back in the thick stone wall, looking out at the dawn of the gray day. She put a hand over her stomach. She felt like she might be sick. She leaned under the arch and opened the window to get some fresh air on her face. She had never thought she would see another day. Now, she didn't care if she did. You may go, she said without looking back over her shoulder to Dreyer. Commander, see that he has safe passage out of the Citadel. I want him out of here, and I want him out now. As they all watched and waited on her, Colin took a breath to steady her voice. But I gave my word as the Mother Confessor. Don't you or any of your men do anything to break my word. Get him out of the Citadel and let him go. Do it at once. 
Chapter 90. Commander Fister reluctantly clapped a fist to his heart. Of course, Mother Confessor. He gestured to his sergeant. Take some of the archers and see to getting him out. Colin didn't look back. Lauren, Vale, please go with them to make sure the abbot is promptly sent out and on his way. Dreyer was eager to leave before she could change her mind. In a moment, they were gone. The commander fidgeted for a time after the door closed as she stared out the window. Colin, Niki finally asked in a quiet voice, do you really think what Dreyer did was of any use? Do you really think that it gives us any hope at all? Colin was silent for a time, staring out the window without seeing anything, as tears ran down her face and dripped off her jaw. No. She finally said in a frail voice as she stared out at nothing. Richard is gone. He took my place in the underworld. I saw the winged demons take him down into the depths of darkness. He is lost to us. Niki stepped closer. You saw that? She asked in a soft, fearful voice. She had been a sister of the dark and knew full well what such a thing meant. You saw the dark ones take him down? Colin nodded without looking back. Dear spirits, Nikki whispered. She covered her mouth with a hand, holding back a cry of anguish at having sent him to that fate. Mother Confessor, Commander Fister said, there must be some small hope that Lord Rawl will somehow come back from the dead? Colin slowly shook her head, tears streaming down her face. I would love to believe it. I would hold out hope if I could. For a brief time, I thought I could. I tried. But my whole life, I have been devoted to the truth, no matter how harsh and cold the truth may be. I am the Mother Confessor, and I can't believe in something I know isn't true. The room behind her fell silent again as she stared out the window. Colin wiped tears from her cheek as she turned to one of the men. May I have your bow, please? Puzzled, he handed it over. Niki, wondering what Colin was doing, went to the window beside her. Colin knocked the arrow and drew the string to her cheek. She settled herself and called the target to her the way Richard had taught her. Nothing else existed. Time slowed. She didn't even feel herself release the bowstring. Like a breath of breeze, the arrow was away. Colin watched its flight, watched it going exactly where she had envisioned it to fly. The arrow hit Ludwig Dreyer square in the back of his head on the left side, exiting his right eye socket. Dreyer dropped, dead before he hit the road leading away from the citadel. Beautiful shot, Mother Confessor, the archer said, sounding sincerely impressed when she handed him back his bow. Richard taught me to shoot. You wouldn't believe how good he is. Was. She said, her voice trailing off. Niki arched an eyebrow. Not that I object. But you broke your word. You said you would let him go in exchange for what he did. Colin met Niki's gaze with an iron look. I kept my word. I told him I would let him go. I never said how far. She gestured out the window. I didn't tell him that that was as far as I ever intended on letting him go. Some of the men smiled just a little. That was the mother confessor they knew. The mother confessor they had fought beside. The mother confessor with an iron will and an unwavering sense of justice. Colin softly asked everyone to leave then. She wanted to be alone with Richard. She sat on the edge of the bed beside him, looking down at him as everyone started quietly filing out. Niki shared a silent, tearful, sympathetic look with Colin before gently closing the doors behind her as she left. Colin didn't know how she was going to go on or what she was going to do. She was lost. Everything was lost. She understood how Kara felt. Chapter 91. After crying in desolate solitude for hours as she lay beside Richard's body, desperately wanting more than anything to have him reach out and hold her in his arms, after being certain that she would die of inconsolable grief, after wishing she could die and have the suffering end, Colin finally wiped her tears, straightened her clothes, and emerged from the bedroom. Niki, a number of soldiers of the first file, and the three moored Sith were standing silent vigil outside the bedroom, but down the hallway a respectful distance, not wanting to appear to be standing by the door, listening to her cry. When Colin started off in silence down the corridor to go speak with Commander Fister, they all followed behind her. They were thoughtful enough, though, to give her plenty of space to be alone in her grief. Even Niki hung back with the others. She could tell that it would be best to give Colin some privacy and not ask any questions. 
There was no comforting such inner agony, and they all knew it. They were grieving, too, but Colin's grief was different. She had lost her entire world. She had lost her soulmate. As she came around the corner, Erica suddenly appeared from a dark doorway right in front of her. The Mord Sith again had on her black leather outfit. Gripping her agile in a tight fist, she was considerably closer to Colin than any of the people back down the hall following behind. And the Mord Sith was already moving at a dead run as she emerged from the doorway. Colin had fought in the war with Kara enough to recognize the way Erica was holding her weapon. It was a killing stance, meant to deliver a single strike to stop the heart of an enemy. Erica's eyes were filled with hate. Instinctively, Colin had already raised her hand as Erica flew toward her. Colin's fingers just began to contact the center of the woman's chest just below her throat. In that instant, time became hers. The contact of her fingers was still ever so slight, barely more than that of a lover's warm breath on a cheek. Time was hers. Colin could have counted every hair at the hairline on Erica's forehead and then every eyelash. Although Erica's face was filled with hate, Colin felt no hate. She felt no pity, no rage, no anger, no sorrow. There was no mercy in Erica's eyes, and there was none in Colin's either. In that infinitesimal spark of time, Colin's mind was without emotion, filled only with the all-consuming rush of time suspended. As she watched Erica before her, frozen in time in the midst of rushing in for the kill, Colin knew that the woman had no chance. None. She was already dead. That fact simply hadn't caught up with her yet. Colin could see in the woman's eyes that she did not yet comprehend what was about to happen. She still thought that she was in control of what was about to happen. She was not. The cold ferocity of Colin's power slipping its bounds was breathtaking. She felt it welling up from that deep core within her, obediently inundating every fiber of her being in its onward rush. In that instant in time, her power was all. As Colin had done countless times before, she released her restraint on that wave of power just as it was cresting through her. Erica's mind, who she was, who she had been, every desire she had ever had was already gone. In a timeless instant of pristine violence, thunder without sound jolted the air of the hallway. Glass chimneys on the nearby lamps shattered. A window exploded outward. The floor and walls shook from the concussion. Nearby doors blew open. The ripple of power lifted the carpet, rolling it in a wave racing away in both directions. The terrible shock of it cracked the plaster of the walls all up and down the hall. Behind her, people were thrown to the ground. Those closest felt the searing pain of it the most. Screaming, Erica collapsed. Her arms and legs twitched as they began pulling in, drawing her up into a ball as she screamed. Bones snapped, flesh ripped. The woman could do nothing to stop the pain of her body coming apart as the lethal result of her moored Sith ability absorbed the unleashed power of a confessor. As the woman in black leather writhed in agony, the men, who had finally recovered and scrambled to their feet, came rushing forward to make sure the threat was subdued. The threat had been subdued before they had even seen the woman. The threat had been ended the instant Colin had seen her. Cassia, Lauren, and Vale, all in red leather, closed in beside Colin, looking down at the result of a confessor unleashing her power on a moored Sith. This time... There would be no begging to carry out the wishes of the confessor who had touched her. It was different when a moored Sith was touched by a confessor's power. For a moored Sith, such a touch meant a long and agonizing death. Pick her up and take her down to the dungeons, Colin said to the men. Leave her down there where her screams won't bother anyone. No need to lock her in. She won't be going anywhere. But she will be the rest of the day and probably the entire night dying. I had heard the stories, Cassia said in a whisper as she watched the men picking up the twisting, screaming woman dripping a trail of blood as they carried her down the hallway. The truth is a lot worse than the rumors. Kala nodded. She chose her own fate the day she eagerly swore allegiance in her heart to Ludwig Dreyer. As the men vanished down the hall, carrying the screaming Erica away, Niki took Colin by the arm and pulled her close. Colin, the poison you carry in you, Jit's touch of death, cut you off from your power, preventing you from using your ability. So how did you do that? 
I no longer carry Jit's poisonous touch of death in me. Nikki blinked in surprise. What? When I was in the underworld, Richard removed it. Because we were in the world of the dead, the touch of death could cause no harm when it was pulled out of me, the way it would have here in the world of life. The world of the dead is, in effect, a containment field for death. The bale keeps death on that side. Thanks to Richard, Jit's touch of death was left in the world of the dead where it belonged. Nikki put a hand to her heart as she let out an audible sigh. That's wonderful. Dear spirits, that's wonderful. Colin nodded. A good spirit healed me. Richard's spirit. Cassia brightened. Then you aren't going to die? Colin shook her head. No, but I have nothing to live for now. Ironic that when I was dying, I wanted to live. And now that I'm going to live, I only want to die. Nikki put her arms around Colin, giving her a silent hug in sympathy. When they parted, Nikki's expression turned suspicious. If you could use your power, then why wouldn't you have used it on Dreyer? You could have simply taken him with your power and not have had to go through all that. It's not as simple as it sounds. Maybe not, Nikki said. But still, had you taken him with your power, you would have been certain that you had gotten the truth out of him. I did get the truth out of him. I've spent my life getting the truth out of people like him. I don't always need to unleash my power. He told us the truth. That was all he could do for us. For Richard. Nikki gestured back toward the bedroom. He wouldn't have been able to pose a threat had you touched him, and he might have also been a valuable source of information. Colin shook her head. I made a calculated decision. What do you mean? Other than animating corpses, they couldn't really bring the dead back to life. I don't think there was much of anything he could have told us that would have been worth the risk of trying to use my power on him. Nikki flicked a hand toward the blood on the floor. What risk? You took Erica with your power. Colin gave Nikki a look. Erica didn't have occult powers. Nikki straightened. Oh, I guess there is that. Indeed there is. I've never used my confessor ability on someone with occult powers. We know that regular additive magic doesn't work on those with such power. My ability is partially additive magic. Even Zed couldn't stop those like Dryer with powerful occult abilities. So it might not have worked? Cassia guessed. Having it not work would have been the least of it. My power doesn't work the same on everyone. Mord Sith, for example, can capture a person's magic when the person tries to use it on them. Yet when they try to capture a confessor's power, it turns deadly, as you saw with Erica. It is entirely possible that had I tried to use my confessor power on Dreyer, he could have turned it back on me in a similar way and used the opportunity to have us all. It could easily have been a fatal mistake for all of us. The risk was too great, and besides, I believe we got all we could from him. So there was no point. That was the calculated decision I made. Nikki nodded with a sigh. I should have known you would have thought it through. Colin stared off into her thoughts. Richard taught me to think of the solution, not the problem. That's what I was trying to do. Chapter 92 What are we going to do now? Commander Fister asked when Nikki and Colin parted and the hallway fell silent again. Colin swallowed. Richard isn't coming back. We need to face that. I was only fooling myself. The awful truth is that Richard is dead. We know what he had wanted done with Zed's remains. He would want us to do the same for him. He is gone now, lost to those of us left behind in this world. We owe it to him to take care of his worldly remains. We are going to have to prepare a funeral pyre and say our goodbyes. Tears slowly ran down the faces of all three moored Sith. Colin, are you sure? Nikki asked. What Bloodwig Dryer did used occult power. We don't know if there might still be hope. Hope? Colin asked. She shook her head as she swallowed at the painful agony of the memory she still couldn't get out of her mind. You didn't see what I saw. Those dark-winged demons chased him, caught him, hooked their claws into him so he couldn't get away, and then wrapped their black wings around him to smother his soul as they carried him down into oblivion. Everyone stared in silent horror. There must be some hope, Nikki finally said in a weak voice. Richard would want us to have hope. Colin felt empty. The world of life was dead to her. Hope, Hannes Ark, and Emperor Sulichan are headed for the People's Palace. Sulichan wants to break the world of life. He wants to loose the world of the dead on all of us. The only one named in prophecy who had a chance to stop that was Richard. Prophecy has named Richard every step of the way, in everything he did, as the pebble in the pond, as the only one who had a chance to set things right. 
Prophecy says that the only hope to stop this threat from the Third Kingdom being set free on us all is for Richard to end prophecy. He is the only one with a chance. Now he is dead. We have no hope without Richard. In a way, since there was so much prophecy involving him, since he was so tightly woven into so much of prophecy, since he was Fewer Grissa Ost Drauka, that means that with him dead, prophecy too has ended. It died with Richard. After all, what can it say about him now that he is gone? He was the one, and now he is gone. In a very real way, by dying, Richard has ended prophecy. There is no one else who can stop evil from darkening the world. Time and hope has run out for life. To tell you the truth, I can't think of a reason to care. Colin, Nikki said in a comforting manner, Richard wouldn't let that happen. The people of Dahara need him. Richard would return from the dead to protect them. He is the Lord Roll. He is bonded to them and they to him. He would come back from the world of the dead to protect them. Colin swallowed back the grief, trying to hold back the tears by trying to maintain a confessor face. I understand the sentiment, Nikki, and the words are very noble. They really are. But they are just words. It takes more than wishes and words. You know in your heart as well as I do that there is no way for him to return, that he is gone. Colin thought that maybe she should be the one unwilling to accept the reality of Richard's death, that she should be the one saying that he would return and hoping against hope for some miracle to come out of thin air. But she was a confessor. And as a confessor, Colin's entire life had been devoted to truth. She couldn't deny the truth because it was painful. Even in this, she could not deny truth. Cassia rolled her ajeel in her fingers. Mother confessor, I was without hope. I found my way back. Colin gestured to the woman's ajeel. And does your ajeel work? Now that Dreyer is dead and Richard is gone? No, Cassia said with a sad smile. But is it so bad that I don't feel the pain? At least for a time? I guess not, Colin said as she put a consoling hand on the woman's shoulder. But not feeling the pain means that Richard is gone. And the bond to the Lord Rawl is dissolved. I guess, though, that not feeling the pain of that link is a small consolation. She knew that, for her, the pain had only just begun. What about Lord Rawl's sword? The commander asked. I mean, do we leave it with him? When we prepare his funeral pyre? Colin knew what she had to do. No, with Zed gone and Richard gone, the sword now falls to me. Bring it to me. He silently tapped his fist to his heart. Talking about it, having to face the reality was crushing her soul. Colin felt faint with the grief twisting in on her. Her knees almost buckled. Nikki caught her arm and helped her over to a window where she hurriedly unlatched it and swung it open. I think you need a little fresh air, the sorceress said. The thought of Richard lying dead and all alone back in that room was making Colin feel hot and dizzy. She couldn't get the image out of her mind. She couldn't think of anything else. Richard seemed so alive, and yet her mind could bring forth only the image of his worldly form lying lifeless on the bed as his severed soul was being carried down into eternal darkness. Even though part of her could think of him only as alive, he was already receding back into the realm of memories. Colin wanted to scream, to cry, to turn things back to the way they had been. For some reason, she couldn't cry. She thought she might pass out instead. Her hands shook. Her whole body trembled. Colin, Nikki said in urgent but soft compassion, you need some air. Breathe. Come on. Take a deep breath. It will do you good. Colin leaned on her hands on the stone sill, breathing in the cooler air. She felt a tear roll down her cheek and drip off her jaw. How was she going to go on? What was she going to do? She just wanted Richard. She ached for him to be there by her. Somehow, none of it seemed real. And yet, it seemed more real than anything had ever felt. She had wanted so badly for Richard to have a life with her. A life they could share and enjoy away from conflict. Time to live for just themselves. That chance had slipped away from them. Now, they would never have a life together. As she gazed out across the grounds and to the forest not far beyond, she spotted a creature at the edge of the woods, sitting on its haunches, watching her. It was Hunter. As he sat there... Silently looking up at her, Colin thought that he almost looked like he had come to offer his condolences. More likely, Red had sent him in a gesture offering hers. Red had known. Red had told her. 
Had Colin listened to Red's warning and done as the witch woman wanted, Colin would be the one who was dead, and Richard would be alive. She looked over at the sorceress. Of course, Nikki would be dead too. Prophecy rarely turned out the way it seemed. In this case, events had turned out exactly as Red had predicted, but in ways that Colin could never have imagined. And yet, the prophecy had been precisely correct. Colin hadn't listened. Now, like Richard, Prophecy 2 was dead. End of Severed Souls, The Sword of Truth By Terry Goodkind Read by Alec Voles